But once I got, I heard a lot about this this guest, and a lot of my English mates are like, "You gotta have him on the podcast. He's an absolute legend." And I was like, "All right." No, actually, I I had you muted, so I wasn't talking about you're talking you. Talking about me? No, we're not. You're, you're not from the UK, and you you're not a legend. I am. No, a UK you, you are. You are. You you literally are from the UK. That's the different thing. Yeah, yeah. Just when you started saying legends and guest on the show, then I thought it was me. Because uh, you haven't actually had me on the show as a guest. Yeah, I've asked you to do that, and you keep saying no. <laughs> I, I actually, it's my fault. I, yeah, I've said, Joseph, let's uh, let's do a podcast with you. Uh, no, not this time. When I come down to visit. When I do this, it's always an excuse. But thank you for interrupting me. And I'll go back and, and oh. don't say anything, right? Okay, so, I'll mute myself. Yeah, I'll mute you. Nitro is the glory. Welcome to the No Name RC Podcast with your host tonight, Keenan White, aka Lefty the Great. And if you are unlucky, the Finnish village idiot, JQ. This is the RC Podcast with no name, but plenty of content. So sit back, relax and get ready for some serious bench racing. Yes, indeed, Nitro is the glory, but e-buggy pays the bills. What's going on, everybody? Welcome to episode number 72 of the No Name RC Podcast. I'm your host, Keno White, a.k.a. Left of the Great. And this week we have a, a another good podcast, another Legends podcast. This time a different legend from a different uh, area of RC, a different whole different region. But once I got, I heard a lot about this this guest and a lot of my English mates are like, you got to have him on the podcast. He's an absolute legend. And I was like, all right. No, actually I, I had you muted. So I wasn't talking about you're talking you. about me. No, we're not. You're, you're not from the UK and you, you're not a legend. I am. I no, a UK you, you are, you are, you, you literally are from the UK. That's the different thing. Yeah. Yeah. Just when you started saying legends and guest on the show, then I thought it was me. Because uh, you haven't actually had me on the show as a guest. Yeah, I've asked you to do that, and you keep saying no. <laughs> I, I actually, like it's my fault. I, yeah, I've said, Joseph, let's uh, let's do a podcast with you. Uh, no, not this time. When I come down to visit. When I do this, it's always an excuse. But thank you for interrupting me. And I'll go back and, and oh. don't say anything, right? Okay, I'll so, mute myself. Yeah, I'll mute you. So with that said, once uh, shout out to Scott Walker because he helped me uh, research this guy. Once I started researching and reading up on it, I, I realized what an absolute stud of RC he was. So this week's guest is Jamie Booth. So for your, those that don't know him, you will know more about him this week. And uh, yeah, good stuff. But now that Joseph has blurted in and made himself aware he thinks he's some legend in his own mind. Might as well bring him in. Yay, Joseph. Uh, before I go on any further, I just want to shout out to the No Name RC Podcast Squad from around the world. Thank you to all you guys for the messages you send, for all the love, sharing the podcast. I know everybody wants to get back to racing. It's coming soon. Thank you to our patrons who go the extra mile on Patreon. Remember, if you guys, when things get better, if you, you want to help out and, and support via Patreon, those guys get early releases. I uh, got something pretty co uh, cool planned for her shortly, and yeah, they they help a lot. They're helping they're helping keep these bills paid, and I appreciate that. And I want to shout out to our sponsors, which are RCMX Online, Techno RC, Beach RC, JQ Racing, BK Servos, Papa Willie's Traction Tonic, and RC Raceworks. So, what's going on, Joseph? How are you? Not bad. Yeah, not you, bad. Yeah, you you know it's a big week for you, uh, Joseph. Um, you know, I guess you know. Happy birthday to you. Happy belated birthday because we're recording. It's two days after your birthday. You're now thirty eight years old, and you're two I'm years seven. Yeah, well, you're in your thirty eighth year now. So if you yeah, was, to, I'm thirty seven. That's, that's how right. a, that's how age works, Keenan. No, but in, if you die, thirty seven. 
if you die tomorrow, they'd be like in his thirty eighth year. So no, he'd be he was thirty seven years old. Yeah, in his thirty eighth year. So you're two years. No one says that. You're two years closer to forty plus, dude. So congratulations, happy birthday to you. And you know what? I I have two things I want to play for you before we go on any further. So don't talk. Just listen. Okay. The first one is this. On another topic, the like preparations for your birthday have begun. I won't get what I really want. No one does. Happy birthday, Mr. Smithers. <laughs> That's from The Simpsons. Oh. At, and I search for like... What was, what was happening in that clip? Oh, wow. Well, it's like, it's from The Simpsons. And uh, Smithers is saying... Uh, I think he's saying happy birthday to Mr. Burns. And Mr. Burns goes, nobody ever gets what they really want. And, you know, Smithers has this big crush on Mr. Burns. So he's daydreaming about Burns naked singing the Maryland oh. happy birthday. But this song uh, for your birthday, I was like, I want to get the perfect song for Joseph for his birthday. And I okay. searched and I searched and I searched and I finally found it. And um, it's by some band. I, I can't remember their name. But I want you to listen to it because it's pretty funny. So here you go, man. Happy birthday to you. JQ, Joseph Craig, man, Rupert, Beaker, Q, Captain Asshole, many names that you go by. This is for you. Two seconds. Once a year we celebrate with stupid hats and plastic plates The fact that you were able to make another trip around the sun <gasps> And the whole clan gathers round and gifts and laughter do abound We let out a joyful sound and sing that stupid song Happy, Happy birthday. birthday, now you're one year older Happy birthday, your life still isn't over Happy birthday, you did not accomplish much But you didn't die this year, I guess that's good enough so let's drink to your fading health and hope you don't remind yourself Your chance of finding fame and wealth decrease with every year Does it feel like you're doing laps and eating food and taking naps And hoping that someday perhaps your life will hold some cheer Happy birthday What have you done that matters? Happy birthday You're starting to get fatter Happy birthday It's downhill from now on Try not to remind yourself your best years are all gone if cryogenics were all free, then you could live like Walt Disney and live for all eternity inside a block of ice. But instead, your time has said this is the only life you get. And though it hasn't ended yet, sometimes you wish it might. Happy birthday. You wish you had more money. Happy birthday. Your life's so sad, it's funny. Happy birthday. How much more can you take? But your friends are hungry, so just cut the stupid cake. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. I thought that was the perfect song for you. I sent it to Salty Joe. He laughed his ass off at it. So there you go, man. Yeah, Happy it was it was accurate except for that my best years are still ahead of me. Oh, here we my go. My best years are like these next three years here. Yeah, that song's got, actually by be my best years. That song's actually by a band called Arrogant Worms. It's actually really funny. And here we go with this. I know you kind of you know. You kind of like, I know you. I know you like they. I know I. You saw all that forty plus stuff, and that triggered you this week. And you're like, I'm going to show these guys. I I still can do it. I have a Euro final left in me. And you know what, man? I want to say I believe you, but I I honestly don't. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I really don't care what you believe. Because I'm I've not. heard this. You know what? I think if you stay off Facebook and focus on RC. Possibly, you can maybe make the semifinals. Where? Uh, it, at, at Euros next year, because I don't think there's going to be one this year. But You're high. Oh, oh, okay, well, then we'll say even better. We'll go back to the quarters. Then you can definitely make the quarters. I'll do a lot better. Okay. This well, is my last, last three years. Oh, my God. So. You've been saying that for the last five years. No, yes, it's really are. Oh God! So you, so what did you? All right, Joseph. So before we go on any further, what did you do for your birthday? Do anything special? Went, went to the track. Why are you going to the track? You won't tell me what you're doing at the track. What are you hiding? Testing. Mm, testing what? Black edition. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 
What? I bet you are. Hmm. Yeah. You won't tell me what's going on. I when you when you're quiet like that, you know, it just makes me go. Yeah. You need to work on your sound drops. That's Yoda, dude. Don't ever talk bad about Yoda. Don't ever talk Yoda bad about Yoda. So you didn't do anything for your birthday? No Clark's gonna narc or nothing planned for this weekend. I mean it's not much you can do. Cabinet. No. Yeah. No friends. Came over and no said friends. have a long drink. No. You got a lot it's of coronavirus. Yeah, you got a lot of messages though on Facebook, it looks like. So I sent you a few. Did you like what I sent you? You sent my you like my pictures I sent? I haven't found what do you sent. I, oh man, I found this beautiful picture of AOC and and put it up there for you. Oh yeah, I got that. Yeah, thanks for that. And then of course the collage of our trips, and of course if you're new, you need to get a beaker. That's what you know when you get your um name tape. You need to get a beaker sticker done for your car and put it on your window like you do with your name, because that's the name yeah. that's sticking with you. Because you have so many, Rupert and Beaker are sticking. Beaker. Yeah. Yeah, Beaker's pretty good. Yeah. I should dye my hair orange. Yeah, that would be great. Race. It's getting like Beaker's hair pretty much. Yeah, it is actually. <laughs> my hair is pretty long right now. Yeah, I need I it. should dye it orange. Neon really? orange for the next Euros. There you go. And make it all spiky. Neon fluorescent orange hair. Yeah, that's that's my new look for the next Euros. Good stuff. Well, let's talk a little bit about RC. Um, nothing much going on. I got my I support my track shirt. Uh, I wore it last. Uh, well, I did it for our Facebook Live slash call-ins because we're recording this after I did that. It was a good call-in with uh, Jared T. and Wally. We got a good bit of calls. Thank you to everybody that called in. I appreciate that and tuned into the Facebook Live. Facebook, I mean, I'm telling you, man, Tebow has been killing it on social media. I think he he has been winning social media of the RC dudes this year. This in this time, uh, in this pandemic, whatever break that we're having. I wouldn't you say him and Savoya. Savoya has been really busy too. But Savoya kind of, yeah. only, it's in Europe and France, whereas Thibaut kind of generates to the whole world. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. I mean, everybody's, a lot of people are doing it, but a lot of people stop doing it. Like, they were, like, they've started, it's, that's the thing with content. Like, it, it's when you start, it's, it's easy because you're excited, but once you have to, like, start putting some thought into it, it beco- and it becomes difficult, you just kind of give up. So it's kind of slowed down a lot. Thomas Tran's been busy with TLR. They've been busy doing a lot of stuff. Speaking of TLR, I watched the second part of the history of Team Losi last night. Uh, but if I, and it's pretty good. I need to watch the first part. So they have this really cool docuseries going on. Drake, this one had uh, Drake on it. And it's something I didn't know. Uh, Drake was saying he packed up all his stuff, his, his car and all that stuff, and he went out there on the first day of work. He hadn't even unpacked all his stuff. The first day of work, when he got to TLR, Pops told him that they had sold the company to Horizon. That's pretty crazy. Dri- imagine driving all the way out there and say, hey, we sold the company. He's like, I thought I had to turn around and go back. But uh, yeah, it's a, you should check it out. It's a cool docuseries about Team Losi. So He got to keep the job anyway. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think, I, if I'm not mistaken, I think Gil and Pops continue to work for Horizon, or our part of Team Losi yeah. as part of that. We'll know more. Hopefully, I get Gil Losi on her soon, and uh, we can talk to him um, and see what happened. But, yeah, man, um, nothing much else going on. Like, I guess the big thing is, is the Nationals going to happen? That's the big question because it's the end of June, and there's no answers yet. And it's in Pennsylvania, which is kind of northeast which is one of the areas kind of afflicted by COVID. But it's outdoors, so I don't know what's going to happen. Um, my question is, because I've been listening to like Pulp MX and all that stuff, and even Supercross, they're talking about starting the season at the end of May. And they're like, well, our riders going to be, they're like talking about quarantine, different hill riders in, in one hotel and all that type of stuff. And our riders going to be ready. And I kind of asked this to Tebow. I said, are you going to be ready to race? 
And what do you think that these racers who aren't racing as much will it affect them? Or it's just the decre- these guys are still going. The fast guys are still going to be fast. That's what I think. You don't lose it. Yes, you may not be as sharp as you was because you're not practicing, but these guys can figure out tracks in in a few laps. You know what I mean? Yeah, I I don't think it's going to be a problem. I mean, I know they like to practice. We are, lucky. we are lucky here in Finland, for example, because the tracks are open, but there are countries where they're closed. So some people can't go practice. Yeah. So there's that, like it's unfair in that sense for some people. But then again, every spring when the season starts, people that live in cold climates haven't been able to run. You know, Canada, Scandinavia, Northern Europe in general. Yeah. This uh, is we true. can't drive during the winter. So, yeah, I don't think it's a problem. This is true. When, whenever true. we can go ra- back racing, we'll go, and same same people will be fast. Yeah, the cream will always rise to the top. So it's. I just want to get back to racing. But it looks like it's definitely feasible in America, Europe not so much. So I don't know what's going to happen there, unfortunately. So I was just watching a little bit of the 2018 Euros that RC Racing TV posted up this morning. So they still got a they got a good bunch of views watching these races. I and I it was like 1,500 people watching it. And oh, I, that's good. Yeah, they definitely got a a, a big crowd. I watch well, the Europeans are home. See, nothing really happened. France, England, all those countries are just home doing nothing. So they yeah. gotta watch that all this type of stuff. I definitely want to get because I miss watching racing and talking about it, man. This, you know, it's just uh, but it's not. This is not unique because I was listening. Like I said, I was listening to Polk, and uh, Steve was talking about the same thing. It's like, and I want to say shout out because we've been getting messages from people who appreciate what we do, and I want to say thank you to those guys. They're like, hey, thank you for what you. Even you, they thank you. Even this, like, you know, we like Beaker because he brings he brings something to the table. When he starts talking, he's been a lot better lately. So people appreciate what we do. And, and I think all the podcasts and everybody out there that are putting out content. So it's not easy to make up, to come up with content when there isn't none. But the good thing is like you and I have lots of stories from our travels that we can talk about. And it's good. Now, the other good thing is that guests have nothing much to do so you can get them on and talk to them. But yeah, people appreciate what we're doing. And that, Steve was talking about the same thing. He was like, you know, we don't really have much to talk about on our podcast. When I talk about Steve, I'm talking about Steve Mathis, Pulp MX, and all that type of stuff. But people just like to hear stories. And people just like you to talk about that, you know. He says, yes, maybe we're not getting numbers and all that type of stuff. But, um, yeah, he even said something that I liked. He said, yeah, you know. I've lost thousands of dollars in sponsor revenue because they just can't afford to pay right now, but I still pump my sponsors. So that's good too. And yeah, good stuff. Good stuff. We also have our first product, uh, product, uh, uh, spotlight this week. So Donathan, uh, RC leads. So that will probably be one after this. So check it out. There's also a giveaway attached to that. And he's going to be pushing out some, uh, no name RC podcast. Uh, the uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Logo leads and stuff. So it's pretty cool. Pretty cool stuff. We do that like once a month. Just a product spotlight for the small companies of RC. All right, Joseph. Uh, anything else you noticed this week, or are you just been in science mode? And no, I have definitely only been in science mode. It's been really great. I've been enjoying it. You know what? And I got people love my roast of you last week, but I must admit, I thought you was gonna slip two times this week. I thought you was gonna slip. You was on the you was on the razor's edge of slipping into that dark abyss of of addiction you again. Like, you like my uh, my self control, or what's the word? Well, you for? know, it's 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 like. You know, it's like saying you're an alcohol, you're you're a recovering alcoholic. You're not going to drink, but you still go to the bar, and you're just fresh out of rehab, and you're still at the <laughs> bar. 
So there's <laughs> lots of temptation right there for you. So you're one sip of alcohol away from being a full out drunk out the back dumpster diving somewhere. You know, don't forget, you're always. I'm an fine. I think. Yeah, well, it's just been a week. It's just been a week. Okay. But you're a razor's edge. You posted. You didn't say anything dumb. You didn't argue for anybody. But I see it. It's it's you know I'm just I'm like your sponsor right now. I'm trying to help you here, Joseph. I'm trying to uh, lead you on the right path from your Facebook addiction. But you know what? People did message me and say they they truly think you suffer from some form of autism. Really? Yeah. A message. Yeah. Uh, I'm not gonna say his name, but he he has an he has an autistic son, and he goes Joseph shows the signs of this because he says my son says. My son shows this, this, and that. And it was like, he shows. So what he are said, the signs? This, he says, oh, yeah, true. black and white. There's only black and white. So basically, like, this way, that way. Lack of empathy and um, something else he said. Let me bring it up. The three things that he brought up is uh, is ex- exactly you. <laughs> so, yeah, black and white. Exact, very little empathy, very literal. I have empathy, but not for like Yeah, I know. You have fake em- empathy. You have no, he also says he also says it's called asparagus, also have sensory issues like textures of clothing or bedding, so certain foods, loud noises and crowds tend to give them high ex- anxiety. You don't really suffer from that though, that part no. of it. So yeah, but the first three definitely. I think there's a whole new category that you belong in. To be honest, <laughs> I think you're a case study. Right. They could just do a whole study on you. Anyway, I make money if they just studied me. Uh, I don't know. Right now, maybe you Spend can money to be made here. You can sell a kidney and a bowl and make some money. Yeah. Yeah. Sell a left nut and make some money. That would suck for the person that gets my sperm, though. <laughs> yeah, I would what, donate sperm. I'm not sure if it even works. Oh, I'm sure it works. Oh, well. Let's not get into that. Oh, oh, woo. <laughs> See, look. Dirty little secrets coming out. Dirty little secrets. All right. Well, you know what, Joseph? We do have a few BTRC Facebook questions, so let's get into that, and then we'll get into our continued story of the... um. The South America tour. What do you say? Okay. BeachRC.com. The racers one-stop online hobby shop. Choose from all the popular brands and variety in stock with super fast shipping and great customer service. BeachRC.com still has the local hobby shop feel with all the benefits of the internet. BeachRC.com is the exclusive distributor for ultimate racing. JQ Racing, Pro Circuit Racing Tires, Nitro Lux Fuels, and Assault RC Performance Products. So fill up your cart and check out at BeachRC.com today. BeachRC, thank you BeachRC for sponsoring this part of the podcast. Brent's awesome, he's been a big supporter of the podcast, him and Lucas. For a long time, remember, Beach RC is a brick and mortar shop. They have a track, they have employees, they have a great selection of stuff to buy. They're also importers of JQ Racing. Shout out to all my JQ Racing family around the world. Love you guys. Bad News Bears, Bears of RC, the Motley Crew of RC, Ultimate Racing Assault RC. Check them out. Beach RC has some cool stuff. I'm going to get an affiliate link done so you can use that and uh, help you know show you if when you sh- shop at Beach RC, you'll show the No Name RC podcast some love. So go check out Beach RC, like I said, a brick and mortar hobby shop, a real hobby shop. So with that said, Joseph, we only have a few Facebook questions, but let's get to them so you can spend a little bit more time on them. The first one comes from Donnie Baker. Donnie wants to know, can you guys talk about diff height in the gearbox and the effects of moving it up and or down? The gearbox spacer? No, diff. Diff height in the gearbox. Yeah, diff height. It's 
it's kind of the fight kind of gets complicated. <clears throat> we haven't really had a option of adjust, adjust, <laughs> adjusting that, <laughs> adjusting that in eight scale. So I don't have as much experience with it, and it's it it kind of depends on the rest of the geometry of the car and where the diff is, but in general. In general, what I've found is high grip, smooth tracks, a higher diff is better. Uh, potentially on opposite, so uh, loose tracks and bumpy, bumpy tracks, a lower diff would be better. But for me, actually, regardless of the grip level, a higher diff is better. Well, what, what the, and why does the bumpy it... stuff, the bumpy stuff, I haven't really been able to test enough to know. This is actually something that I still need to really verify before the guide is finished, because I want to include the diff height stuff there. Because, see, the problem is that it kind of depends a bit on the car design also, you know, touring cars or 10 scale cars or eight scale buggies. The geometry is all different, so the angles of the drive shafts are different. So it it sort of depends on what does a high diff mean. That, do you see what I mean? Like mm -hmm. on some cars, the diffs are so low that when you raise and lower, it's 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 slightly different than on a car where the diff is so high that it it changes in it changes the angles of the drive shafts in a different way. But in general, what you can say is. Um, the higher the diff is on an eight, on our eight scale buggies, the higher the diff is, the lower the car wants to drive. But it sort of it it's it stiffens the car up also, so the car stays flat and low to the ground. Whereas when the diff is very low, the car feels softer. But it also doesn't stay as low to the ground. So, yeah. So, I can give a proper answer to this later on. But yeah, the diff, diff heights do make a significant difference to the car. But it's one of those things that to really get the most of it, the rest of the car sort of has to be designed around that. So... The designer of, of the car designs the car in a way where you have an adjustment for the diff and they make sense. And, and then, then it's a, a setup option that sort of works. Okay, so in these conditions, run the diff here. In these conditions, run it there. But when it's all kind of a, a mixed bag of things, you aren't necessarily really seeing the results of the diff height change in a, in a sensible way. It's other things that are changing with the geometry that, that then sort of play a bigger role. It's hard for me to explain like this, just, uh, you know. Mm -hmm. I think you random. need to uh, do a Facebook Live on this. You know, you need to, for, you know what would be great? I was thinking, if you, like, remember when you did that Facebook Live where you cut the wheel in half? And yeah. you, I think if you could get more cutoff sections like that and do it on your Facebook lives as well, or in the guide videos, we explain a lot because people can see more that way, you know? Yeah. Yeah. That's the plan. That's the plan. There's been, I've been working on a couple of projects here now and they're kind of done now. So now May and June, I'm finishing the guide and uh, also shooting some videos. So I guess those will be released then later in the year. But the work is being done now. Yeah, good stuff. Someone actually asked about that, um, about the new guide. I don't know if we talked about it last week. Can't remember. But it's a lot of work, man. A lot of work. People don't realize. Like, you've done all the text work. Now it's all the other, uh, you know, video and pictures and all that stuff. Yeah, and it's actually, it's going to be a book. So that was decided. It's actually going to be a physical book. Okay. 
So there's not going to be videos so, or what's up? Yeah, there's also going to be videos, but yeah. It's, Good stuff. It's a r- an actual book. Cool. Good stuff. All right. Thank you for the question from Donnie Baker. We have a couple more and then we'll get on to our stories. Adam Ross. What's up, Ross Racing? What would you ask of your sponsor drivers to help promote the brand or brands they support? I'm looking for ways I can improve what I do for them and open to suggestions. Well, first, I think Adam Ross does a really good job. He he was he's back to work now, but he's super busy. He every time I met this dude, he's from Canada. Eh. Um he's I met him twice at PMB. He's super friendly, super nice. I like going over by the Canada guys group because they always got beer and they're, they're always up for a good crack. Uh and these guys just I can tell that these guys are just happy to be at races. And he's been, he was busy doing Facebook Lives and all that type of stuff. And I think he does a, a great job of promoting his brand. He runs for Soar and a whole bunch of other stuff. So I don't know how much else you can do, Adam, man, because I think you're on a you're doing a great job of that. Um what what about you, Joseph? What do you look for in in sponsor drivers? Because I'll give my answer after you. There's two different kinds. There's there's those that are really good at racing and can bring really good results. Results are important. It doesn't matter what you are like or well. Of course, it's better if you're a nice, helpful guy and all that stuff. But if you win the big races, that in itself is okay. Like if Ongaro didn't speak a word of English and he was a complete dick, it wouldn't really matter because he's so good. Wins races, amazing driver. That's one side of the thing. Okay. Now I'm not saying on Haro's like that. It's just an example. So someone who is really good wins locally, regionally, nationally on the world stage results. That's kind of one thing to look for. Then another thing is some people are not, not that good, uh, drivers. They don't get really, you know, many special results, even on their sort of local level or whatever class they race, their results aren't good, but they are very good with people and their equipment. So they know all about the product. The cars are always spotless and clean and new. They have all the latest bits and that, and they know everything and they're good with people too. So they influence other people to use the products that they use and they help other people and uh, advise other people and other people can look at their cars and they're impressed and they go, Oh, wow, this is really nice. What's this and what's that? And they like to talk about the cars and that, that sort of stuff. So those are typically two different types of people and both are needed. It's very rare to find all those attributes in one person. Normally the people who are really good, good drivers, or, or even, even to some extent, really good at setup, they are interested in that, but it's a sort of selfish pursuit in a sense, in a way, like they learn about setup for themselves. They race for themselves, you know, so they, they get good results and they understand how to make the cars work, but they sort of keep it to themselves, not because they don't want to share it because that's just not their personality. You know, they hunker down and do their thing and they're good at that. And then the people who are open and they like to chit chat and talk and all that, they don't get the results and maybe they don't know, understand set up that well, because they like the product, they like the build, they like it to look good. They like to talk with people about it and they're more, more about the socializing aspect of it. So I think those are the two different types of, of people that you want to that you want to support your brand and to promote it out there in in the at the tracks yeah i agree with you yes we we i want results obviously i want to win races or i want to get podiums i definitely want that to happen uh i mean this is racing that's not that's not like bs each other and say that we don't want to we don't want to do well um, I also, it's very rare that you get 
a guy that's really good at setup, really friendly with people, as well as fast. Because it's it's hard to be all three of those things at a race, you know? Uh, because you got to focus on, on one thing, you know? You can't be a jack of all trades, a master of none. I think my biggest thing I say to people when they join JQ Racing, I say, look, man, be a part of the team, have fun, and don't be an asshole, you know? I know, get it, Pete. Like, I mean, I mean, don't be an ass. Don't go out of your way to just be like, I do not like that snobbish. I'm a sponsored guy. I got a thousand different companies on my shirt. Uh, sponsored driver, man. I do not like that. I, I, I think it's just stupid. Like, you know, we're racing RC cars. There's limited amount of people that are make money at this, and um, it doesn't matter how much. much. Huh? I was gonna say that the best. Sponsored drivers are the ones who aren't sponsored because they want to be sponsored, but they are sponsored because they want something else. So let's say a racer that wants to be as good as possible and get great results in the future, he's sponsored because it supports, it makes it possible for him to race more. Mm -hmm. You know, that's a good sponsored driver. Uh, you or know a sponsored driver that is sponsored so that he can get more parts and keep his car in better shape and so it looks even better in the pits and you know so when he talks to his friends and socializes and everything he's he's got like the latest bits maybe mm -hmm. he got gets parts that he normally couldn't get you know like he gets them earlier or sooner like he likes that as like yeah people who are sponsored not because they want to be sponsored like the number one thing isn't being sponsored the number one thing is something else that that's a benefit of being sponsored, you know? Yeah. And, and does people, that make sense? Yeah. And people have to realize when you sponsor people, yes, people are like, Oh, you're just, uh, just a contract customer. Well, at some point, yes, I would say that's, that's somewhat true, but I look at it differently. Uh, we're also, you also give people a discount and you want them to represent your brand. And well, all, um, I think we all need to be ambassadors of RC and most of us are, uh, you know, um, most of us are are really, once, once we get to know somebody, we get excited and we talk about it. Me, I talk about RC to anybody because I'm just like that. But these guys have to understand, like, it's not just about them as well. It's about the team you represent. And like with us, like, we push team. Like, we want everybody, to, we try to get everybody to pit together because we want to have fun and help each other out. And we try to push each other and defend each other because, you know, let's be realistic. Like, we can't, we are the underdogs and, you know, we got, because of you, and like, don't be straight up, because of you, we got a lot of shit. Like, you know, most drivers do. But, I mean, people can't accept that and go if it. Some people accept it and they're cool with it and then they get tired of it or whatever. But anyway, I just would rather have that guy who, yeah, I want that guy who's going to have results, but I want him also to be, if he could just be friend, like, you know what? Like, I tell you all the time, a little bit of attention goes a long way. And a lot of people just want you to say, hey, what's up? How's your car doing? Does this look good? Or maybe just go watch them race and see how they're doing. Maybe be realistic. Like you can say, hey, you know, uh, you don't know how to do this. You just tell people. You got to learn. This is the thing I say to you. You got to learn how to do that better is when you see people just don't say you're doing it wrong. Like tell them what they're doing wrong. You know what I mean? That helps nobody. You're doing that wrong. Well, how do I fix that? Uh Oh, you can try this and stuff like that. But definitely don't be a dick. Like, I think that's the biggest thing. Like, don't be one of those stuck up guys who think they're all special because they've got a thousand different sponsors on their shirt. I actually think the whole having all your sponsors in your shirt thing is, is finally getting played out. But, I mean, but, but we still do it. But I just think, like, remember, you're representing this company. Be cool, like, but have fun, too, at the same time. Don't, don't be all serious and... I think a lot of people put a lot of pressure on themselves when they get sponsored. And you shouldn't. Like, I've had people come to me and say, man, I'm, I'm sorry I'm not getting the results that, that, that I want. I say, hey, man, are you having fun? Like, if they say, yeah, I'm enjoying myself and stuff, I say, well, that's all that matters, man. For me, I mean, yes, I want results, but keep, like, I'll tell you what. Keep your pits clean. Have your car looking clean. Um. When somebody wants to look at your car, talk to them about your car. Tell them why you like being on that team, why you like this and who you like and, you know, why you want to be a part of this and why, you know, that type of stuff. And and I like people to be honest, like, hey, you know, well, this doesn't work on our car, so we change it with this or whatever. Be like that. 
as well. No, you know, we, we, like, you're honest about that stuff. I, you know, I, I tell people what's wrong with the cars right off the bat, like, hey, change this and whatever. But be proud of what you're doing. And, and people will see that. You know, people will see, oh, wow, those guys, they, they have fun in their pits and they, they ain't assholes and they treat, treat everybody. And I think that's, that's why we, we get a lot of, we gravitate to everybody. Even people that totally disagree with what you, you think politically wise still like to be a part of your team because we kind of like, you know, what the Motley crew, bad news bearers of RC. So I think that's a good thing. Um, yeah, just, just be pr promote your company's products. Remember you're an ambassador of them. And you know, you know, what's funny. And we actually sometimes make fun of people for this at big races, you know, how, how there's such long breaks. Mm -hmm. Typically at all races, there will be some people who end up hanging out, hanging out in our pits more than their own pits. Like they don't race JQ cars. Mm -hmm. They race for someone else and they're even sponsored, but they come and hang out in our pits. And then sometimes we make fun of them for that. But yeah. I think that's pretty funny. Yeah, well, because because <laughs> uh, like in our pits, you got to have thick skin too. So, um, because exactly like how we are her, it's actually worse when we're in person. But it's just yeah, I think people just like because we always have cold beer and we ain't scared to just oh, crack a beer and talk crap to each other and you know have fun. Uh, and and I think other pits are like that too. But sometimes I go around and I see people that are just not having fun. Like they're just like trying to be too serious and i'm like man none of us there's only a handful of guys who are here getting paid for this like that's that's the guys who have to take this seriously i mean the rest of us need to have fun and you know it's something that tebow touched on uh on the call in yesterday when somebody asked him how long does it take to to get used to a car to the to, to his techno car and he said it took him about a year Right to really feel comfortable with it, and because he said I came from Kyosha, I knew that like the back of my hand, and it took me about a year. And I think that's about right. I think uh, I look at like Cole Ogden when he left Mugen and went to HB. It took him about a year of bad results. He's, I mean, he's still not reached his full potential, but he's definitely 2019 was a better year than 2018. So these guys are pro guys with some really good talent, right? Like some of the best in the world. And these guys are taking a year to figure out a car. So when somebody drives a car for one month and then says that car is not for me, I think it's utter bullshit. Like you don't even, like you're telling me that this guy who's a pro takes a year to figure out a car, but you know in one month, that's just, you just got a better deal somewhere. Or you just don't want to put in the time to learn something. The people that put yeah, in. Yeah, that's. Yeah, go on. The people that put in the time to figure out things, those who get the best benefit out of things. Another thing I say to people is like, if you don't, if you don't get involved, like especially a JQ racing, if you don't get involved in the team, then you're missing out on on the best thing of of JQ racing. Like, you know, like especially like we all talk, like if you don't get involved in the groups and talk with guys and and get to know other people and get you know your reps and all that stuff, you're missing out on the best thing. So. You know, I just, I just like in my time working with you and working for you in the last three years, I just seen so much and I just can read through the bullshit. Like I, like I literally, like literally we had like one guy drive a car for a tank, break an arm and say the car is not for him. And I'm just like, how are you do you even know? Like, that's so stupid. Like, but Hey, you know what? At the end of the day, this is people's money and they want to go where they want to go. And some people just like going to different cars. And that's fine. But don't expect a discount from each car. And I, I, if you if you buy full retail, then you can switch and all that stuff. And, you know, whatever. I don't have no problem with that. But I think you should give a car a first shake. And a month isn't a first shake, in my opinion. Or one tank isn't a first shake. You got you to gotta go out there and, and drive and figure out cars. And it's, no car is just instantly good. There might be a few that are really good right out of the box. But I don't know. That's my thing. Give your company, if you're going to be of a company, if you're going to be sponsored, give that company the time you promised them and go from there. That's what I say. That's another good thing. Honor your contracts, man. Honor your contracts. Yeah, I think that, I think people should join a brand for a reason that's not, not the price, not the percentage discount, mm -hmm. but some reason. Whatever that reason is, like find a company 
to support for a reason and then stick with that. That's going to be, that's, in in the lo- in the long run, that's going to be the best deal mm-hmm. because you'll have the most fun and it will be the most beneficial for you. And you'll you'll just you will end up, in my opinion, you would end up having the best relationship to that company or the people working for that company and some team manager or reps or owners or whatever it may be. So. You'll have a relationship with the people in the in the company, in the brand, and you will know the product well, and you you'll get good results for your racing. Good group of friends. You know that that's really the best way. If if you keep if you are doing it for the price, then when a better deal comes along, you switch to that because the price is better. You won't ever really build that network of, of friends and, and sort of the benefits that, that, that come only through long-term commitment. It will never happen. A lot of people miss out on that. Yeah. Also people have to understand is that team managers talk, you know, team managers talk and they, and they know who, who's gonna like, I can like know who know who skips out and everything and who, who does that. And, I think I actually think after this COVID thing, that's gonna a lot of that's gonna stop. I think a lot of this is gonna stop because it's gonna be. I don't know. We'll see. Once this all gets stopped, like just these guys switching whenever they feel like it and stuff like that, I just don't see it happening as much. People can't afford to switch a car brand, a complete car brand, sponsored or not, is expensive. Period. You know, and then like you know, we RC guys like they like to have everything matching, and I think that stuff looks great. Like pit board all that stuff wraps you gotta change all of that that's expensive some people just like doing that too all right enough time on that this question from brad maynard we kind of touched on this a bit but let's let's recap this he asks hold on let me bring this up which company is winning the social media during the covid 19 crisis which team do you which what team is what what team is doing the most for their brand a respectable company well i kind of touched on that earlier i think tiba is doing really well i think he's kind of leading the charge with this but you know what cavalry's been busy as well i forgot to mention that uh he's been doing a lot of stuff um with like lives with joe pillars uh, jason martin's doing some good ones with the uh, nemo racing Yes, Lee Martin's doing some good ones. Uh, even John Hazelwood getting together with, with him and doing like uh, YouTube things. We said we mentioned Renault Savoia. I see um, uh, uh, TLR. Obviously, they've been busy every every week. Like Thomas has been on there. Dude, that guy's gonna do so good things for TLR. Um, you know, it's funny. I I haven't I haven't seen any TLR stuff. Really. I don't know. That's kind of, yeah. Maybe they blocked you. <laughs> I don't know. I'm going to actually go look. Yeah, but they've been busy every thing. every week. Maybe sometimes even twice a week. So Ryan Dunford's been busy. Frank Root's been busy. Then they, then um, then Thomas has been in like Facebook calls with different people. Like Coda and all that stuff. I got to get him on this podcast too. Barry Baker, another one. Uh, uh well, Rifkin, Rifkin's been doing this all this time. Rifkin's been the, one of the most active guys, even before this. Not as active lately, but he's been doing stuff. Jason Rona, man, Jason Rona gets a whole bunch of views and chatting. I do. I think he does it every Saturday. He's just like packaging up stuff in his house and just talking, like, and it's fun, like, just asking different questions. I I actually joined in for like an hour, just talking to him. Uh, Mayfield started. But he kind of backed off. I'll tell you who I'm surprised I haven't seen much from. Lutz did a build. I haven't seen much from Lutz. Um, I thought I'd see more from him. Uh, he did. He is doing a, a giveaway where he built a car, and is, I think they're doing a, a, a draw or something for it, which is pretty cool. Drake's kind of not been not active, but he, does, he never really done much lives and stuff. He did do a cool throwback picture of all his 10-scale uh, stuff and all that there. But, yeah, I think these guys... 
also do content throughout the year. So maybe they're just taking a break. Kind of like you. You do a lot of content throughout the year, so it's kind of just off a little bit. And I think all the podcasts are doing good because it's hard to come up with content. But I would say mm, I think Tebow is doing it. Because Tebow, man, Tebow got like 200. He's got like 200 views. Like, And I really like what he's talking about. He's talking about driving techniques and all that type of stuff. So people want to hear that stuff. Tebow. I would say Tebow's doing really well for techno right now. How about you? Who else do you think? Who do you think is winning as a company? Um, I don't know. I don't know if there are any winners at this point. Yeah. I, and well, then what's you... it really going to do? People will watch some videos. I mean... It's not that's not really selling kits when they can't go to the track. Yeah, so. but then like you look at companies like Associated and and TLR, they just don't have race kits either. So Associated's got their Element product line with their trail trucks as well as that new uh, no prep drag car, and that's probably more popular than anything right now. And of course, TLR has all the other hori- flying industry, um, the whole crawling industry part genre, all that yeah. type of stuff. So. Those are probably that the genres, those genres are probably what's winning for those companies. So I would say TLR and Associated are winning RC right now because they just have so much more stuff. But race wise, I would say I think I think honestly think Tebow, Savoya, um, Rifkin's always been doing a good job. He did a good Facebook Live with um Richard Saxton. And TLR, TLR has been killing it too on the social media stuff. So that's not easy, man. It's not easy. All right, Joseph. So that's enough. Anything to add before we go on and talk about our South America tour? No. All right. Well, thank you everybody for your Facebook questions. Remember, go check out Beach RC. We greatly appreciate it. Uh, let's move on to our. We didn't do it last week, and we don't have a rant this week, so we're gonna talk about. I think we're on leg. We went to Argentina, and now we are, we're going to Chile. So that's what, leg four of the South American tour? Yes, this is leg four. I remember the, the weirdest part about this hill was when we got through customs and we was going on that mountain road, and you could literally, we was on a double-decker bus this time, so it was super comfortable. And I was actually at the window, and you wasn't. A good thing you wasn't at the window because, man, if you looked on, this is a good road. If you looked on, it was one of those roads that just looked like a, a snake going all, you can see it go all the way to the bottom of the, the mountain. Just 90, de- like 180 degree turns all the way down. Burp, 180, 180 left, 180 right. Man, I swear, there was no guardrails either. Man, that bus driver was so close to the edge every time going on that road. Like I swear, the front fenders was just going over the front of the, of the edge of the of the road, going on there. Oh, it took forever to get down the bottom. It was pretty nerve wracking. I told you, fly, flying safer. I told you, a bus a month. Yeah, but this wasn't like a death road. We didn't see any crosses on the road. This was like a proper road, but it just went straight down, but one eighties all the way down. You know what I mean? Like you could literally stand at the top and see it go all the way down to the bottom. So we made it. That was actually a really comfortable bus too. Double decker. It was cool. It was, it was beautiful scenery going through the Andes, man. The Andes is so majest- majestic. It's a beautiful mountain range, man. Beautiful. So Chile. Now Chile has the, the best economy in South America. So I didn't realize that till we got there. So we get to Chile, but the, we went to some janky ass ghetto looking bus shelter. Remember that? We're walking around and Santiago, Chile, carrying our luggage, and we don't know where we're going. Where, where, where did we go? Like we had to go get a taxi, and we had to go. We had a bed and breakfast. I'm a B and B, Airbnb. Don't start that shit, Joseph. Oh, you heard that? Yes, of course I heard that. Sorry. Pay attention. I just remember us okay. lugging our luggage through this ghetto ass part of Chile, trying to find a taxi. So we got a taxi. We're driving to through Santiago. And I'm like, I see all these Haitians, and I'm like, am I back home? Like, because you know, what I was, I didn't know there was so many Haitians there. And the tax driver goes, yeah, they all came down here for after the earthquake. 
as part of. Oh. <laughs> what the? What did you just drop? I'm sorry. Yeah, go on. What did you just drop? Just some screws. Yeah, it sounds like just some screws. It sounds like a whole case of screws. Don't pick uh, them up. Wait till you finish. Wait till we finish doing this to pick them up. Just pay attention for once, okay? That's what happens. See, you. you this is you in science mode. This is your aut- ADHD picking in. Like, just sit your ass, sit your little narrow ass down on your chair and pay attention, okay? And yeah, let me just put them back. No, that's not. Okay, go on. Okay. So we get in Chile. We're meeting up with Gaston. So we got our Airbnb at this one. Did you book this, I think, or did I? I can't remember what Gaston, but anyway, we could not, remember, we could not find this place to save our life. We're like, we're in front of the hotel. We're like, we didn't know where it was, but it ended up being this nice one bedroom apartment, man, like way up in this high rise in Santiago. And, uh, I got. I had to sleep on the couch this time because I. Oh yeah, this was the best. This was the best place we stayed. I think. Yeah, but the whole trip. Yeah, well, you had the big bed. I had to sleep on the couch. Yeah, because in Argentina you got the, your own room and everything, and so then we decided that I next time I get the better one, and yeah. then we were staying in this awesome apartment. That was I beautiful. That was high rise. Ah. It had a laundry and a pool on the top deck, and um. Ah, it's just so tired. I remember we went for a walk and he's like, let's go, let's go, let's go hang out. I was like, Joseph, I'm too tired. You was fuck tindering away. Let's go, let's go. I was like, nah, we just, cause we, I think we had a long day. Gaston was going to come pick us up. We was going out to the, uh, to the RC facility. I was just, I just remember it's just a city. It was just so busy. There's so much traffic. It was crazy, crazy, crazy. I mean, that all played a, far, a part because then we met up with Gaston the next day who I had met through Facebook. And he took us up to probably the best RC facility I've been to. And I just remember as we was driving out, because this is outside of the city, we could, he's like, look, Santiago is the most polluted co- city in, uh, in South America. And you can see all the smog there. Remember that? When we was driving no, up. I don't and, remember the smog. You don't remember. When we was driving, I remember that uh, Santiago reminded me of London. That, just that area where yes. we were staying. Yeah. It was... It was just like we were in London. Yeah, it was. It was crazy. Like lo- little pubs insane. everywhere, little restaurants yeah. everywhere. Yeah. It was pretty, it was pretty nuts. We saw something crazy. We did, we, we went to eat or something. I can't remember what we did. I can't, I, I can't, it's been so long. But I remember going to this track. So we get to this facility. It's way out, but it's not way. It's about an hour, 45 minutes to an hour outside of, of the city. But dude, we walked into that place and just remember, I remember all the fruit trees. It's like, wow, what's all these fruit trees? And it's like, yeah, they plant all these fruit trees, helps pay for bills around her. Dude, I remember you walked in her and you was like, oh my God, this is awesome. We had a clubhouse with all this like old Chilean RC history, cars, planes, boats. Gaston goes, yeah, that's my car right there. Remember that? It was so cool. They had a restaurant. They had a, a man-made lake for boat racing. RC boat racing. They had a full big ass full circuit go kart track. They had a big f- flying airfield, like proper, like I think you could have landed a real airplane on that that thing. Proper air airfield, a helicopter airfield, a drone airfield. They had a big proper like where you can hold a world championship, um, eight scale or fifth scale. On road track with a big ass driver stand. They had a big that big, like they had two two dirt tracks. They had a ten scale track and they had an eight scale track. That track, hey, I just remember like this was the best facility that we went to. Fully covered pits, air compressors, ba- benches, everything for everybody. Are you listening? Are you there? Yeah, it was it was pretty nuts. Yeah, I met Pato Concho, who I had, uh, met. Like, he was the first South American. He's the one who actually helped me find um, find RC people here in uh, DR when I first moved on her. It was cool, man. We met Gaston. Gaston's all chilled out. Like, yeah, man, yeah, no problem, dude. What did he say? What did he call Dog. Yeah, dog, no problem. It was a good time. 
we didn't really get much people out there. We went to visit a couple of hobby shops. We turned some laps at this track. Um, then we went out to dinner with Gaston that night. We had some really good sandwiches. I remember that. Oh, yeah, we did. Yeah. It's like a, it was like an English pub that we went to. Remember? Yeah. But it was Uruguayan. It was a Uruguayan place, but it was set up like an English pub. Oh, Chile was definitely different. It's so crazy how each of these countries are so different. So different. So many. Well, like, Chile had a very European flavor, but it was more, like you said, more London. Whereas Argentina was more like, I want to say, like, Italy, maybe. Italy, yeah, Spain. Yeah, Italy or Spain or something like that, but like 20 years ago. Yeah. 30 years ago. <laughs> Seriously. Yeah. <laughs> That's how I felt. But then, yeah, Chile was a surprise. Santiago was like we were back in Europe in London or something. Yeah, it was it was yeah. good. We didn't really spend much. I think we only spent three days there. But we got to meet Gaston. He's cool. I was talking to him the other day. I think he's still running the JQ. But definitely uh best facility. Would you say you I remember you when your eyes lit up, he's like, Oh, this why doesn't this place why isn't this place having a world's like, you know, or something like that. So Yeah, it could easily have the world, sir. It's really nice. Proper, proper RC facility for everything. So, like I said, we didn't spend much time in Chile, but the big trip, the next big leg of our trip was Colombia. So I was looking forward to that. So are you charging your phone or something? Uh, yeah. Stop. It's causing static. Okay. Oh, God. You must have got better oh. internet, dude, because you have not, you, you have been crystal clear. Oh, really? this recording. Something you've done oh, has made your internet better. Same. Okay. So we hopped on a flight to go to... Did something happen in the Chilean airport or something like that? I can't remember. I don't think so. Anyway, we had, we had to fly to Colombia, we, which was like a six-hour flight, I think, or five-hour flight. But we got to go on one of those big... New airplanes. It had like automatic. I don't know. It, I just remember we had we were sitting in the middle seat. It was not very full. We had a whole row to ourselves watching television. Like the um the shades on the wind on the windows of the airplane, they were automatic. The stewardesses were beautiful. Oh, they were so beautiful. It's um, unbelievable that you remember these things. I have no recollection. Zero. I do not remember one thing about this yeah because you that's you <laughs> you're probably on your computer or something you know but i remember these things i just remember because i was like this is such a comfortable airplane like i just remember it was so big and you know i remember a few sphincter sphincter pulsating moments going over the andes too every time we fly over mountains this planes would just get turbulence would be so bad and um I think we had to fly. I think we had to fly into like Cali, and then we was going to Peraria. I think that's how you say it. So Peraria is a smaller. We was going to see uh, Pereira. Pereira, yeah. We was going to see uh, Juan Felipe, and uh, hang out with him. So mm-hmm. we flew into Cali, and then we flew in uh, a smaller airplane to Pereira, which is a really small, small airport. We got there. I think we was a little bit late. The plane was late or something. Or we missed a flight somewhere. I can't remember. I, I, or something happened. The plane, plane was late. So we get to Peraria. It's nighttime. And I remember this little airport. And I had my, my bag. I hadn't got my, my, my awesome Walmart hard case bag. But this woman, I think either was your bag or my bag she picked up. She just picked up a bag and started walking with it. So I had to chase this lady down in the airport. She was like almost out of the airport. I was like, hey, pardon, pardon. And she almost walked out of the airport with one of our bags. And the cop was like looking at us like we was crazy. <laughs> so we get out. We meet up We meet up with Juan Felipe. It's nighttime. He takes us. Luckily, Juan Felipe was a manager of a hotel, a part owner or something. So we had two separate rooms. And uh, I think he was on the floor below me and I was on the floor up top. But I remember we just had the internet was crap at these, this hotel, so we got we got two rooms, and I'm all excited to be in Colombia. I'm gonna say one thing about Colombia, all right? And if you have kids, 
please, don't let them listen to this. But if you don't, this is what I'm going to say about Colombia. When God made the earth, if God made the earth. <laughs> I, I already know where this is going. <laughs> he had a whole bunch of beauty and ass left over. And he just said, you know what, Colombia? I am going to bless you not only with a beautiful country, but I'm going to bless you with beautiful women with abundance of big butts, big asses. Because, oh, my God. I, my head was on a swivel. I, this Number one, number one in all the travels. I mean, Peru had some really beautiful women too. Don't get me wrong. But not just out in the street. Like, oh, well, you just, we went to the mall. And I was just like, oh, wow. <laughs> I just remember saying that to you. I was like, oh my, it's true. It's true. I just remember saying that to you. It's true. And I was just like, oh my gosh. So beautiful women everywhere and i live in the dr and there's beautiful women here dude everywhere but this was just like every oh my god every girl i saw was just like oh wow this is amazing so i think the next day we met up with juan jose serna so he had come from cali to his private to his mom's private penthouse mansion so he picked us up and he took us to the mall and um, you got a haircut, and I try to get a haircut, and all this type of stuff. He's just, I mean, just walking around the mall, I'm just like, oh, wow. I, I still have to say wow. So we went back to his his country house, which is big ass mansion that he has, right? His him, his cousin. I forget his cousin's name. He comes to DNC too. I just remember he had that cool OGO bag, the Valentino Rossi bag, and he had that badass BMW. So whether, and then that's when we uh, Sebastian and his cousin and everybody was there. I remember Sebastian would not speak two words to you. The two words he asked you the whole time because he was x-ray. He goes, why do you hate Ty Tessman? That's the first two words he said to you. And he's like, I don't hate Ty Tessman. And you guys got in a big discussion about that. We went swimming and wanted, man, he had, man, that, that dude had a pimping ass house, man. That was a nice house. Really? Oh, yeah, yeah, I remember. It was way out in the, way out in like a gated community, but wow. It was really nice. And they had good beer. What was the beer they let me drink? It was like in a red can. I drank a lot of that I stuff. I can't remember. I, th- I drank so much. I think I drank a couple of cases of that stuff to myself. So, But you know, the thing about Colombia I remember was, so we, like we said, Argentina reminded us about, you know, Southern Europe. Uh, Chile was a lot like London. Colombia was like, now we are finally in Jurassic Park. Like, this is not Europe anymore. Oh, well, that's what, it, it reminded me a exactly. lot of here, of DR, but more mountain. Yeah. Well, it's it more was, that, northern. That was definitely like, now we are somewhere exotic. Yeah. A whole different feel. All completely different, like, vibe. Yeah, now I'm, I'm in my territory. Pacers, you know, it's like 3,000 <laughs> pacers to a dollar. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's warm. It's, it's tropical. We was up in the mountains a little bit, but not, it's green. I'm like, yeah, now this is the Latin America that I'm used to, you know? So I'm like, yeah, this is my, I'm right at home here. Uh, I'm loving it. We, you met Laura Croft. Uh, I forgot her name. The zookeeper girl. Yeah. That you, I must success, say that was successful. That was your one successful Tinder relationship pre pre tinder yeah she was nice she's like we called I, her Laura. I pre pre tindered before we got there i remember her taking us and around on her a, sorry go ahead you got a tour guide yeah she took us that around in that like shitty Laura little Croft. black car that she had it's like big yeah, guy in a little Laura. car um but she looked like a, a she looked like laura croft because she was a zookeeper or something and she had like boots on and those cargo pants it was actually sexy i'll be honest with you she was beautiful <laughs> though. and um you of course didn't seal the deal, but that's yeah. Sorry for another time, but no, I didn't. yeah, I don't she know. Was an, she was an architect. Yeah, that too. An architect. Yeah, that too. She was nice. She was a nice girl. She could have. Did she have a come on into the racetrack or something? No, she had to work or something. No, yeah. but she was nice. She took us around. And we went out to dinner and lunch. Um, we hung out with Juan Jose and those guys a lot, and then more guys came. So they're having this big race at, um, well, not a big race, but they have a, this is like, I think, where everybody came just to, to see you, right? I think you might have been one of the first pro guys to go to Colombia. I think you still are. 
like top Maybe. guys at that time. I don't think Robert's been there yet. I know Robert and Juan Jose are really close, and all those guys are cool. So you know, you, we did um, this uh, track was at a uh, in a national park. I remember that, and this track had the weirdest surface. Remember, it was kind of slick when they watered it, like it had like. Um, yeah, but it was great though. Yeah, it I was really a good track. That. It was a good track. I had that crazy. Jo- I raced that race, didn't I too? Yeah, I yeah. raced there too. Maybe. I think I raced. Yeah, I did. They had the they had a different type of race too. Like, like the qualifying was way different. Remember that? I think you did a five minute session. I remember there was something weird going on where we had no idea what was going on. Yeah. yeah I know. <laughs> Basically. <laughs> there was something really strange that happened, but I can't remember what. But I think that was your best clinic. Did I even win? Did I win? Yeah, you did. Okay. But, but that something was something happened. Something was I, something was strange. No, because their qualifying was different. Like they did um, a fi- five minute session and two 15 minute sessions, and somehow it worked out. And they had two different classes. I can't remember. I have to, I have to uh, talk to Juan Felipe about it again, or Juan Jose to remember how, or Sebastian see how it go, how it went. Um, but that was your biggest clinic, man. I people from all over Colombia came to that. Yeah, and um, yeah, that was a good one. Yeah, it was good, and we raced. We had fun. That I remember. Uh, that it was a national park, and they had a big, like, um, Aboriginal or Native people festival there. Oh man, we went. <laughs> I remember driving in there, at um, and Juan's like, "You're gonna watch these people get drunk and they get stupid, and we can't. You just have to avoid them, right?" We ran in there at like seven o'clock in the morning, dude. There was guys fully drunk right on the side of the road carrying each other to this <laughs> festival. I was like, oh, that looks like how people go to the beach in DR. Like, you know what I mean? Like they'll come people from all over the where like this where the, there's no beaches in, in the island. They'll come up on big buses. Oh man, these guys would be f- pissed drunk on the way. Just not it's eight o'clock in the morning and they're coming off the bus drunk, fully drunk. I was like, oh, yeah. I remember that was a good race, too. Had, like, all those people came and watched. That track was fast, man. The track had some hard sections. You had this one section that only you was able to do it. And Juan Jose was pretty good, man. It was Juan Jose. Was, he's fast. He's good. Um, yeah, it was, a good, it was a good vibe. I enjoy Colombia. And then... um. We hung out with those guys. We went out. I think we went out almost every night with those guys. That's that's the one race I think where we actually went out and hung out with the racers every night. Because one is and the guys are young, so we went out with them. It was fun, man. I had a blast in Colombia. I I want to go Colombia so bad again. Like I want to go to like Cali and Medellin and Cucho. No, what's that other Cucho? So I can't remember. Uh, I think it's time for another tour. Yeah, it would be great. I want to push. You know, um. And Colombia had the, I think, the second, big, third biggest RC scene. I think it, I think in levels of of RC, we didn't get to Brazil, unfortunately. I would love to get to Brazil, but I think it goes Argentina, Brazil, Colombia. When it comes to skill level, and well, it's kind of died in Colombia too, unfortunately. So, um, but it was great, man. We had fun. That what we call Juan. We did a Facebook live from Juan Jose's house. He uh. Then he was at uh, DNC the following year. It was good stuff, man. We, we met some really cool people on that trip. We had fun. I remember us, you and I, we, just, we spent like four days more after the race there. And we just we were just going out like, we didn't know where we was going. Jesus, we went to some local club near, nearby. <laughs> I remember that. <laughs> like, and I'm like, yeah. We, that- hotel. And we, like, we are hearing gunshots at night, right? Yeah, something you know like that. that. Yeah, yeah, we yeah. heard some gunshots. Remember? Yeah. And they're like, let's go out. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah, I love I Colombia, man. I, I, I love it there. So it's my type of country. Definitely my type of country. We had a blast there. It was sad, though, because that was ending our trip. Juan Jose treated us really good, too. I mean, Juan Jose. Um, Juan Felipe, free hotel for the week. Transportation. Um, it would be so fun to like hit these same spots again. Yeah. You know, have some races again and may, maybe film some video this time and like document. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. It would be Good a lot. Time. Yeah. It would be a lot better. We didn't even, I had my janky S6. I'm actually using that janky S6 now to talk to you. 
But um, yeah, it was good, man. It was it was my dream come true, right there. One of my dreams, like you know, I really I like. If I didn't live her in the DR, I I could easily live in South America. It's but it's but here's the thing: people have to understand. Shit is ex RC is expensive there. Super expensive. I remember, um, like kits, like a HP kit was nine hundred dollars in Argentina, and it didn't come in a box. It come in like plastic bags, cause yeah. you know, cause everybody's trying to sneak them in, like or. You know, not sneak them in, but buying them in the states, or you wait till they get to the states. Engines and all that stuff were cheap. That stuff was cheap because they're small, so it doesn't cost much. But kits, expensive, expensive. Well, I think Bolivia and um, Colombia had the best price, best prices, but I know in Chile and in in Argentina and Brazil, oh, it's just crazy. I definitely would have liked. You know, it's it makes me sad that we're not having a world because I really wanted to go to Brazil. Stop charging your phone. Oops. The world, like people were complaining about the worlds being in Brazil and all that stuff, and maybe it would have been a pain in the ass to go there. But I guarantee you, that spot where the world is going to be and that track that that guy was going to build, this would have been a great world. And it's in Brazil, and it's not in Rio de Janeiro where it's all, you know, dangerous and shit. It's up in the country. You know what I mean? Uh, are you finished moving? <laughs> Yeah, I I just think I I just I I just would have really enjoyed going to the world. Sure. What the heck is that? You turned on a compressor? Was that a compressor? I don't know. No. But you know what? This doesn't finish our trip though, because we whole have a whole North American part of this trip where Lefty. First time driving in America, and you as my guide. Oh my gosh! And what was that? Oh, when we drove back? No, when we went to uh, when we went. Remember after this, we went to Fallbrook. We flew up to Miami, huh? Yeah. Then we went to Fallbrook. Then what? But we had to drive to Fallbrook from Miami, and I had never driven in oh. America before. Oh, okay. And you was my my guide. Going and driving in America, and you as as useful as tits in a bowl. But anyway, that's for next podcast. Because that was a trip that that whole road trip up and the whole fall brawl was a whole another race, a whole another thing. But that finishes off our South American tour. So yeah, the Garni flew all of it, right? Yeah, that's when we met like yeah. Mike Hill and everybody and all that stuff. Oh, okay. Well, we'll talk about that on the next podcast. But for you, which was the which was the best? part of that trip which which country did you enjoy the most um well they were all good in their like they were all good because they were all different mm -hmm. but if i had to pick one fuck, it would be so hard argentina was fun because the track was so awesome I think and they were the, the most organized too. was so good. And yeah, yeah, it was most organized and the party at night there at the track. Like it was great. And then Colombia was great because it was just different and exotic. Like we're in Jurassic Park now and everyone was just, you know, yes, racing, but <laughs> having fun, drinking beers and it was just chill. So that was awesome too. And, and what people have to realize is that each country was completely different. You know what I mean? Like the, the, the terrain, like Bolivia was weird, super weird, like up in those mountains, you know, dry yeah. desert. And you know what? When I was in Bolivia, it reminded me of being out west. When we was traveling through Bolivia, like, but not the altitude, but the, the, the terrain was like driving through America, the American West, like what we do on the 40, almost. And yeah. then Peru was desert, like it was desert, but that big dune, but we was in a desert town. Then off to Chile, Chile, which was all city. But we went through, it was weird too, because we went through like, like, I guess I can imagine that's what the Rockies look like up in, uh, in I've never been through the Rockies, coming when we went to get there. Um, Argentina was completely different altogether. Each country was so different. 
and it was an amazing experience. And you know what's unfortunate is that South America does not get the the recognition for their RC as they should. There's some good drivers down there. They they've had some good racers. Um, they have some good race. I don't know how it is now. I know things are slowed up a lot, but you know, like it's it's a good racing scene there. That's farmer. That's farmer. That's F A M A R. That's the part here that the Dominican Republic's a part of. That's the other association that nobody really hears about. And it's such a shame because them guys are down there racing. It's expensive for them, super expensive for them. And there's a lot of history there. So I don't know. Hopefully we get back down there someday. And hopefully more, more people learn about it. We, I think we help that too. I think we help put more of a spotlight on South American racing from our trip there. I'm sure we did. I'm positive we did. Yeah, maybe. Sweet. All right, Joseph. Well, we've been talking for about an hour and tw- 20 minutes. Um, honestly, I just want to say something before I go. When we sign off. Honestly, I think that's been the best best part of, of working. When I met you, this is, this is going to sound like, being as we're talking, it's your birthday and all that stuff. And we're almost up to three years now that I, I, we, I started working for you. You realize that. It's May. It's the first of May. So in June, it's going to mark three years that I've worked for JQ Racing. It's been an awesome ride. Um, I never thought that me meeting you in Dominican Republic, here in Dominican Republic, and just asking you for a job would lead to what we're doing right now. You know, it's led to, um, and this is for people, like we always say, like you always say, well, Keenan took opportunity and he did this, but you know, you gave me the opportunity to to do something. Like, and this is like, I'm just gonna, like, you don't get enough credit. I always give you a lot of shit, right? But I have to give you shit because it's the way I keep, you give me shit, so I have to give you shit. But <laughs> I'm gonna just gonna say a few things and people are gonna probably say, I'm, oh, I'm hanging off your nuts or whatever. But, you gave me an opportunity. Let's be realistic. Where nobody in their right mind would have said yes. You know what I mean? Let's let's be true. Yeah, hey, I can give you a job, but I don't think I could get you can get paid. And dealing with you is fucking. I remember first dealing with you. I was like, awesome. No, it's not. I remember dealing with you, and I was like, oh wow, this guy is hard to deal with. Like, what do I do? I remember. Oh, give me an Excel list and start from there. And I was like, I don't know what to do. But you know, when you put your mind to something. And if you want to do it, you'll do it. And there's been, I remember when I first started with you, I was going to work in Bermuda. I had a job lined up at the, at the hospital, paying good money, probably would have made about $25, $26 an hour, lots of overtime. You know, they're calling me. And this is, you know, I was like, man, what do I do? Do I, do I follow my dream here and stay with my family? Or do I go back home and be normal? I remember I was talking to my mom. She's like, well, you know, I want you around your family. If this doesn't work out, you can always come back to Bermuda. And I remember all the criticism I got from people in Bermuda, just people I know, you know, even criticisms towards you. Oh, be careful with Joseph and blah, blah, blah. Nah, 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 nah. And go come home and get a real job and do this. Blah, you're not going to do anything. And you know what? Three years on, I'm st- it's been such a great ride. Like se- six months into it, We've been on a South America tour. We've driven across America. We've I've been to, to three DNCs, RCGP, Silver State. Well, that wasn't really you. PMB. I've met people from around the world. Like I wake up and I talk to people from around the world, di- mostly daily. Made friends everywhere. You know, that's what I love about RCs, the socializing part. You know, if it wasn't for you after DNC, I wouldn't have saw my father after 21 years, which I'm glad I did get to do. Because you brought me to DNC and we hung out there and we got this crazy cockamamie idea. Oh, let Keenan drive a van across America. And he's only driven in America two times. And, you know, <laughs> I got to stay in, and, and go up to see my father and before he passed and all that stuff. And all that, like, nobody in their right mind would have done that. You have to admit that. Nobody in their right mind would have taken your opportunity and been like, all right, let's do it. So I appreciate the opportunity. It's your birthday. So my thanks is to thank you for the opportunity for for putting me in the RC industry. It's not been easy. It's not been easy at all. And dealing with you is a fuck is really is a pain in the ass. Likewise, no one in their right mind would have given you the opportunity. No, they wouldn't have. Some idiot from Dominican Republic from Bermuda. <laughs> exactly. You know? 
who said and drinks beers while driving down the road i mean this is a really responsible guy too oh well, it's Entrust life her with. life her so you know um <laughs> well just think about it like just if you look back on three we do a three-year recap her but uh, i really i really appreciate the opportunity and people who think that things just come easy to them and rc and all that type of stuff man people work people not just me but everybody lots of people work their asses off in this industry man and when you see somebody that's probably mildly and i'm not even successful when you see somebody that's successful just know that they put in a lot of work to get where they are because it's not easy to do things in this industry it's not easy to do things in life and it's not easy to chase the dream and yet still chasing the dream and we're all chasing this dream but it's not easy to do things man so people who think oh you just get it made you do this and this this like anything else, this is a lot of work, man. A lot of work, and you got to be willing to take chances, and you got to be willing to sacrifice. Like, yeah, I could be making a lot more money not doing RC stuff, and I could be doing, and I could be drop, I could be flying to these races on my own time and just racing and having fun, and I still have fun. But I just want people to know, like, everything that happens that we've done, that I would say that we've done, and I've been able to do. It's it's a lot of work that goes and a lot of support from people around you know around the world too. You'd be surprised how many people support uh everything that we guys are into and we do. And without them, we couldn't do it. So I want to shout out to them and say thank you, especially to the listeners of this podcast. I don't get no sentimental, but it's your birthday, and that's my happy birthday to you. So thank you for the opportunity. You are starting to be less of a jackass. And I hope that this Facebook thing doesn't I hope you don't fall back into your deep addiction, but it's a good ride. And we just got to keep it going, man. The podcast I love, you know, I'm, I'm glad you pushed me to do this as well. It's really awesome. I didn't know. I had no idea that it would, it would blossom into something that I do every week. And I've taken a whole week to do a production and, you know, getting to chit chat and have people call in, which I think is turned into one of my favorite sections is just getting to talk to people. Like it took, it took a lot of time to get where we are at. Like, on the podcast too. That's what people don't understand. First, he had to convince me to do it. Then I had to do it. Then I have, I'm still learning how to do it. I'm still learning things to this day. And yeah, it's been awesome. And then JQ racing, like people just don't know where it started with when I came in, like what it was like and all that stuff. when I started and where it is now. It's a lot of work, man. A lot of work. A lot of good people we've met along the way. Well, I really appreciate that. It's good to hear that I've had a positive impact on your life. Oh, God. Uh, but I still think you're a cunt. Uh, see, I gave you a compliment. Now your head's getting all big. And now you're going to be more of an asshole towards me. <laughs> That's how it works with you. It's like, oh, so now I show you a little, you show appreciation. Now I whip you even harder. <laughs> <laughs> oh whatever yeah all right maybe maybe i'm becoming soft in my old age i think you're just growing up a little bit man and you're realizing that i keep maybe some of the me hitting your head like honey is catch you catch more flies with honey than you do a shit i don't think that's true but you know what i mean shit attracts a lot of honey <laughs> a lot of flies too um I know. okay you catch more flies with honey than you do with vinegar so um yeah, I think, uh, I think I I can slowly see you growing up a little bit. It's it, about time. I, I don't. I'm not. Hey, hey, I'm not fully convinced yet. Still, we're still in the uh, delicate stage here. So, but hey, <laughs> you know, it's all good, man. I appreciate your time coming on the pod. I appreciate everything, man. And happy birthday to you. This podcast is dedicated to you. Um. I hope you I'm gonna save save this podcast and frame it. You know, I hope you enjoy because lots of people even sent you birthday messages. Even Tebow says, "I sent JQ a birthday message, but he never responded." So yeah, he appreciates. Oh, yeah, it. I did. I did respond. Uh, you know, people. Or maybe I hadn't at that time. I yeah. think he sent it like U.S. time. Uh, people, people, people do like you, even though you're an asshole. And I, I guess this comes down to my spiel. You know, right now the world's crazy. Everybody's. You know, people, yeah, it's just, we don't know what's going to happen in the world. The one thing we have in common, and I say this over, no matter what color you are, no matter what political background you are, 
religion, race, country. We all have that one common denominator, and that's RC, man. And I've met really good people in RC. And I've and the ability to communicate with these guys and to talk to people and to share things with people that are just as passionate about something that you are is outstanding. And that's what I like about RC more than I miss racing, but I also enjoy the socializing part more than anything. So remember everybody, we still got we're still fortunate. We're so fortunate that we have this thing to keep us together. And um we'll be racing soon, hopefully. I guess. I don't know. I'm rambling on now. Yeah, I think so. We'll be racing end of the summer. Yeah, I, I think so. I think in America they'll be racing before that, but <clears throat> I, yeah, I kind of hope the Nationals does go on. I won't be able to go, unfortunately, but I hope it does go on. So, with that said, um, yeah, I think this is kind of like not the conclusion of the podcast, but enjoy the interview with Jamie Booth. And there's no rant this week, but don't worry. You know who we need to get back and have a good old fashioned. We need to put. We need to call up Keaton. Yes, and have a good old fashioned rant. I'm gonna organize. Yeah. He's busy flying all over between. I think is in Alaska. It's between Alaska and her and everywhere. So who knows where he is right now? Keaton's the type of guy. I'd be three thousand degrees below zero, and he's out there in shorts. So. I guess he has elephantitis. Oh, shut up. Shut up. Whatever he has. I don't know. You miss Keaton. I'm going to get him one so we can have a good old fashioned rant. All right, guys. Enjoy the uh, talk with Jamie Booth and enjoy the okay. call ins. Thank you to everybody. And um, Joseph, thanks for your time. Enjoy your birthday weekend and go do something. I don't know. Something. Have fun. Do something. Sure. All right. The No Name RC Podcast is brought to you by BK Servos. These servos have awesome performance for a great value. High performance servos, especially models like the DS7002 HV, super fast and precise, a cost a fraction of comparable super high end servos. The DSSHT model has more torque than anything out there. And again, for an excellent price. Burt Camera, BK Servos. If you're interested in some BK Servos, you can go to www.bkhobbies.com. Use the code, the no name, and get 15% off your purchase. Thank you, BK Servos, for your support, and please show them some love. For the No Name RC Podcast listeners, check out their servos, use the coupon code, and save some dough. So joining me this week on episode 72 is a legend. I have to say this. I didn't realize he was such a legend until I started researching him. Thank you to Scott Walker for helping me research him. His name has come up many times from very, uh, older European drivers. Mick Craddock talks highly of him. Um, uh, some other RC racers that I know from the UK talk very highly of him. So once I started researching, I didn't realize how much of an RC stud he was dating back to the 80s and up even up to the 2000s and even recently well most recently he was a uh european champion but i'd like to welcome mr jamie booth how are you jamie i'm okay thank you thanks for uh, inviting me how are you doing today i'm good it's a little bit it's warm here in the dr it's, i don't know what it is in celsius but it's hot so uh yeah just chilling having some lemonade i don't have any beer unfortunately and uh, just having a chat with you. So, I'm, you know, it's good. I'm, I'm excited to have you on, on the podcast. Thank you for coming on. Like I, I told you before, I didn't realize how much of an RC stud you was. And uh, thanks for your time, man. I appreciate it. Oh, no problem. No problem. So before we go on any further, I know a lot of my listeners are American. So let's introduce yourself. You're Jamie Booth. Uh, you've been racing for how long? I started racing in 1980. So... I've literally raced for 40 years. Uh, I started, uh, I'm 51 now, so I started racing when I was 11 years old. Um, my first car was a Tamiya Sandscorcher that uh, my parents bought me for Christmas. Mm. Um, we assembled it and raced it at the, we bought it for fun initially, but there was a local club behind a pub um, that raced on grass and a friend of a friend knew of it and we got involved and 
yeah, that's where it came from. Okay, sweet. I didn't realize uh, that uh, that 1980, that's a long time. I was two years old. Uh, did you literally start racing as soon as you got it, or did you bash it around a little bit before you got to race it? Uh, I bashed it, bashed it around. And, I mean, back then it was much more amateur than it is now. And uh, we, uh, we built the car. I played with it. You know, I was an 11-year-old kid. We played with it, and then you know we we decided to take it racing with others. Uh, it wasn't serious, like I say, as it is now, but uh, it was good fun racing against other people, and um, you know, learning about the cars. We had you know dry cell receiver packs and uh, mechanical three speed speed controllers, so it was fairly basic, yeah. but still good fun. So good fun. What? So when did things start getting a little bit more serious? Um, I started. Uh, we got pally with uh, friendly with uh, with some local drivers, and uh, some of them were traveling to different races around the country. And uh, they invited me and my dad to to go with them, and we decided, yeah, we we'd go. So we started to travel you know, maybe one or two hours maximum uh, just to, I mean, the, back then there was still big entry, you know, mm-hmm. big for the UK. There was, they were still getting a hundred plus entries. Uh, and we traveled to a track at um, Northampton and Wolverhampton and some others. Was these um, the grass tracks back, then, back in the day? Yeah. Back then there were a lot of tracks were behind pubs. So, you know, not bars, but pubs, mm-hmm. you know, like a place where you go for a drink. It's different to like a bar yes. uh, uh, for our American friends. It's it's more a place where, you know, people go to talk, have a beer. But um, a lot a lot of pubs back then and still do have a beer garden where, with some grass. And uh, back in the old days, you know, we used to build a track on the beer garden and uh, people parked in the pub car park and we had a race meeting and that's how it went. Really? That's interesting. Interesting. And this was all 10 scale back in the day, right? Correct? Yeah. uh, There was a 12 scale club in my town, uh, which is Chesterfield in Derbyshire. Um, But uh, 10th off road, particularly the Tamiers, uh, at the time, it was when I started, it was just Tamiers. So Rough Rider, Sand Scorcher, and then a bit later, you had the Kyosho, Scorpion, Beetle, and the bowling digger um and that but when i started it was just tamias uh, and you got the two different classes uh 540 class with the rough rider and sand scorcher and um ford ranger um and the 380 class you had the holiday buggy and the sand rover which was like a doom buggy you know like mm-hmm. a, like the vw beetle when they take the body off and put put like a doom buggy body on it or something. Um, and that was it. Yeah. And we, uh, much fun was had. When did you start getting, uh, traveling a bit while well, you're traveling? You're still kind of local two two hours away. When did, uh, you I graduate? I well, the RC 10 came out eventually. Everybody seems to have go to the RC 10 eventually. Cause that was yeah, the first real yeah. race car. But when did you say, okay, this is getting a little bit more serious and you started traveling all about the UK, probably getting faster? Uh, who were some of the fast guys back then as well? Because when I ask who fast guys were when guys were growing up, they always say you. So who were some of the guys that um, you looked up to back in these days? Um, you know, the, I was I was always impressed with the local hero. It was my, my friend's dad, uh, his guy called Derek Bailey. He was Tamir national champion. Um Back then, there was no, initially when we started, there was no BRCA National Championship. <clears throat> it was a Tamiya National Championship, and it was just a one-off meeting. Um, and in the, uh, we started to travel um, a bit more around the UK, I think 83. Um, I won the Tamiya, I won the Tamiya British Championships in 380 and 540 in I think it was 82 and 83, or it might have been 83, 84. Um, but then along came the, to be honest, the Kyosho Scorpion was a, you know, was a big step forward because okay. the suspension was so much better than a Rough Rider. 
Um, and uh, and then I think the RC10 came 84, 85. I can't remember exactly. Okay. Um, did you get, was you getting, was you starting to get sponsors and stuff now at this time after you won the championship or how did that work back then? Yeah. I mean, back then you only got uh, limited sponsorship um, and you only got sponsored if you were a winner or very high up. Um, so my first real sponsor was Nick Adams of a company called Demon Products. Um, and Nick used to import his own motors, uh, Yokomo based. Um, and uh, he had stock motors and modifieds and he, he sponsored me kindly. But he was also an, a distributor for Associated. So when uh, uh, when when the RC10 came out, he put my name forward to be an Associated team driver. Um, Nick Adams was big friends with Mike Reedy, um, so Nick put me forward, and Mike said yes, and then uh, yeah, I became an Associated team driver. Um, running the original six gear transmission RC10, uh, which as you say, you know, it was a step over the Scorpion and the, and the Beetle. Um, you know, it was the first real proper race car, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Um, and yeah, it was great. So was you like a full factory driver or was you just like, um, how did it work? How did that go? Like, I guess what I, I'm I leading to is like, when did you decide to make this a livelihood? So, um, well, I, I got sponsored by Associated and they gave me uh, my equipment for free. So I got my Reedy motors, batteries, car, chassis parts for free, uh, which was a big help. Mm -hmm. um, and then um, in 86, I did the European Championships in Italy. Oh, uh, the first European Championships for off-road was 1985. Okay. Uh, and it was it was in the UK at Halifax, and uh, a guy called Neil Ward won. Who incidentally never won a national; he just won the Euros. Really? But on that day in time, yeah, on that day in time, Neil was the guy that won. He drove very well, and he deserved it on that day. Uh, was this a grass track as well in 1985? Yeah, it was a grass track, and uh, yeah, and and then in '86, uh, the second Euros was in Bologna in Italy. Uh, and back then the classes were still mixed, so um, I was still running an RC10. Uh, and the I, I, I wore, uh, the first four in qualifying went straight through to the final, and then there was two semi-finals. And uh, I won my semi-final and started fifth on the grid, but I was the only two-wheel drive car in the final. Oh, so they mixed um, the four-wheel drive and two-wheel drive together. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And okay. it was a dirt track. It was slippery, but my car was very good. Um, I finished 10th because uh, in the final, you know, qualifying is different. In the final, racing against four-wheel drives on dirt. Difficult. Loose dirt. It was, it was they only had to touch my car and it, it just spun around, you know. Um, when did they switch it up and just have individual uh, four-wheel drive and two-wheel drive? Um, I can't remember if it was 87 or 88, uh, when they split the two classes and, um, I think it was, I think it might have been 88 because the Euros in, in, in 1987, the Euros was in Porchak in Austria and there was only one class and, you know, we all ran four wheel drives because there was one class, mm. um, there wasn't a two-wheel drive Euros. There was, uh, oh, in fact, um, yeah, I think the first two-wheel drive Euros was in 89. Um, but I think the BRCA in the UK, I think they split the classes, I think they split the classes in 88. Um, I can't remember, to be honest. It's 32 years ago. Yeah, but you, <laughs> you're bringing up some ago. good stuff, though. I didn't know that, so that's interesting yeah. to know. I was reading an article uh, where you, I think you finally met Mike Reedy or, and you met Jim yeah. and Jay Housley and all that. So this yeah. is when Jay was the man, obviously he's still a, Jay's a good dude. I, I, he, I had a great chat with him yeah. on this podcast. Uh, what was that for? What did they come over for? Was it like a, a world's warm up or something? We, uh, I think it was, 
it was 87 i think it was the spring of 87 and there were were we had the first uh, reader race uh, at a track called chesham in the uk okay. and uh Reedy came over with um jay and jim halsey uh and jay initially he struggled with the grass but in the end you know he was amazing and and, and he won the the event um but that's when I physically met Reedy, Jay, and Jim, um, and then subsequently we we met them at the Worlds in '87, which was uh, a completely different venue. So the, it wasn't really a Worlds warm up; it was a, you know, it was a Reedy race. Mm-hmm. Um, so they had a then, Reedy race yeah, in had... America as well as in Europe back then, or was it just a? Um, 87 i think uh, i think they did but i don't think it was international the okay. reedy race in 87 um in 87 i met mike mike reedy gene roger cliff um obviously jay and lots of other people like chris moore and um rick i think rick was there rick, rick, rick howard um and um Tony Nysinger, he was racing. Uh, uh, you know, it was a, it was a massive event because we, you know, I'd never raced against drivers from all over the world. I'd raced yeah. against Europeans, but but not the big names out the American magazines so like, you know, like Jay Cliff. I, I'd raced Jay once, but Cliff and and the other guys, and jo- obviously Joel Joel Johnson was a, uh, you know, he was the biggest name in in the 80s in rc you would have to uh, you know you could uh, i'm sure that there weren't many bigger names than joel johnson in the 80s you know yeah uh, and uh yeah and, uh, and the world was at uh romsey um oh actually no we met jay in 86 i think the reedy race was then in 87 there was a reedy race at the venue where the worlds was going to be later that year that's right um it's hard to remember it all you know it's that it's getting that yeah you've been to a lot of races dude (laughs) that's a long racing career and at the worlds you know i did i did very well at the worlds i was third in four-wheel drive and fifth in two-wheel drive and reedy spoke to me uh rory cull and uh craig i think i think craig went i can't remember the, the first no the first time I don't think Craig went, but anyway, I got invited to the reader race the following January and I went with, uh, Se- uh, oh, I think I went with Rory Cole, Cecil Schumacher and the late Phil Davis. Okay. And, and we had a month race in, in America, which was an absolute dream come true to, to be honest. I would say um, so. You was, you were saying you was down in Costa Mesa down there. Yeah. We, we, out, we were in uh, living the California life in the eighties. Yeah, Huntington Beach, you know, on the beach, uh, literally on the beach. And uh, and then after the Reedy race, we flew across to Florida and did the Florida Winter Nationals. At which track? At um, oh, Lake Park? At, yeah, Lake Park. Oh, yeah. wow. Yeah. So I've got a really cool T-shirt, uh, two really cool T-shirts, and it's uh, 1988 Lake Park, uh, a main qualifier. And it's got a, like a Optima mid on the back of it. Um, and back then, if you made the main, they gave you a special T-shirt. Really? Which, yeah. Because so. I do miss T-shirts though. We don't get them. You don't get them that much. Well, I mean, you still do, but not like they used not like they used to be. You know. Well, I've never I've never kept really much many things from RC. Okay. Uh, I'm not that nostalgic, but what I have kept, what I have kept is a lot of my T-shirts. So yeah. I've got. I've got a lot of the Reedy Race T-shirts that I went to from the eighties and nineties, um, um, and I, I got them out recently and took some photos. And I'm going to, uh, when I get a chance, I'm going to frame them and hang them up in my in my house just Good. for memory's sake. You know, uh, they were great times. Uh, you know, great adventure traveling around these places, and yeah, fantastic, great memories. Yeah, so you're like what an eighteen year old kid in America. In the eighties, exactly. RC racing. Yeah. Do you do you yeah. have a real job at this time as well, or are you just? Um, at that time, I still had a real job. Uh, I 
think, uh, yeah, I worked, when I left school, I initially worked in a foundry, um, a steel foundry, but I hated it. Um, mm. And then I went to work for Nick Adams, uh, the distributor for Associated and the guy who made his own motors and speed controllers, uh, Demon Products. Okay. Um, so, yeah, I was working for Nick at that time, so he let me have the time off to go. But mm. I wasn't a salaried driver at that time. When did that happen then? When did you say, when did you become like a pro driver and start getting the salary to race? Was it for associated or who was it for? No, I, um, I mean, you know, uh, in, I think it was late 80, in, in 88, I, 88, yeah. In 88, uh, the guys from Tamiya came over, um, to do some testing in the UK and one of the guys who was the Tamiya UK promotion manager, he was a good friend of ours and they knew of me from the world result. And they came over with some of their cars to do some testing and we met them and did a private test. Um, and not long after the test, they did uh, make me an offer to race for them. Uh, but we were honest with uh, Cecil Schumacher and um, told him about it. And Cecil said, look, I'm not getting in an auction. I'll offer you the same if you stay and race, um, you know, the Schumacher cars. Um, so it was 1988 when I first became a pro racer, if you like. I mean, we didn't earn what the guys today earn, but we earned enough to survive. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, I'm not from a rich family, so uh, or a wealthy family, so there was no chance of travelling around to all these races all over the world on off of our own um, off of our own money. We didn't have enough to do that, um, so it was you know it was a great situation. I got um, I started to work for Schumacher as well, and they paid me for racing, um, and I did lots of the European races and also you know world races. Mm -hmm. So it was, you know, it's fantastic experience, 18, 19 years old and flying from one country to another racing. It was really, really great. I would imagine so. How long did that go on for? How long did you run for Schumacher? I ran for Schumacher until uh, late 89, uh, after the Worlds in um, Australia. Uh, I finished sixth in two wheel drive, I think, and 11th in four wheel drive. And uh, Tamiya again made me an offer, a, a really good offer. And uh, again, it, it, you know, it, it wasn't, it wasn't, it didn't make you rich, but it allowed you to live and just race. Um, and so, you know, we decided to give it a go. Uh, we knew that, the, the, like I say, the Tamiya UK promotions guy, a guy called Colin Spinner. He was a good friend and he persuaded us to give it a go. And, uh, and we did. And it went, you know, we had some good times and we had some difficult times. The, what car was you racing back then? Um, to start with, it was the Egress uh, and the Astute. Yes, uh, dude, yeah, I remember that. And, and one of my, one of my f favorite memories is uh, winning a club race in Costa Mesa at uh, Radio Control Hobbies Raceway. Uh, I had a really close race with Rick Howard, uh, and I just beat him. Uh, and back then, I don't know what it, I'm sure it's the same now, but the, the, the building was full of people I'd never heard of that were really, really fast just mm -hmm. to get in the A, just to get in the A main was difficult at, at the radio controlled hobbies raceway. And so to win it with a Tamiya, it was, it was great, you know? Um, and, um, uh, yeah. Was like in, Sorry, I've lost. No, it's cool because I it's so I tell a lot of people like how do I get faster? I said, Well, you gotta go to I, I honestly believe you need to like if you're on the cusp of you think this is you're gonna this is what you're gonna do, you need to go out to California for a bit and and run with these guys. Cause okay, maybe not so much nowadays because like it seems like the Midwest of America is producing a lot of fast guys, but California yeah. still is the mecca of RC. And you guys yeah. were going out there as young guys, just club racing. <clears throat> I mean, Joseph yeah. goes out there for three to four months a year as well. I would love to go out there and just hang out for a month. So it's just, 
I can imagine what it was back then, though. And you're right. Like, that's oh, where fast yeah. dudes are. You got OCRC. Now you got OCRC. Then you got Hot Rods on Tuesday nights. And these got they race a lot, like, throughout the week and then weekends. It was and whatnot. amazing. Wow. And it was before the Reedy race that we were in 1990. And uh, it was, you know, going, going when you landed and walk, walk in that building, there's literally, and you know, there's a room full of really fast people. Um, and uh, they're all dialed into the track. And the one, you know, the some of them guys you've never heard of and never did anything else outside that building. But in that building, they were fast and <laughs> extremely difficult to be. And I remember doing a club meeting there, a different club meeting. And I think that night, everybody from, from the Reedy Race was there at that club meeting. And I'm sure that that night, the only person in the Reedy Race Invitational that made the A at the club race was Chris Moore. And Masami, even that night, Masami didn't make the A at the club race. Wow. Um, you know, that's that's how tough it was uh, at that venue. Uh, of course, once everybody got dialed in, they, they started to get better. But when you just, you know, we all flew in uh, a few days before the Reedy Race and did the club race put the cars down and the locals were just too too hot to too hot to handle to be honest yeah i could imagine wow it was a rock star lifestyle i was looking at some pictures i was teasing you about it uh you had that rock star hair back then <laughs> and i i could imagine like just how much fun you guys were having back in these days just traveling around the world racing rc cars it was a lot different back then too than it is now and, it was uh, and RC back then we even though it was becoming professional we were it was still a hobby that we did to because we enjoyed it mm -hmm. so you know we'd fly I don't know we'd go to Austria and right if you get there at five o'clock at night you know uh, unload the car or whatever or you know the rental car from the airport and then find the track right we found the track right where's the bar yeah <laughs> where are the bars where's the disco where are the ladies do rock star lifestyle dude rock star well lifestyle. i don't know about that but that's you know we the race it was a weekend away and it was uh we had a lot of fun and uh you know now a lot of the guys are extremely serious they're paid to do it i totally understand but back then it was more innocent and more you know people did it People did it to get away for the weekend and have a laugh for a few mm. beers and a, you know, a bit of different scenery. It, it wasn't as serious as it is now, but in some ways it was more fun. You know, was mm -hmm. it better? Was it worse? I'm not going to say it was better then. Uh, it was different, and we had a lot of fun. And the guys today have a lot of fun, but yeah. it was different. I think nowadays everybody takes it too serious. Some people still have go <laughs> and have fun. But a lot of everybody thinks, oh, if I'm, if I'm going to win this race, I'll be a pro. Or I'll get noticed yeah. or something. And I think everybody's kind of got that in their mentality. But some races I go to nowadays, and people are just there to have a good time and enjoy and racing yeah. as well. So I, I, I enjoy that part of it, socializing part. Socializing. Well, I've been doing a little bit of that late, lately because uh, the last two years I've done something called uh, Vintage Euro Masters in Holland. Mm -hmm. Um and I've just gone with my local friends, and uh, this year there were 16 of us went. Um, well, you can imagine, you know, mm -hmm. 16 old racers uh, racing vintage cars. I raced a B3 in two-wheel drive and a Tamiya Supershot in four-wheel drive. Really? Um, but, you know, get back from the track, right? Bags down, food, beer, you know, just just like the old days, yeah. have a, just go and have a, just go and have a, some fun, I just know. a holiday weekend away. It's not, you know, it's not mega serious. It's mm -hmm. just for fun. Um, but luckily, we got there and back before the the shutdown of the coronavirus stuff. Yes, we we didn't get back until I think we got back on the third of March, something like that. Okay, so we got back like a week before that that all stop started. Yeah, that that stuff sucks. I'm ready to uh, get back to normal here. But yeah, we all are, aren't we? <laughs> yeah. All right. So you racing for Tamiya. When did you win your first uh, championship? What was your first championship? 
At my first championship was Tammy a British champion, and it, I think it was, I think it was eighty two. Uh, it might have been eighty three. Um, eighty one. 80, I think it was eighty three. I was Tammy a British champion in nineteen eighty three. Um, to uh, in three eighty and five forty class. Um, I did the same in eighty four. Um, I can't remember when I won the first BRCA championship, but it was. I'm pretty sure I won it in eighty five. I might have won it in eighty four. Mm-hmm. Uh, best Euro the records don't go back that far. <laughs> <laughs> What's your best Euro performance? I won the two wheel drive Euros in Sweden in nineteen eighty nine. Um, and, uh, I got lots of seconds and thirds. I I perhaps didn't win as many as I could have done, but you know, some, some people, some people, I'm not going to say look, some people, you know, some people drove well on that particular weekend and the results went against the sort of run of form, if you like. Uh, but you know, I won a European championship. I only won one. Um, that's good. Hey, there's well, people yeah, that they, there's people that don't have any. Yeah. What was the track like sure. in Sweden in 1989? Um, it was a dirt track. Uh, it was quite bumpy. Um, at a place called V8 Ring in Gothenburg, uh, and yeah, it was good. Uh, I can't remember that much. It was kind. It was kind of loose dirt. A bit, you know, it broke up. Uh, it wasn't hard packed, um, and so it it, it was. I guess the Americans call it loamy at the start mm-hmm. and uh, and then it broke up and it was difficult to drive. But yeah, the car went well. It was a Schumacher uh, Top Cat uh, and it went really well and uh, I was lucky enough to win it. So I was really pleased with that. How about in the world? What's your best performance? I finished third in the 1987 four-wheel drive Worlds. And I finished third in the one eighth off road uh, Nitro Worlds in 1996. Okay, we're going to get into Nitro because that's the glory here on this podcast. But yeah, who <clears throat> who was some of the guy? Who were some of your biggest rivals in ten scale? Because I assume you you kind of still raced um, a lot of ten scale in the 90s. Did you stick with uh, Tamiya going forward, or did you switch? Uh, over? Yeah, I switched a few times. Uh, I in nineteen I went to the I had some good, I had a good result in in nineteen ninety one I did the Reedy race in Utabi Arena and uh and I had a real really good battles with Masami and uh, he beat me by one point. I finished second there. So and there was a controversial moment as well. All the one race I was leading it and uh and they announced something. I didn't know what it was because it was in Japanese and I had a big lead and I crashed. Um and I didn't know, but it was finish your lap last, you know, I'd literally got a few seconds to go. I wouldn't even done the jump if I'd have known. So, uh, and I ended up crossing the line side by side with Sami. And, wow. uh, it recorded him winning that heat. And, uh, but the, on the video camera, it was absolute, there was nothing in it at all. Um, and he, I think he won by one point in the end, uh, and back then, who, who would have been there? I think J.D. Beck, Beckwith was there. Um, Rick Velo. Rick Velo. Uh, I'm pretty, yeah, I'm pretty sure Jay w- was Jay there, probably. Yeah, Jay was there and Jim, I think. And Reedy and Darren Westman. And uh, I can't remember the others, to be honest. But yeah, it was good. Uh, it was great. The track was amazing at Utabi when it was dirt. We all used foam tyres with water on. Really? And the grit was re- yeah, yeah. The tra- it was damp dirt, not wet, not dry, just damp. And we used foam tires. And after the race, all you did was wash them under the tap. That was it. <laughs> and uh, they got Crazy. they got dis- they got banned shortly after that. I don't know why, because you could race. Well, I do know why. Somebody wanted to make some money. But yeah. <laughs> foam tires on damp dirt—they just last forever. Really. Yeah, they last forever. We just use one set for the whole event. Yeah, nobody's making money that way. Nobody's making money that way. So mm. the, I think the manufacturers soon uh, soon decided that was a bad idea. Now you go to a race, <laughs> you need uh, five different tread patterns and five different compounds, yeah. and it's crazy. Yeah. It's insane. Yeah, it is. All right. So yeah. 
who were some of the up and coming fast guys uh, nipping at well, your heels at this time? Well, I mean the the biggest the biggest name was uh, I took uh, I took a, a young Craig Drescher to the Reedy race. Uh, his parent he was only I think he was fourteen or fifteen, and his parents trusted me to take him to the Reedy race uh, in America. Yeah, and me and, and Rory and. And obviously, Craig went on to become, you know, one of the best off-road racers that the UK had ever seen, and uh, his results were fantastic. And uh, but you know, we're all—he uh, was the standout. Um, he was very good and disciplined and worked hard. But he still, he still had fun as well. You know, mm-hmm. he, he was—he always liked to laugh. Craig, well, he still does. You know. Yeah, I got to get him on this to podcast also. to another person that everybody <laughs> speaks highly of as well so, yeah he's a good guy yeah good guy all right so 1990s was pretty much you did run you did run the eight scale in 1996 so let's talk about that so you're still a pro racer in the 90s right i, I assume i was yeah yeah i was and i uh i was running uh what was i running 92 93 i was a kyosho team driver okay. and um for Ritmax, the UK distributor, and also Kyosho in Japan. And uh, they'd also invited me to run their gas program, uh, Nitro, as we call it, gas, as it's called in America. And uh, Mick Craddock, I didn't know anything about gas engines or anything, but Mick, Mick Craddock, everybody knows, is a really nice guy. He, he helped me really a lot. And the first year I did the gas series in the UK, I... Uh, I won the championship. Um, we had twelve races back then. How uh, was it back then in the nineties? Was it was it getting good entries? Was it? Uh, oh yeah, it was good. It was good. It wasn't like the ten scale, mm-hmm. and there were no real club races for Nitro. Um, there was just the nationals. That's why there was twelve meetings. Okay. Yeah. Um, and that first year. Without Mick's help, I couldn't have done it. But I won the championship, and uh, it, it was your best nine scores out of twelve. And I, I won seven seven races that year, so it was it was good. Mm-hmm. It was a good result. But like I say, Mick helped me a lot with the engine, the clutch, and all those things. Yeah. So then, in 1996, you went to where was the Worlds to? It was in the UK at a place called Bewley, where there's a motor museum. Um, mm-hmm. And yeah, I finished to third yeah it was good and do you remember who you finished behind i finished directly behind a french guy called uh, philippe le chat yes. he was about one meter in front and about half a lap up was a guy an italian guy called alex lafranchi wow and he was uh you know it was an hour final and uh in the final it was about one minute 10 seconds a lap in the final really yeah, it was a big track. Was this an, another uh, semi-permanent track, or was it just something? It was on a grass track. Oh, yeah. It was on a grass track. One yeah. minute and ten second laps? That's yeah, cool. around that. I think it might have been one minute eight, but it was something like that. I mean, uh, Mark was there, Mark Pavidis and Cliff and Chris Moore and uh, lots of the other Americans, um, and the Japanese and... You know, it was a big, big event. Mm-hmm. Nitro was, you know, it was really taking off then. And, uh, yes, it was. Yeah. And, and you guys didn't did do... A, sorry, go ahead. Go on. No, I was going to say, I you did didn't a, do gas truck. Like, it seemed to be only an American thing. It still does. I still like gas trucks, period. It seemed to be an American thing. I did it. I did it. I did a couple of... We, did, we didn't race gas trucks, but mm-hmm. I did... Uh, I did an event at Pomona in... who now you've got me... Uh, 94 95 something like that i did a gas truck race in pomona uh and i also did a gas truck race in hemet mm-hmm. um and i also and then a year later i did a eight scale race at hemet um uh, you know the entry was crazy at hemet like i don't know i, I raced i think i raced eight scale twice at hemet um I think the first year I went, uh, Chris McElroy won with a pirate. Oh, wow. Um, off a pirate? Off a pirate, yeah. yeah. I remember and this. Everybody was there. You know, all the all the big American names were there. Yeah. Um, 
JD, uh, Brian, uh, Cliff, Jay, um, Chris Moore. Uh, you know, it was a really, it was kind of the first big meeting where it's like, wow, this is it. Mm-hmm. Eight scale is going to be big because all those big names were there. Yeah. So around this time, you kind of switched over to, well, hold on, let's retract. How did, what did you think about gas truck back then? Um, I didn't race it at home at all, so right. I'd, I'd never practiced with it. And uh, so it, it was all right. It wasn't my favorite, uh, but I didn't race it enough to, for it to become a favorite. Mm-hmm. Um, and nobody in the UK raced it, so or well, very few. Um, so, I, I mean, I, I, did, I did, do like racing eight-scale off-road. I mean, I haven't done it for a number of years, but... Yeah, that's good fun. I'd love to go to Hemet or one of those big races again in America. It'd be fantastic. Yeah, you should. Oh, you you should. I mean, the over the forty plus class over there. I know you're a forty plus European champion. We're gonna get on that, but <laughs> the forty plus class. It's so much banter and so much like between like Greg Barry Baker, Saxton, Paul Sicarello. Yeah. They just talk so much shit that the whole entire race <laughs> to each other. I like this is what it must have been like back in the two thousands. So yeah. yeah. Uh, let's let's skip ahead now. So 2000s, late 90s, 2000s, nitro gas racing's booming, starting to take off. Yeah, it's booming. Are you still running electric, or are you focusing just on nitro? Uh, for a, for a long time, I did both uh, electric and gas. Um, but in '98, I actually s- switched to touring cars, which uh, it was never something that I really enjoyed. But I. Uh, I was, you know, I was at the end, really, of my paid career, and uh, I got offered a, a really, you know, a, a good job at HPR Europe, um, and uh, they sold touring cars, and so it went with the job, really, that I, I needed to race touring cars. Personally, I never really liked touring cars, but, mm-hmm. you know, they've been good enough to give me a you know offer me a job um and you know i came out the end of my racing career with no real qualifications um and uh i'd had a good time and i needed to find some real work yeah and, uh, you know the uh, jason did and from hpi he uh he employed me at that time it was owned by philippe neidhart and tatsuro um and also, you know, and Sean was working there as well, Sean Island. Um, I've got a lot of respect for Sean. He's a really nice guy. Mm-hmm. So how long did the, the HBI uh, job last? I worked at HBI for five years. And okay. uh, to be honest, the only reason why I left was uh, the travel each day. I didn't want to move, and it was becoming almost two hours each way to and from mm-hmm. work. Uh, and going up, doing, you know, I was doing long days and then at the weekends going racing as well. I was exhausted. It was, it was too much. So I, um, a a friend of mine, he owns an electronics company in Chesterfield and he, uh, he offered me a job and, uh, the money was the same without all the traveling. So it was a no brainer really to give it a try. So you got a real, Um, like a a real, a real life job. A real life job, yeah, yeah, just as a buyer in an electronics company, electro- a contract electronics manufacturer. Um, but I was only there uh, a year, and within that year, uh, a really nice guy in Australia had uh, fixed me up with Hong No, mm-hmm. excuse me, and um, he said that if, if I raced the Hong No car, they would give me the UK distribution. And I always fancied trying something like that. And, um, and so I decided to give it, a, give it a try. And, uh, I sold my civic type R that I'd, that I'd had from new about a year and to get the money to, uh, to buy some, some Hong No cars, which were, you know, it was the jamming car known mm-hmm. as the jamming X one in the USA. Yes. Uh, it was a really good car and yes, I sold loads of them. It was a great car, and um, Jay, Jay, I was just talking with Chad about it, and when I, I met Jay, and he was cool, and I'm looking at, I'm just yeah. sh- showing off some truggy pictures. Um, yeah, he knew what he was doing, man. He marketed it great. He did a good thing at the, at the big races, and jamming in, I would say, oh, 
2005 until like yeah, 2008, big. 2010 was big, really big. Yeah, it was. Yeah, it was. Yeah, very good. So you this now you get into I so now you're fully into eight scale because you're running Hong Noor. Yeah. You got your yeah. distributed distributed distribution. Is this when you started yeah. uh, your company? Yeah, I started my company in 2005 called SMD. Uh -huh. um, and uh, yeah, I saw on your questions, it said, what's SMD stand for? Yeah. Well, it's Spire Model Distribution. And the reason for that is that the town where I'm from, it's famous for having a, the church. I'm not religious, but the church is famous for being crooked. Really? Um, yeah, if you Google Chesterfield Church or the crooked, if you just Google the crooked spire, um, they built the spire out of uh, wet timber. And then as it dried, it twisted and bent over. Um, and it's, you know, it's it's famous for tourists and visitors. And so round here, the football club's called the Spireites and the taxi company's called Spire Taxis. And I, I actually wanted to call the business Peak Distribution. But if you Googled Peak Distribution, there were so many hits on that. Whereas Spire Model Distribution, there was no, there's nothing else called that. So I thought, Whilst it doesn't have the same ring to people away from this area, it was the better choice for Google reasons, really. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, Spire. I'm going to, whoever listens to this podcast and sends me a picture of the Spire church first. Yeah. I'll find the crooked I'll, Spire. Yeah, I'll I'll give you, I'll find something to give you for, for doing yeah. it first. So shoot me a <laughs> PM. Actually, when I release this podcast, if they listen to this podcast, shoot a picture of the Spire church on yeah, the do, Facebook. Yeah. No, no, not you. Not not you, but this is for oh, anybody yeah, that listens yeah. to this. It's like a little competition. Yeah. So there's a competition. The first person to put up a picture of the Spire Church and tell me when Crooked it was built. Spire. Crooked Spire. You will the win Crooked Spire. You will win yeah. something. I don't know what I'm gonna give you, but I'll find something <laughs> to give you. So yeah, good competition. So SM uh SMD it's called uh yeah. was you nervous getting into this or very very nervous yeah, yeah sure i uh, at the time a wife that was pregnant and uh, she wasn't working and uh, i'd i sold my car where my life savings lay and and finished my job and uh, started a business uh, it was looking back uh, not really sure how i had the guts to do it but i did so did you do it at a home or did you like at a place a shop i started off at home yeah. um and then I went into a building with a shared room, uh, a room in a shared building, should I say, mm -hmm. uh, like a big old office block type place. Um, and yeah, and uh, I had some ups and downs with it. Um, it it's always done all right. It's never I've never owed anybody a penny. Um, so, um, but I, I did have some people working for me, um, but now I just work alone. And mm -hmm. to, to be honest with you, I prefer I prefer it that way. It's a it's a pain. It's a pain sometimes, but you know. It, it, what you do you do distribute now? Sometimes. What do you distribute now in uh, in the UK? Uh, I've got some products of my own. I've got a Sanwar compatible receiver, mm -hmm. um, some brushless combos. I also import and distribute Surpass motors from China and. Uh, surpass make brushless motors and uh, they're one of the manufacturers that make a lot of the big branded motors okay. um and also i'm the uk distributor for charisma scale adventure the scale crawler stuff oh really uh, do you get out and do so, any scale crawling a little bit yes yeah. um the, there's a couple of events in the uk and they're both uh within 10 miles of my house so really? Big yeah, genre so I'm quite of fortunate with that. Big genre of so, RC. Yeah, it's it's. I, 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 it was the first sort of thing that I really did. Um, I did it on market research, not with my heart. Uh, you know, I'd always been a racer. So, uh, but when I spoke to my customers, the shops are all saying, "Jamie, this scale stuff—that's what's selling." So. Um, I was fortunate to meet Ivan, the owner of Charisma. He's a really, really nice guy. Um, he's in Hong Kong, uh, but he was educated in the UK, so he speaks fantastic English. Mm -hmm. 
and I met him last May in China. He came across the border into China uh, where I was visiting. Um, and, uh, yeah, we had dinner and uh, he'd, he'd had some, some uh, you know, I'm not going to go into details, but he had some issues with his then distributor and uh, he was looking for somebody else. And, I, again, I thought, all right, I'm going to give this a go. Uh, and it's been fantastic. The product's very well liked. and um, uh-huh. Interesting. Yeah, I'm going to have to check it out, looks man. looks nice. I, yeah, I love scale yeah. stuff. In fact, after I get off with you, I'm actually going to go work on my... Mike, try and mount some tires up myself. So yeah, it's good. It's good, yeah. it's, and it's hugely popular. It is very popular, and it's it's. I think I like to compare this, and it's now going. It's tinkering. It's a it's a yeah. tinker. What used to be the racing side, which will be a lot of tinkering, has now developed into the scale side. They they like to yeah. tinker and build things themselves, and it's it's pretty cool. I think it crosses between model making and mm-hmm. and RC and. Yeah. Uh, and also what surprised me and encouraged me at the events that I went to was how many children were doing it. Yeah. You know, I got to some RC races and I look around the room and the, 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 they are the same people I knew 40 years ago. Yep. Um, you know, I'm 52 and I'm looking around the room and there's lots of people I've known for 40 years. Um, when I went to the scale event, you know, it's full of it was full of families with mm. with children, and the the dad's got a car, the mum's got a car, the two kids have got a car. You know, it's new blood for the hobby, yes. uh, and that's where it's been. It's you know, it's it's fantastic for that, and that's you know, it's great for the whole hobby, not just for scale. It's mm. great for racing too. That you know, some of them will go on to race, some of them won't, but. You know, it's it's good to see new blood in our hobby because it's a great hobby. I agree with you, dude. I I hope they can we can cross them over and introduce them, introduce them to what we do as well. But we we also have to be more approachable, I think. Yeah, and and, and just be more. I always say this: like have some pride in what we do, <clears throat> and um, show people how cool it is. Because I'm I I think it, what we do is really cool. So yeah, it is. I think I think the issue. Like my son races now, and uh, the issue is uh, going from running a car up and down the street or in the garden to then going to a race meeting. Now, now the step is huge. Whereas mm-hmm. when I started, the step was it was the same car. You know, we were running the same cars as we ran in the garden, and we raced those. You know, people, kids, kids turn up at a racetrack with a two hundred pounds, two hundred and fifty dollar complete setup. And people are driving around with several thousand pounds worth, yeah. and I, I do think that step's too big for many families because it's a big investment. It is, you know, a lot a lot of kids make you know want a bike this week, an RC car next week, a football training the week after, a video game the week after that. Mm-hmm. So they don't want to invest too. They don't mind investing a few hundred, but a few thousand it's too much for most most families. I agree with you. We need to find something entry level that's still good. That's what we was talking yeah. about, uh, I believe, last week on the call-ins. <clears throat> All right. Let's rewind back to Nitro because this is yeah. this is what I like to talk about. So 2000s, yeah. you're running, you, you're, you, you're the Hung Noor Jammin distributor. It's going well. Was it going well over there in the UK with Jammin as well? Yeah, it was going really well. Um, and, uh, yeah, it went very well for me. Yeah, the, the car was really... Um, the, the car sold really well, mm-hmm. and it was a great car. I, I really believed in the the people. Uh, David Wu, uh, the owner at the time of Hong Noor, uh, the original owner, you know, the product was indestructible. It was really good quality, although it, it got kind of a a, a typically a, a, a sort of strange Asian name, if you like. Mm-hmm. Uh, the the brand the the quality of the products was fantastic. It was. It was a really good car. Uh, I think. And I, I would think it was one of the first cars to come up with like 16 millimeter shocks as well. Yeah. And yeah. Jay was always trying good stuff. Was you was you traveling to international races at this time, going to Worlds, going to Euros and stuff like that? Um, yeah, I did. I, I went to Euros with the Hong Noor. I never did the Worlds. Um, the Worlds, uh, I forget where the Worlds was. I think there was one in... Indonesia, I think, yeah, because mm-hmm. John Hazelwood went there and he made the A. And uh, I didn't 
do a Worlds with uh, with Ong? No, no. I just did the, um, but I did a few Euros with it. Mm-hmm. Um, I didn't do anything spectacular. I made a couple of quarterfinals or something. Um, but the car was excellent, you know, at club level. The club guys loved it because it was sensible price, good performance, and it was in- indestructible. So the club guys, where it matters, they loved it. Who was uh, some of the top guys in eight scale at this time, in this era? What, in the... And which, which, which in like which the Hong Nor time? era in, in the UK, in the Hong Nor era, uh, era in UK, um, um, David Crompton was mm-hmm. the UK national champion like eight or nine times with the Chrono, uh, the Italian car, which his father imported. And uh, you know, David was always a force to be reckoned with, a really fast, consistent driver. Um, mm-hmm. and he was difficult to be, you know. Does he still race now? Or? No, he's quit now. Um, he does a little bit of mechanic in for uh, for a friend called John Holmes, uh, not the adult star. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you you say well, Hazelwood, right? Um, yeah. And I've been trying to get him on this podcast. I think I heard he's he was really good too, um, but every time I look at Hazelwood and he's got those glasses on, I think. 1980s porn director for some reason <laughs> I, I just just the way the hairstyle and the glasses i just like i told billy tylaska that i was like man do you remind yeah. me of the 1980s uh porn director but speaking of hazelwood you guys used to race with each other a, a, quite a bit we're really pop, good friends yeah and hang out as friends and uh yeah we always the problem with me and john is we don't see each other often so when we do see each other it gets a bit messy you know um <laughs> we tend to we tend to go a little bit mad and drink too much and um yeah yeah nothing <laughs> wrong have that. a good time what's your favorite <laughs> what's your favorite alcoholic beverage um i normally drink beer but mm-hmm. uh i never i like one cocktail a long island iced tea i yeah. like that uh um, what's your favorite beer i drink um I like the Italian beers. I like Moretti and uh, Peroni. Yeah, Peroni's good. I like that. I got into two, that. Two great beers. Yeah, two great beers. Uh, I like Asahi as well. That's a great beer. Yeah, Joseph always praises that. I haven't had it yet, so I got to yeah. try. Yeah. So John Hazelwood was also good in this time that we're talking about as well. He yeah, he, he was very good. Yeah, yeah he was uh, you know a national champion and uh, you know Euro, Euros a final contender stroke winner. You know very very fast driver. Did you uh, get to meet any of the American top drivers like Greg Degani? Uh, yeah, Jeremy I know Greg. And these guys. I know I know Greg and I know Jeremy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I uh, I've met. Uh, I saw Greg at uh, the re- um, DXR Neo race in the UK, and I've known Jeremy since he was, I don't know, maybe 14, 15, yeah. um, when he was racing under Losey's wing. with a, He raced the Losey two-wheel drive, and I think the Yokomo four-wheel drive, before the Losey guys brought their own four-wheel drive out. You know, everybody keeps saying that Quartz is probably one of the most naturally talented drivers out there. That's, oh, definitely. Yeah. Matt, so I was just, I talked to him this morning. I'm trying to get some t-shirts made for my uh, patrons. And I was like, man, you still not going to come on the podcast? He's like, I'll check into the t-shirts. But uh, <laughs> yeah. I, just, yeah, he's a, he was quick even in, uh, you know, I went to the Worlds, not to race, but in 2014 in mm-hmm. in Sicily. And uh he was running the Agama car, and uh, I went with John. We drove to Sicily. I mean, it's a bit of a drive from the UK. Yeah, a ferry, a ferry across to France. Drive through France. Drive all the way through Italy, and then off the toe of Italy, get a ferry again onto Sicily. I would do um, it. it. We had good fun. We uh, we stopped off at the Ferrari museum on the way, and I uh, I rented a Ferrari for half an hour, a, a four five eight. Um, it was about 350 euros for 30 minutes, but I'd always wanted to drive one. So there you so go. I'm, I'm only here once. Let's have a go. There you go. But, but yeah, we spent time with Jeremy and he was, I mean, he was quick at that race as well. Yeah. And, uh, you know, he, he's definitely a naturally talented fast racer. Yeah, sure. Good stuff. Um, did you ever get to any of the bigger, you said you got to Hemet, but 
I guess you went to D- did you go to DNC and all that? Did you get to any of those? No, of I've never been. They're, they're all after my time. Okay. Hemet was in my time. You know, the Hemet was the big race uh, in America and uh, for Nitro and uh, you know, drop by Steve's Burger and um, on the corner there and get get one of them King Kong Super Burgers. <laughs> you know. You can't go buy stuff like that in the UK. You know, great big burger about 10-inch diameter or something. <laughs> <laughs> but you did have... You, You've got to try it. You've yeah. got to try it while so you I, I'm guessing that might have been DNC then. What Do you remember what year this was? Mm, 95, 96, no, something DNC like that. DNC started in 1999. Yeah. yeah. All right. Oh, cool. So, yeah, it was good. But you did do well at the 40, 2010. You are a 2010 40 plus champion and you yeah, qualified I mean, that, 95th. Let's talk about that. Where was this race and why was you way back in 95th? Um, I was running the LRP car, which was the SH car. Oh, and, yes, uh, yes, yes. It was at altitude and I don't know. I just never got it. was just one of those meetings. Nothing ever clicked. Where was the Everything race? Everything I did, it was, it, it, was, uh, it was in Portugal. Oh, where the 2018 Euros were, I believe? Um, no, it was at a different place, I think. Okay. Uh, it was, mm, I can't remember the name, but it was the highest town in Portugal. So it, the air was quite, I remember breathing was, you know, mm-hmm. more difficult than normal. Yes. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it was back then the 40 plus championship wasn't as big as it is now because it, it had was 95 just 95 entries, so it had to be pretty. Big. No, 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 no. It was the Euros. Oh. And then it was the full Euros, and then they pulled the over 40s out of the overall list. Okay, 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 I got you. So it, was the, it, it wasn't a separate event mm. like it is now. So it was a, you know, it was a, cons- a little consolation prize for a, basically a shit weekend. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> it, it, wasn't, it wasn't as big as it is now. Yeah, they're talking about having a, a 40 plus world. Yeah, they've done that in the um, 10th off road, 40, 40 plus worlds. They had it in Finland, I think. Um, but, I, you know, I, d- I don't really want to travel that far these days. Uh, I'm racing for fun. I don't want to be at the track at 7 a.m. and working on shocks and diffs and stuff like that. I don't, if my son gets good and he wants to go somewhere, I'll take him. But, I'm not doing it for myself anymore. Yeah, good stuff. Well, it sounds like you had some good memories from Nitro. Uh, uh, yeah, definitely. Definitely. definitely the, I call that the attitude era of RC. That's like when yeah. a lot of things like people were getting in fights and, you know, when you listen to these guys and just, just it was different, but I, I really like it. It's my era of RC. I, I really enjoy it. Yeah. So we're going to move on now to present time. Uh, do you have a yeah. protege? You have a son. So is he, I guess he's your protege. Yeah, I mean, he's uh, he, he's been racing now for um, two years. Two years, is it? Two, just over two years. Mm-hmm. And uh, he, he's got a um, two-wheel drive associated B6. And uh, we uh, we race locally on a Friday night with Tamiya M07s, the front-wheel drive cars. On road. Um, yeah, yeah. And it's, it's, a really, it's a really small haul. And... Uh, it's a load of old friends and uh, there's no lap counting, uh, just an egg timer for five minutes. And uh, we basically smash into each other for the whole five minutes. Um, it's a lot of fun. Uh, it's three pounds to race, about $4. Um, free drinks, free biscuits, <laughs> stuff like that. Um, and then my son, he likes to, you know, I take him to some club races on a Sunday when, you know, when we haven't got this damn virus. Mm-hmm. Um, and he loves to race his B6. So I've got one too, but I haven't raced it. How old much. is he? Uh, he's 15. Okay. He was 15 yesterday. Do you, would you, if he had thought about doing this a little bit more serious, would you encourage him to do it? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. I, did, I wanted him to enjoy it. Um is uh george my son is autistic and uh he's goes to regular school but he struggles with his concentration and Mm -hmm. um the rc cars are really good have been really good for his concentration um and he's been getting you know know, we all we all know how difficult difficult it is to drive an rc car for five minutes without crushing it 
Yeah, very you much know, so. You it, know, it looks a lot easier than it really is. Um, and uh, he really enjoys it, and it's good for him. And uh, we did plan this year to go to some regional races with some other friends, it, just as I did when I was younger too. Um, but obviously now we can't go anywhere because of what's happened. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it sucks. It sucks balls. What is yeah. your favorite class of all time to race? <sighs> I think my favourite class, it, I've, I, I, I do enjoy off-road. I think nitro off-road is great. It's fantastic. Mm-hmm. I just don't, it's just, I just wish somebody else would work on it for me. <laughs> <laughs> somebody else could clean it. But we do, you know, at a lower level, me and a load of all, other guys who've been racing a long time, like I say, we have a lot of fun with the minis on a Friday night. Mm-hmm. That's good for what it is, but I think... If the cars were lined up and I could race whatever, I think I'd race one eighth off road nitro. Yeah, good, great answer, great answer. Uh, speaking of that, who who impresses you now in the UK in uh, in eight scale? We we know Elliot Boots. Uh, I mean, is I know like, Elliot uh, very number well. one, I've but known Elliot since he was a kid. Yeah, and, uh, he's incredibly talented. Um, he can do things with the car. Other people that can't even dream of doing. Uh, he's fantastic to watch and. Uh, yeah, he's and and I think I don't think we've seen the best of him because mm-hmm. he's 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 a he's a you know he drives flat out all the time and I think when he winds it back uh, a little bit I think maybe he'll win even more. Yeah, he did well at Silver State. I remember when he was walking up to what, what the rostrum. I says, "Hey, I had a few beers in me, so I was just walking up there myself just to watch." Yeah. I said, "Hey, do it for the Queen," and he went out there and he kicked ass, man. And I was, I was happy. He's a for great him. kid as well. Yeah. He's a really nice. He's a really nice lad, and I know him and his dad really well. Um, like I say, I've known Elliot and his dad since his dad used to race before Elliot did, <laughs> um, and I've known him since back then. And yeah, I mean, he's incredibly talented and he's a likable lad, you know. And you know what's fantastic? Pr- you know what's pretty amazing for eight scale? I would say eight scale is pretty popular in, in the UK. There's only been two yeah. ever European champions, and there hasn't been a world champion in it yet. So Bloomfield yeah, and, and, yeah. and Boots. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, I mean, uh, originally in the early days, one of the issues was that we used to race on grass and then go to Europe and race on dirt. So the guys were not, weren't used to which tyres, suspension setup, diffs, and so on. Uh and then since we moved on to dirt, that's when we got our first European champion, uh, you know, Darren Bloomfield, and then Elliot's won it a couple of times as well. Yeah. Good stuff. As one of the most naturally talented racers that has ever been, who uh, who do you think is the most, who impresses you the most right now who is really good? Who impresses you? What, in any class? Or yeah, in any scale? class. Um, you can break it I down to 10 scale and 8 if you want I mean in 10 scale I've got to go for you know Neil Craig our, our guy um, mm-hmm. he's just a machine he just keeps winning and winning and winning he's getting older and older and okay he's still, he's still just a pup but he's you know a real quality driver and uh, he just keeps winning championships and his performances are fantastic uh, in 8 scale you know, it's great to watch people like Elliot or uh, Elliot or, or like Ryan Mayfield when they drive. It's amazing mm. to watch. Uh, but then, but then also, you know, you, when you watch Tebow, that's an exercise in smoothness. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, he kind of drives like Rick Howard used to drive. You know, uh, looks like the car's not moving. So, yeah, I don't know who to pick really. I'll, I'll go for. Uh, seems I'm British and I'm patriotic i'll go for neil and elliot and neil's no slouch in eight scale either <laughs> no he isn't no he doesn't race it that much and you know he lives he lives quite away from the biggest venue in the uk so he's about three or four hours drive away from where the biggest track you know where the most um, popular track is yeah so he doesn't get chance to practice as much as some of the others and he has so. a real job too that's what people don't and he has a real yeah. job and he has a real job yeah yeah how do you feel about multi-discipline dominant drivers? We're not having, we don't have as many as we probably used to. I mean, well, I mean, yeah, yeah. kind of. We have Mayfield and the Cavaliers, Tebow, but it doesn't seem to be yeah. a thing now. Um, yeah. Why do you think that is? Is it just? 
I think it's a lot of work, isn't yeah. it? You know, there's uh, the cars to get the cars right these days. It is a full time job, and to to have two wheel drive, four wheel drive, eight scale gas, eight scale electric, truggy, it's too much for people. Um, so I think you know people tend to concentrate on one thing these days uh, more than the other, just because. Mm-hmm. you know there isn't the time unless you've got an army of mechanics it's it's difficult to do them all yeah. obviously ryan does fantastic in all the classes that he races yeah he works um, hard, like dude. i say he's an amazing driver to watch and incredibly fast yes he is and you know you know what then i watch guys like rana falk ongaro who don't even like ongaro doesn't even run 10 scale picks up yeah. a two-wheel drive and comes second you know yeah the world it's i mean impressive. he's amazing as well let's you know you've got to take your hat off to yeah. him uh, he's a fantastic driver. And Coel- fantastic you know who talent. else is really good? Sorry, uh, Coelho. Can't leave him out, too. Oh, mm. no, you can't. No, no. I mean, it's unusual to have an on road racer that can win a, you know, a touring car racer. It's such a, a smoother discipline to mm. have somebody that can do that and then somebody that can win an, an eight scale Euros, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, yeah, a two, and a world champion uh, offer it yeah. yeah it's pretty impressive yeah no, two times yeah of course for, yeah and of course yeah 10 scale off road world champion did uh, you said so, earlier that you didn't keep any much of your trophies did you keep any of your winning cars do you have any cars from back in the 80s i've got um uh i've got a couple of uh, cars that i've kept uh Neil Neil Cragg kindly gave me a B3 uh, a number of years ago to do a race meeting and and said I could keep it and I've kept it um, because they were kind enough. Him and his dad are lovely and they were kind enough to give me a car and uh, I've kept that. And I also had a handmade Tamiya Egress prototype um, with all different suspension arms and stuff made in the Tamiya TRF factory. Um, and I kept that. It was restored by a, a guy who was big in the vintage called Dan Rowlands. Uh, unfortunately, died a few years ago now, but um, he restored it for me, and I've kept, I've kept that. Um, but none of my race winning cars. I didn't. It wasn't a thing back then, really, to keep the cars. You know, you're always selling them to mm-hmm. to fund another purchase or <clears> another <throat> plane ticket or something. Yeah, yeah, I get that. Um, just a couple more questions here. How do you feel yeah. about the current sponsorship model in RC? Well, I mean, let's be honest, it's a joke in most in most classes now. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, if you've got a pulse and a credit card, you've got a team drive. Um back in the day the top guys got sponsored and got free parts. Nowadays it's just it's just it's just contracted uh, customer really uh, people get a discount the the the, the, distri- the, the manufacturer still gets a uh, you know basically the trade price for the product and it's uh, unfortunately the problem is it cuts the shops out of the loop um, and in England certainly the shops used to always be involved with uh, you know with promoting the hobby and creating tracks and clubs yeah. Um what do we do? So, so, sorry. Well, I don't know saying. how you can shut the door on that now, well, really. How do we get... Uh, we touched on it earlier about, like, how do we promote our... How do we promote what we do? How do we take it from... I like to say we, we treat RC like... The, I, I say we treat it like a satanic cult. But... Or, we, because, or underground dogfighting ring. We do it in obscure... And especially in America. We do it in obscure places. Yeah. We all wear black hoodies and we're all like, this, yeah. like we're doing something illegal. How do we, well, the UK is a little better than that. I mean, they did the MXGP at Milton Keynes and I mean, yeah, MKGP yeah. and all that type of stuff, which I think is good. But how do we promote this? How do we get that? Well, the, the, that, that was great, that race, that yeah. scale. We always run a great race and it's good promotion. But I think, you know, moving forward, if we could have events like that, but racers using an attainable product so mm-hmm. like uh, the last couple of years i've done a team race where arrive at the event build a tamiya car you're not allowed to use different shocks different oils different tires you can't do anything different apart from adjust the turnbuckles or ride height we all run identical cars and you know what the racing was really good uh really close um 
and the cars were with the motor were you know they were worth about 150 quid mm-hmm. um so i think you know we should try and promote a lower level of racing that's attainable mm-hmm. for for the working class families really to get the kids out there racing and uh, and enjoying it um and keep it like that i think you know don't and keep that yeah. and keep that like that don't have it modified with this that and the other have a really basic class and all support it together um just to get the kids involved again i agree with you and it's it's like yeah don't don't get it, get all crazy and make special tires and all that type of stuff keep no, it simple no, that's right yeah that's right okay um, so if everybody's the same the racing's really close anyway of course it is yeah i agree spec racing i agree with it 100 percent. yeah okay um what else do i have her best all right we're gonna end this on a good one what is your best okay. memory from racing over the years uh, that's a tough question i don't know really um uh, best memory or funniest memory um I'll tell you the funniest. Uh, at the Euros in 95 in Italy, uh, the, the TQ guy went straight into the main and then the first four in the semis and the fastest fifth from one of the semis went into the main. Well, I was fifth in my semi, so I was coming up to the finish line, which was a chicane in Spalletto, and I went absolutely flat out to throw my car at the finish line and uh, I hit the guy holding the checkered flag and um, knocked him clean over. And um, thankfully, the guy was, he, was, he wasn't he was hurt at all. It just, it just caught him off balance. But it, it was, <laughs> for the wrong reasons, it was a memorable and funny moment because this guy was rolling around in the dirt and I was running off the rostrum to go and see him, make sure he was all right. And he was at, he was laughing himself. He, oh, yeah. he wasn't hurt at all. So you know, obviously, it wouldn't have been funny if it if he was hurt. But he wasn't hurt. So then afterwards, obviously, there was much laughter, <laughs> much <laughs> laughter about that afterwards. Sweet. Uh, so yeah, it's uh, yeah a funny moment, a memorable funny moment. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Oh, I should I should say I was going to end that, but best race or track you've been to. Um. In 10 scale, I loved Utabi Arena in uh, 1991. Fantastic. Banked dirt corners. It was fabulous. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I like racing at the DXR um, Neo track in the UK. They always make a really good track. Yeah. Um, you know, I've been to many. I'd love to go on, for, just for one time, I'd like to go to that crazy, is it Kinetic Track in Indonesia? Oh, yeah, the Cinetic Track, or whatever it's called. It, <laughs> yeah, whatever it's called, with all the crazy jump, 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 jump. I'd love to go and try and have a go around there. It looks really hard, particularly now I'm 52, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I'd still like to have a go one day. Yeah, for sure. I want to, I hope... Uh, I hope you come over to America and do some racing, maybe at one of these bigger races, and and get to talk and banter with I'd all love the forty to again, plus guys. You know, just for just some good memories, you know. Yeah. Uh, I'd love to like do the Reedy race again. Yeah. Uh, obviously, I won't be an invitational, but mm-hmm. I'd love to do. I'd love to come over and do the Reedy race one more time. You know, always loved it. Every year, get excited. You know, Christmas has come in January. Start getting excited. I'm going to America. You know, California, the mecca of RC associated Losey, yes. Reedy, all those guys you know it was fantastic and uh it, you know i really enjoyed those days it was really big everybody was all the manufacturers were always at the races um gene and roger and obviously gill and gill jr and uh mike reedy um mike from twister and uh ernie and you know it was it was really big and uh it was good. I really enjoyed those times, and I'd love to. I'd love to do a reader race again, just for fun. Yeah, you should should look into it, man. I like to go to it just to watch myself. Um, yeah, so that's the, probably the one and the worlds. That's the two electric races, ten scale races. I'd like to attend one day. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, as I thought, it was going to be an awesome chat with you. Thank you for your time. Would you like to shout yeah. out or say thank you to anybody before we sign off here? 
I'd just like to thank everybody that I've met over the years. I've had some great times, some great memories. I've met some fantastic people around the world and uh, I've thoroughly enjoyed it and uh, look forward to seeing everybody safe at the other side of what we're currently going through. Yes. Well, thank you, Jamie. I appreciate it. Um, hopefully, All right. Take care, mate. Yeah, thank All you. All the best. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. Techno RC. Techno RC. Techno RC is a premium manufacturer specializing in 8th and 10th scale high performance off road RC buggies and trucks. Visit www.technorc.com for a complete catalog of their products. Techno RC. Excellence in engineering. Hashtag Techno Takeover. Yes, what's going on, everybody? Welcome to episode number 72. This is the No Name RC Podcast Hotline brought to you by Techno RC. Thank you, Techno, for sponsoring this. Uh, hope everybody's well. We're a, bit, a little bit later this week, this tonight, this week, sorry. So I want to say thank you to our guests who decided to come on. First, I want to shout out and say welcome our special guest, Mr. Jared Tebow. What's up, Jared? How are you? Thank you for coming on. I know you're a busy man. You're just cooking today. And uh, we'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, yeah. And of course, my my co-host, man. What's up? How's the beard doing, Nick? How's the beard going? Did you shave it off like I shaved mine off? Yeah, I'm not. Yeah, I'm definitely not going to make that mistake anymore. Uh, no more will I do that. Can't, no. I did shave up a little bit today. I think when I shave, it's coming back even more gray. I don't understand it. It's, I don't like it. So, so, so uh, <laughs> I know, I know. That's dealing with JQ, man. That's just giving me all these gray hairs. So. You know how that goes. So what's up, everybody? Please share this. We have 34 listeners on. Jared's one. He came on. He's going to answer questions tonight. If you guys have some uh Oh, uh, okay. So they say they can't hear the guests. Can you guys hear the guests now? If anybody out there in Facebook land can hear the guests, please let me know. Um, I think I had them muted for a second. Oh, no. Check there we one, go. Two. There we go. Hello. Guests for the song. Hello. Are we hearing the guests now? I messed up. I pressed the button I shouldn't have pressed. Can you guys hear the guests? Oh, man. First rodeo. Still no guests? Still nothing? What's going on? I usually have all of this good nope. going on. Yep. Yep. We got to yep. All right. Cool. I'm sorry about that. Hey, I got my shirt today. This supports my track shirt. I got it today. It took a while. I came in from Miami. Oh, nice. Uh, yeah. So I'm going to rock it. And yeah, it's a little snug, but it's all right. It's all right. Very good idea. And uh, thank you, Live RC, for doing it. And thank you, everybody, for tuning in. We, You know what? We actually have a call. So let's get right into that. And uh I see what they have to say. <clears throat> Hello, who am I Hello? talking with? Hey, this is uh, Joey Carlson from uh, Minnesota. What's up, man? How you doing? Pretty good, pretty good. Just uh, saw you guys were going to have a show tonight and figured I'd, I'd call. I meant to do it <clears throat> last show, but just figured I'd try it out this time and I had some questions. Sure, man. Well, there you, thank first you. For, one yeah, first, first one on. Yeah, first one on. You was Good actually work. you was actually on calling us before we even went live. So you know, you you you're on the ball, man. I appreciate your phone call. <laughs> He's on. Yeah, it. I was I was so I was so just prepared and anxious. I just was like, okay. Cool. Well, like a minute or two minutes before, I'm like already pre-typing the number in, and I'm like, okay, I'm gonna be ready to hit that that call button. <laughs> All right, so do you have a question for Jared or, or Wally? Sure, yeah. Um, I guess uh, for Jared, um, let's see. Uh, when you first started getting into the techno cars or driving them, um, even just now, uh, are you still getting used to kind of the unconventional 
designs of the Tecno cars versus the kind of standard cars that we see nowadays, like all the four wheel drives looking the same and all the geometry kind of seems similar. It seems like the Tecno cars, they work great, but they just are completely different. Did that go <coughs> out to adjust how it drove or did it, because of that, did it fit your driving style better? Um, I would say it's, it's kind of a mix a little, you know, um, kind of what you're saying, like a lot of the cars are conventional on the 10 scale side. Um, <clears throat> you know, I was coming from Kyosho where our car wasn't really like the Yokomo X-Ray, you know, associated kind of, you know, like that, those cars are all kind of similar now. Um, my Kyosho was kind right. of different. So the, the techno did drive quite a bit different. Um, you know, for me, it was just super refreshing just to have some new cars to work on, uh, especially on the 10 scale side. Um, I, I, I would say I got used to that car really quickly. Um, on the eight scale side, it was a little bit different because, you know, on the nitro, I was driving the new 2.0 platform. So that's where like all my focus was on. Um, I had to race the point for e-buggy for a while. And that car, I had a little bit of a tougher time kind of adjusting to. Same with the Truggy still, um, just with some of the some of the steering things and stuff. Um, you know, I drove the same, <clears throat> you know, pretty much the same Kyosho 8 scale for 10 years. It didn't make that many, you know, that many changes throughout that time frame. And so I didn't really drive like the, you know, if you want to call it the baseline, like, you know, the Mugen uh, associated kind of the S work style, you know, pillow ball, wife pivot, stuff like that. So, <clears throat> you know, I didn't really drive those cars. Um, I would say the eight scale car drove quite a bit different, but, uh, you know, we did a lot of testing. I, I, I think it suits me really well. Um, you know, I've learned a whole lot. We've learned a lot together as a team, but it, it, it does take time um, to learn you know, like a baseline setup and then just kind of learn the setup changes. That was probably the biggest thing is kind of, you know, especially with the techno cars, you know, they, uh, they like to do things kind of their own way. Um, they don't, they don't really want to be different just to like be different or weird. So, you know, they, uh, Danny, the engineer, he, he's really creative and he likes to think outside the box. So he, you know, he has a lot of reasonings for what he does. Um, so I'd say the biggest thing for me was just kind of being able to just take all the information in. It was like so much information, like at once, you know, talking so with like him. totally the opposite of Kyosho. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. Kyosho is like no information, especially on the eight skill side. Um, and then the, the techno is is opposite. It was just you know trying to like manage all the information. And then, um, you know, learn, learn the setup changes and kind of direction that I like to go. Um, so that, that would be the, the biggest part there. Gotcha. So it was yep. <laughs> not just because it was a new platform and a fresh start, but also because of how they run things and design their cars and how, just how they run kind of suited your style because it, it gave you more creative creativity or opened the, the window to the possibilities of of setting up your car how you want it and kind of for your style. So I guess just must be a better fit because of that. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, when, when you have just more, especially now, um, you know, our tracks are, are, you know, we, we drive on a pretty big variety, especially on the eight scale where we'll sometimes we'll have like super, super high bite and then we'll run on like pretty low bite and then we'll have really bumpy and really smooth. So, you need to have all those options. Um, so that was a big thing with Kyosho. I kind of knew like, okay, the track's going to be rough or it's going to be like this. So I, I knew like my car was going to work good there and I had to like take advantage of it. But now I feel like I'm able to have all the adjustments necessary to change my, to, to get my car to feel competitive and be up to pace on any condition. Gotcha. Cool. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. I, I don't know if I uh, had time for another question, too, or sure, sure, I go don't ahead. want to hold anybody else up. Go ahead. You were first. Um, I guess on the other side of 10 scale, uh, completely opposite with your um, AE car that you 
couple guys. I know you can't really say too much about it because you just, you know, you kind of have to have something for that class. It's not a techno car, but what do you think of the AE car and does it bring you, bring memories back of when you used to run the B4 and stuff? And does, does because you're able to kind of choose that for your two wheel, does that make you more confident in that class and make it more comfortable to drive? And you kind of, you kind of already know how that car works because it's based on the B4 in a way. Uh, I mean, I wouldn't really say that. I mean, the the cars and everything are so different now. Um, you know, right. I would say the, you know, basically why I chose that over a different car um, was just kind of my relationship with those drivers. You know, me and Spencer um, get along really well. We're good friends. Me and Dustin Evans get along really well. Um, you know, Dustin, me and him can kind of feed off changes and 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 setups and stuff we drive pretty similar uh me and spencer can't really run the same stuff at all um he kind of has a unique driving uh-oh I found... technical difficulties I can, hear you. <laughs> I can hear you i can hear you we're in the oh i hear nick i hear all of I'm you here. all right so we're good can, can we go back to the yeah, yeah. The we, answer. Or are we still on a pause? No, no. You can go to the answer. <laughs> okay. Sorry. So, Sorry about that. <clears throat> so yeah, basically. Oh no, you're fine. Yeah. So basically, it was just kind of the support. You know, me and Brent have a have a long history and stuff. So that's pretty much why. And I, you know that that car is obviously good. And um, you know, to me, it just seemed a little bit. You know, like that would be a less complicated option for me. Um, it, it worked. It worked really well. The support they gave me that first year, you know, was really good. Um, I kind of, I had support from Associated uh, last year. So then uh, this year is a little bit different, uh, you know, um, no support from Associated. Um, and then with it being an eight scale, you know, which was supposed to be an eight scale world's year, you know, my focus was mainly going to be on eight scale. Um, and then, you know, Techno, I'm not really sure if they're going to do a tool or not. So, you know, we left that option open to where i didn't have any ties with associated but uh so i'm still just driving my my b6.1 that i had last year um gotcha. so yeah yeah cool cool so you're not i guess with all this downtime then since if we get back into it it would be eight scale focused you might not think about like building a b6.2 while you're in quarantine or this all this stuff is happening or do you think you're going to run the shorter chassis six one wherever you go depending on when stuff starts um <clears throat> i don't think the chassis changed to the point two but uh on the part, a plus, plus three millimeter uh chassis on the b62 oh really? the, it's like more for carpet 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 version, honestly it's... i think advantage oh only on the carpet one yeah, so the B6.2D. I mean, well for both, but I'm, I mean, I, I think it's probably more of an advantage on carpet. But anyway. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. I might get some of the parts, you know. Um, uh, I, I don't I don't have a kid or anything like that. Um, you know, I'm not sure if I'm going to go out and buy one to build. Um, I was kind of thinking about building a carpet car. Uh, I have some plans to run some four-wheel drive on some carpet soon. Um, just to try to get some knowledge and, uh, you know, help out some of the techno drivers that are racing on carpet more. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, my plan pretty much was just to do the 10 scale Nats this year. Like that was going to be my only other 10 scale race this whole year. Um, and maybe, and, uh, and like a beach RC race, but, uh, HRC. yeah, not not sure if I'll get if I'll get a point two or not. You know, I I, pr I probably will. Cool. cool. Yep. Um, yeah. I mean, I I had one more question, but I I know there's other people on the line, and so it's totally cool if, if you guys go to the next person. But um, thank you guys for the the answers and everything, and talking to you, Jared, and um, having you guys yeah, host the the, uh, the show. Thank you for calling yeah, in, sure. dude. Appreciate your support. Yeah, thanks, Lefty. Thanks, Nick. I I guess I asked Jared all the questions, but um, thanks again, guys. <laughs> yeah, no yeah, worries. Good. <laughs> Have a good evening. Talk to you later. <laughs> all right, sounds good. See you guys. <clears throat> all right. 
Hey, so Jared, you did pretty good at DNC. Yes, Game sir. Second. What kind of clicked for you at DNC? Because qualifying, that was, that was, was that just your type of track? Like, because you're really good on these rough tracks. But that track was like. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, it was, it was, it was rough, but it was like, it was kind of at a weird stage where normally I kind of struggle mm -hmm. where it's like, it's getting rough, but it didn't have like really big holes to where you needed to like alter your lines. So I struggle with that a little. Like some people are just willing to pretend like it's not rough and just drive like really on the edge through all the bumps. Mm -hmm. um, you know, where for me, it's like I want to be able to like move around and, uh, you know, have to not drive like the regular line just through the bumps and, and actually have to move around some. But, um, you know, I, stuff's just been really clicking. You know, I learned so much last year. It was really, really crazy. And, uh, you know, I was going in confident. It's pretty wild right now where I'm, I'm feeling really confident on, on any type of track surface, you know, mm -hmm. uh, high bite, smooth, low bite, rough. Uh, I feel like I have a good base that I can put on my car for any of those tracks and, uh, feel pretty confident. So I just, you know, just, just learning the stuff. It, it takes a while to learn new cars and new people and to just get that comfort. So, uh, you know, we fought a couple things at some races last year and we ended up, you know, resolving all those issues and finding stuff out. And we're, we're just gelling together really good as a team. You know, we're having a lot of fun. I saw that at DNC. Um, you know, they've been I excited. saw that in the pits. It looked good in there. I, I don't really get into the techno pits much, but I did this time this year. And you got everybody was having yeah. fun. Yeah. Yeah, we have a really good vibe. Um, you know, all of us are friends. We're getting along good. We're working together. You know, uh, people's results are improving. And, you know, that that's always uh, it's exciting for everybody. Um you know, they, they've been excited to kind of involve my dad a little bit, which has been really cool. Um, that, you know, that helps me just with my confidence and, and, uh, um, you know, so, so that was, that was really cool to have him, you know, pitting, pitting for me the whole time and stuff. So, um, yeah, it was, it was great. You know, it's a bummer. We've all gotten shut down. It's like, I was so excited for these next couple races. And so that, that's a bummer, but uh, I I can't wait till we get back going. Sure. Let's like, hey Nick, have you put one of these new technos together yet? <laughs> I have not. Have you driven one yet? Not yet. I actually, I think, I think I actually have one to wire. I think it just actually came in, like one of the e buggies came in to be wired. Sweet. Oh, nice. Sweet. Yeah. All right, let's take a few phone calls. I got calls. three boxes. Yeah, yeah. So, you got to drive. I, the new techno really looks good. Like some really cool stuff going on there. Um, Everybody that I've talked to likes It'd it. It'd be a cool build. I, I, I bet you would be uh, pretty impressed with the build, actually. I mean, I built the the, the latest uh, Ted Scale four-wheel, and that was really good. That went together oh, really nice. nice. So, hey, cool. somebody send Nick their techno to be built so he can build one, okay? <laughs> While he builds. They, they've been selling out too fast. That's the problem. Send it right to Nick. People can't buy them right now. They're selling out too moving, fast. They're moving quick. Yep. <laughs> let's take a let's take a phone call here. All righty. What's going on, Lucas? Hey, what's going on, guys? How you doing? Not much. How are you? I'm doing fantastic. I'm sitting here working on my JQ car and practicing my skills. Well, where are you going to race it? Are you going to go to Badlands and do, turn some laps, or or, or what? No. no, I'm just gonna sit here and not do anything until they tell me it's safe to come out. Oh, you can always run it at Beach RC, can't you? Or Brent will let you run Nitro on the 10 scale track. No, 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 that thing is like a mud pit right now. Really, what? really, why is that? Yeah, yeah, yeah we've been keeping it really wet because uh, nobody's going out there, so we just keep it really, really uh, wet. Gosh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, whenever, any... um, whenever we get back to racing, it should be awesome. Yes. Do you have any questions for Jared or Wally? Uh, hmm, I don't know. How, uh, yeah, okay. Here's one. 
what have you guys learned in these past couple months of this lockdown craziness of a zombie apocalypse? I would be hopeful that most humans uh, learned something from this, whether it's good or bad. What have you guys taken from this thing so far? Go ahead, Jared. Okay, I'll go. Well, um, I would say for me, the biggest thing, it's been um, kind of like a perspective realignment for me. Um, one, I'm missing racing way more than I expected to. Um, you know, a couple of years ago, I would have thought that I would have enjoyed a pretty long break. Um, you know, last year I enjoyed my racing, but, uh, so that was kind of interesting. You know, it's, I'm really missing the racing a lot, uh, missing friends and stuff at the track and, uh, my teammates and things. So that's been an interesting perspective change of, you know, man, I really do still love my, love the racing and love my job. Um, the next one has been just, uh, we've we've had a lot of family time together and just how important that is um you know sometimes i don't slow down enough to fully listen to my kids and uh you know show interest in certain things whether it's like coloring with them or working on schoolwork or you know checking roslyn's homework things like that um you know megan will kind of do that stuff more but now that you know we're all stuck together. I mean, all me and Megan probably haven't spent this many consecutive days together ever. Um, hmm. just cause I travel so often. So, uh, you know, just, just really like appreciative for the family and, and, um, you know, like when it's a nice day, we'll go outside, we'll go on a bike ride and just, just really like appreciating a lot of things I've taken for granted. Um, you know, just, just uh, just a little stuff. I would say the biggest thing is just a perspective change. You know, what's really important sometimes, you know, I'm, I'm such a huge racing fan that, uh, you know, if I miss a Supercross or something, you know, I'm, I'm kind of upset. And it's like, man, I feel like I really missed something. And um, I used to be really bad when I, uh, I watched all types of racing, F1, NASCAR, MotoGP. Like when we had cable you know, I would record everything and like, I would get home from a race and I'd be stressed out because I had so many things I had to watch. And, uh, it's, it's been kind of interesting. Like all of that stuff is completely shut down and, you know, it hasn't affected, you know, it hasn't really affected my life at all. Um, so it's, you know, it's like, I, I can still enjoy that stuff, but it doesn't need to be like an unnecessary, um, stress or weight, you know, it's just like a pure enjoyment thing. So, um, yeah, I would say just perspective change. It's awesome, man. Great answer. Yeah. Me, I've learned that. Yeah, I, would say, oh, I would say the big, oh, good. No, mine's quick. I've learned. I would say the biggest thing is just learning. <laughs> go ahead, Wally. Go ahead, Wally. Go ahead. Sorry. What? I missed it. It's all you. My, my easiest thing that, the one thing that I've learned this spare time is I definitely miss RC. And my wife is, I don't know how she deals with two children and me at the same time, because I can't do it. So <laughs> I don't know how she does that. That's about it. <laughs> <laughs> I'd say the biggest thing that I've kind of noticed and learned was that I live my life way too quickly. Like, I just kind of rush through everything and kind of just. Stop and just kind of chill back and see all the small things and just kind of rush through everything, make sure everything gets done. And having all this time now to, to do that has been like actually really nice. So being able to stop and see all that was been, has been pretty good. Uh, going on bike rides, that walking the dog more often, stuff like that. Um, but I do, I, the other thing is I figured out that I miss RC, the racing side of it. I don't necessarily admit, like, could I? I mean, I have I have some cars that I can go mess around with in the front yard if I wanted to, but I did that for like the first couple, like maybe the first couple of days, and I kind of got bored with it like really quick. Um, 
but it's like having the goal when you're racing like to go faster and push yourself and stuff like that that's what keeps me in the rc thing and that's what i miss the most and socializing if there's goals. Awesome. i miss socializing with, uh, yeah and exactly like with, uh, yeah. with the people from rc socializing and actually actually being with the people you want to hang out with not just talking to to him over a phone or <clears throat> a oh. text message or something. You know what else I miss? Miss my favorite brisket and hot wings from my barbecue joint on her. So I wish they would open back. <laughs> <laughs> and go into the actually, beach. That, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, miss, I miss going out to dinner. Like that was one of the things I used to do. I know. <laughs> and not being able to do that's kind of like cause I like to like sit down with my friends, talk about how our week was going, and. Just kind of catch up with everybody at least once a week, but now it's like, eh, can't really do that. So, how about you, Lucas? It's awesome. Uh, I miss going to the um, strip club. I don't blame you there. I would if I lived in America and I had strip clubs, I'd probably <laughs> miss that too. So. <laughs> I went to a few in Myrtle Beach when I was there. Uh, yeah. Dang it. I feel sorry for those ladies. <laughs> they got to make money, too. <laughs> hey, I mean, Lucas. are they getting paid right now? No, they aren't. You know? They aren't. They aren't getting no, yeah. no, 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 no dances and strip clubs with COVID going around. Hey, tell Brent I said what's up. I see he's going all deep in eye racing. Um, he's going all deep. Got three monitors and all that stuff. And uh, hey, keep up the good work there at Beach RC. And thank you for all the hard work that you guys put in. And I hope to see you guys soon, man. Thank you, Keenan. Appreciate it. All right. Take it easy, Lucas. Have a good evening. Talk to you later. Bye-bye. See you, buddy. All right. Yeah, I definitely, um, I'm definitely missing the beach. And I, I was kind of thinking like you as well, Jared, like I wanted, I wanted a break from RC, but you've been doing it a lot longer. But I am ready to get to a race and get away from my family for a little bit. I'll be honest with you. My kids are driving me crazy. <laughs> wow. All right. Let's talk to... Uh, I made the mistake of going to the beach on Saturday. Oh, you guys can go to the I beach? I saw some pictures from uh, Newport <laughs> on Saturday. It was insane. Yeah, was I was down in Huntington, and Huntington was, like, super loaded. Yeah. But... Yeah, I probably won't be doing that again. <laughs> All right. Because I've been like riding, like I've been riding my bike down by the beach and it's been kind of like low key. Everyone just keeps moving. But that day it was like it was first day of summer, like normally. Yeah. Crazy. All right. <clears throat> let's go. We got a call from Canada. What's going on, Mr. Ross? How you doing? Hello? Fantastic, man. How you been? I am good, man. Thank you for calling in, and thank you for the help that you offered this afternoon. I appreciate it. I couldn't get it to work, but, uh, yeah. Hey. No hey, no problem, man. After uh, the show or tomorrow or whatever, uh, after work, we'll definitely make sure we get uh, you all hooked up and uh, looking bomb, because we can get it a little uh, justified so it's in there perfect. Yeah, perfect. What's up, Nick and uh, Tebow? How's, How's it going? going? This is uh, Adam Ross oh, from, it's, it's from Ontario. Awesome. Ross Racing. Nice. Doing a lot yep, of- yep. Just trying to have some fun and uh, keep keep it fun with the kids. Got to do that for sure. Yeah, so, um, Nick, I, I, I'm, I'm coming for you for uh, my, my first pro install with uh, my daughter. We got the wiring, pink and purple. I remember what I talked to you about last time. Yep. So we got the ESD Teakin case painted purple pink and sparkly silver and we just swapped it over on her oh yeah on her live show and then we had uh my uh, niece help her paint the the motor so we pulled the teak and motor apart we did the can kind of a purple and the the ends in pink so we're uh we're we're rocking it girl power over here big time right now but uh we're gonna we're gonna try and do it as neat as we possibly can i got uh all the little uh doodads and clips and stuff like that so we can shorten the leads and get everything all linked up and hide all the stuff that we possibly can and uh, i'll have to show you I, i've learned a lot from you and uh keep up the good post man i love the body off stuff. So. sounds good will do and i can't wait to see your guys car come out 
it, it's going to be fun, man. The, she's been doing most of the work, but uh, once it gets to the solder point, I'll, I'll take over for that. But everything else has been just a, a, a treat working with her. It goes one six and one ten, so it definitely oh, helps nice. pass the time during these COVID That's issues. Super awesome. Yeah, but I do have a question for Jared. All righty. So first off, I just want to say thank you for sharing your story about your COVID situation with us fans. And uh, basically it was the first one that I could put a name to that I knew. So it really hit home for me and it kind of like opened my eyes to probably pay a little bit more attention. And I definitely want to make sure that you get the props that you deserve for bringing us along on that journey and kind of uh, educating us and, and getting us on board with how serious of a, a disease this actually is. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> yeah. It's, it's wild. Cause, uh, you know, social media and stuff's gone just like totally bonkers. And I'm normally not like a, uh, conspiracy type of person, but it was, it was so weird because that morning, Thursday morning, I was like, I felt totally fine. And, I was telling Megan, I had just read some crazy post or article or something. I'm like, man, I don't know. This, this might all just be a conspiracy. And she's like, don't stop reading that stuff. And, you know, don't even talk to me about any of this. <laughs> it was like, sure enough, like that day I got super sick. Then a couple of days later, you know, I was in the hospital and, uh, man, it was, it was a scary time. It was, it was really scary. Um, you know, I felt just super sick. And then once you get into the hospital, it's a whole different world in there. You know, everyone with their outfits on and, you know, no one can go in there. The nurses barely go in there and, um, you know, getting getting two tests done and stuff and uh, talking to the doctors and all the nurses. And, you know, the biggest thing is, um, you know... For me, it was whether or not, you know, political or whatever, any of that stuff, like, you know, the healthcare people are still fighting it and working and, you know, they're working so hard. It's crazy, you know, like some of the nurses, you know, they have all these masks on and stuff and, you know, they're sweating and they have that on all day and they're all working, you know, like they're only working 12 hour shifts and it's, it's just brutal in there, you know, and, uh, so, yeah, I, I wanted to share, you know, share my story. And, you know, I think there's a lot more people that have people that they know that have gone through it and things. But, you know, they're just not really sharing much information. And, um, you know, so I wanted to, you know, post what I went through. And, you know, it's it's kind of it was kind of a weird thing. I didn't you know, I didn't ever test positive. But, uh, you know, the, the doctors were kind of they were pretty protective over their words that they would say. So they didn't say, you know, we think you have it or whatever, but like my discharge papers and like the nurse, you know, um, was like, you know, you need to treat it like you did have a positive, you know, our whole family had to do the 14 day quarantine and, um, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, all the numbers, the testing and stuff that, that test is just really weird, you know, from the research that I've done and from what the nurses told me and even the doctor is your, your, uh, um, your virus count has to be like extremely high for it to actually read. So, you know, like I was healthy and so my body fought that, you know, fought whatever I had really hard. And so, you know, I think maybe that's why I didn't test positive and, you know, so who knows? I, I wanted to share, share my experience at least, uh, you know, just to, you know, f for me, I mean, we're, we're doing stuff way safer, you know, if we go anywhere, like, you know, I have a mask on, Megan has a mask on, um, you know, and, and we were playing it safe beforehand too. I really have no idea how I could have gotten it. Um, you know, we were playing it pretty safe, but, you know, I, I got gas a couple times. I went to the grocery store a couple times. So who 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 really knows? But um, yeah, it, it was it was cool. You know, I I had so much support, and I wasn't really sure if I wanted to post or not. And then it, you know, I was telling people that are kind of close to me, and then it kind of snuck out there 
on Facebook and and so I, I wanted to do a post just so people like, you know, weren't, you know, assuming things. Um and uh, you know, had had good feedback, had a couple crazy people, I had one <laughs> really? I don't know, he was from England or something, one crazy guy. Oh my gosh. <laughs> His comments were unbelievable. Dude, but it's, it's so yeah, crazy. He was saying he was it's crazy. Because my my wife yeah. my wife's it was, uh, best yeah, friend's no, it was, dad. It was, it was cool because we put it into perspective. Yeah, exactly. Go ahead. No, I was just saying my wife's best friend's dad. Uh, he passed away from it uh, about two about two and a half weeks ago, and he Ooh. tested negative the first couple of times as well. And then they gave him some miracle yeah. shot, and it just didn't work. And he, you know, it. And I even just commented on your post. I was like, dude, like I think you had it. Personally, I think you had it. So, yeah, it's crazy. But I think people should pay attention. Yeah, I mean, all, all, all the vital signs, everything that I had, you know, that's really the only thing that they can point it to. Um, you know, and, and even the nurse was saying, like, they've had people, you know, she's had patients that they tested four times and they went negative four times and the fifth time it went positive. And, you know, they wouldn't keep testing me because my symptoms were going away. But people that are in there and their symptoms keep keep growing, then they keep testing. Um, so that's kind of what they're thinking is this virus count thing or whatever. But, uh, you know, once they kind of got my fever under control with the IV, then it was like my symptoms started going down. And then, um, you know, I had to get oxygen for a few hours. But then, you know, once I kind of like recovered with the oxygen and the IV, uh, then they basically were just watching my vitals and making sure that um, that my breathing didn't get bad. And, you know, I mean, man, thank God I was healthy and my my respiratory system is good and um, I was able to fight it. And yeah, that's the thing, you know, like like Keenan just said, you know, they give them these shots and you know, tons of people were asking about this certain medicine. I can't even remember what it's called, but, uh, you know, I asked the doctors about it. Um, the quinine, something, the malaria medicine. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, they said it's super, super risky. So they, you know, they, they only give that stuff to like the really severe, uh, patients, but, you know, it runs a lot of risk of hurting other, you know, of causing lots of other issues. So it's, it's pretty wild, you know. They really don't have that much knowledge about it um, because the the cases are all so different, you know. Mm -hmm. Once they say like, yep. "Oh, you know, we think we know this," or it's only affecting these people, then bang, it's like, you know, you get someone in there that doesn't have any health issues and they're young, and so it's wild. It's just a curveball, yeah. Throw some curveball. Yep. Sweet. But no, it was yeah. super cool because I come from a small little town and we only have like 4,000 4, people. So luckily we don't have anybody really affected near us. So yeah. we just have to hear from the media and the news. So it was like, you don't know what to believe. So it was super yeah. cool that you were able to share that. And uh, I appreciate uh, you letting us in on your little journey. And I'm super happy everything worked out for you guys. But yeah, I, I do you, have man. an RC question it. for you. Hey, yes, sir. no problem, bud. It's it, it's awesome uh, watching you run and race and all that stuff. And basically, been following you since uh, the, the the Kyosho days and stuff like that. Because I I'm only been in the hobby for uh, uh, about not nine years now. Basically, I got into it because of my daughter. And cool. um, I know I know you were huge into the ten scale two wheel drive trucks. I yeah. know the the gas trucks. You had some ep epic battles, and I learned all this because of. Uh, Keenan and the No Name RC podcast and all the, the hype that he he put into the gas trucks. But do you nice. think Techno would ever come out with a two wheel drive ten scale truck? Because I know they got a killer four wheel drive one, but no, <laughs> <laughs> no, no eh? not a, not enough popularity. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, if you're just jumping into the Techno brand, they uh, <laughs> they don't like two wheel drive. Um, you know, they're I, not I, I, I a like big fan ball, yeah. of just two wheel drive in general. And, uh, you know, yeah. gas trucks cool. And, it, you know, it's a shame that it disappeared. <clears throat> and it's really cool that people, you know, build these retro builds and, you know, even some convert some new stuff into it. 
you know, I, I'd love to see it come back, but in reality, I don't really see it happening. Um, mainly for the reason it died is because the tracks started growing. Um, you know, at first yeah. the eight scales would run on like outdoor 10 scale tracks and kind of 10 scale gas truck was like even the bigger class compared to eight scale buggy. And then they kind of got even and then eight scale buggy kind of started growing. And then they made like the monster trucks, but that was smaller than both of those. And then once the eight scale truggy came out, then, um, you know, some people started racing just truggy and buggy because they're both four wheel drive and you could have like the same engine and stuff. And then even like those two kits would be similar. And then as mm -hmm. more people started racing truggies, then the tracks grew in size. And that's really what killed the gas truck is just, uh, is the so track the truck too day? big? Yeah. Um, you know, and so now like, you know, you're still going to fight that same problem is the tracks are still just mm -hmm. too big. Jumps. So, the jumps you know, there's so a couple. Big, yeah, yeah, the jumps are too <laughs> yeah, big. I've, I've, seen it. I've seen it. Yeah. Well, just the thing is, because I know for uh, outdoor, I only run eight scale. So for outdoor, it's eight scale, 100 percent. And I love four wheel drive myself. But when we go indoor, I got my kids the two wheel drive 17 five buggy so they can race in the future champs class in the powder puff. And nice. the two wheel drive has taught them so much respect for the throttle and carrying corner speed and all that good stuff that I'm happy I got the kids into the two wheel drive, but they seen the stadium trucks and, and they run 13, five, I believe at our, our, at our track, it's a RC clubhouse, a little shameless plug there, but, um, they, they love the, the stadium truck and the look and how much like faster they seem over the 17, five. But in real, in reality, it's just because they're watching the faster A main guys like Ruckus and, 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 and Chuckles and all those guys, but they just can wheel those, those stadium trucks so badass that it's cool to see. But the majority of them is either the TLR or the AE. I, I rarely see a Kyo show out there anymore. And I was just wondering if like, if it's just dying off. Yeah. I mean, stadium truck kind of, you know, comes and goes, um, you know, I, I used to love stadium truck, you know, mid motor stadium truck. Now I, I would be perfectly fine to never have to drive one ever again. <laughs> um, you know, I, I, I don't, I don't care for them one bit. Uh, so, you know, I, I used to really love stadium truck, but it's, it's different now on the high grip and with the, with the, you know, mid motor stuff mm -hmm. and the lay down and just the, the trucks drive so different. Um, yeah. Crazy. Well, I'm going to get in trouble if I don't ask this because uh, my good friend, John Blakely, owns Otterville, which is a track a couple hours away from here. And they're huge team techno maniacs. And his son, Andrew, just started running eight scale nitro. And he is wondering if she, he should just buy some parts to fix his four wheel drive short course or if they're going to ever come out with another four by four short course kit for techno. Um, I'm, I'm not too sure on that. I mean, I would, I would assume at some point they would, um, you know, make a new four drive short course. Uh, you know, they're kind of switching everything to that, you know, 2.0 platform at some point, mm -hmm. you know, um, I really have no idea on the time frame or anything like that. Um, you know, I, I don't, I, yeah, cause it, don't it's really, really popular in our area. Ever on that yeah but you know i would i would we, we I actually think still at get some free point there'd that. be a new one but oh that's cool yeah, yeah. you know i i don't have much four drive short course experience i raced it one time at the at the roar Nats last year um you know it was it was it was pretty fun but uh yeah i can't really answer that question that good i wish i wish i had more info on that you know but uh that's just not really a class no, that, no I, that I really drive. No, because Andrew's going to tune in, so I wanted to make sure that uh, nice. he heard me asking <laughs> you specifically about the 4x4 four four short course. So <laughs> there you go. I, I, I'm I'm pro sure. probably I wanted him to call to get in. some parts to fix it. Yeah, That'd I would fix be that. Yeah. option. Yeah. I would say so, because I think... Yeah, yeah it, it is pretty fun to drive, and he's been wheeling it. It's, it's a really good... Nice. It's a really good short course truck, by the way. 
things are fast. A couple of guys. Yeah, it's one of the I, best. I, I, nice. Oh, it's techno tough for sure. Sweet. Well, Adam, thank you for calling in, bud. I hope things are oh things are getting warm up there in Canada for you, so that's a good thing. And but you guys need to get the well, okay this, to start this racing. This weekend's supposed to be opening day. Really cool. No, it uh, it got canceled unfortunately. But this was the season opener this this weekend. Oh. So unfortunately, we were shut down, and hopefully, we can make the next race. But we it it's up to Doug Ford and and the Prime Minister, <laughs> and we basically have to follow whatever he says. So. We're going to keep positive and keep doing our shows and keep uh, having fun with you guys. And I appreciate what you do for the industry and uh, keep it up. And if you need those graphics, let me know and I will do my best to help you out. I appreciate all the support. uh, Jerry, thanks for sharing that again. And and no problem. And Nick, man, keep up, keep up the tips and the pictures with the bodies off, man. I love seeing your stuff. Well, dude, thank you. Nice, man. Thanks for the call. All right. Have a good evening. Hey, no problem, man. You guys have a good night. Bye-bye. All right. You do do awesome work, Nick. I'll I'll chime in on that. I do <laughs> I do like seeing your picks too. That's right. So we need that. To, thank uh, you. That yeah. black that black and Kashima car was pretty sweet. I like I like black and gold. I'm pretty pumped on that one. I think I'm gonna I'm gonna have to go against Brent on that one and actually just do one for myself. <laughs> sweet. Yeah, and I got looked, that one. It looks really last cool. Couple, I was like, this car is so cool. I didn't want to give it. Up. I don't want to give it to the guy <laughs> that bought it. <laughs> yeah i get that for sure what's going on who are we talking to hello hey mr white this is chris boyder what's up chris hey did you see any gators today hello no i didn't see none today man i'm disappointed i didn't see any gators they must have just been hiding out maybe and, they got uh, covid yeah i saw snakes oh, that helps right. out a big one <laughs> yeah they're letting all the people out in Florida, so the gators are hiding again. Hey, Florstrand. I remember when I went to Flo- Florida, I thought I would see a gator, but I never saw I one. I haven't seen one yet. I'm so disappointed. I saw a gator. I saw a gator in Florida. Oh, yeah? A wild one? At the uh, 03. 30? Yeah, at the 03 at? Worlds. Um, we had an off day. We went uh, golfing, and there was a freaking gator on the golf course. <laughs> we saw it. Leon McIntosh was, like, messing with it. <laughs> Tell you, man, Floor Australia, the Australia yeah, of America. Yeah, actually handle gators pretty well. Crazy. What's up, Chris? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, was, I was not getting yeah. anywhere. Close Rattlesnake. Oh, no. <laughs> no, no, no. That's no. great. So, how you guys doing tonight? Everybody's good. I'm Kibo. I'm glad you're feeling better, man. I just wanted to say that. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. Me too. <laughs> yeah, I bet. Awesome. So I was just, uh, I had a question real quick because uh, you switched brands recently and I'm going to be changing brands here soon. So I just wondered, you know, what's the, you know, what's one thing I'm just kind of nervous about. I haven't even really given the new nitro kit that I'm switching to much wheel time. Um, I'm mainly switching just for reasons of, uh, you know, the people that I'm racing with. Um, so, you know, when you switch brands, was there anything that, you know, you had to kind of get used to, or was it just mainly just being in a new place and kind of getting your nerves together? Yeah. I mean, there's lots of different factors, um, you know, for someone kind of like in my position, it's, it's different because, um, you know, like who I travel with, who I spend my time at the track with and room with and all that, you know, that changes the engineer that I talk to changes. So, you know, there's a lot of different things like that. Um, you know, as far as just like, you know, if you take all of those factors out, just the cars, um, you know, there's learning how the, how they drive. I would say for me, the biggest thing is the first thing that I want to do is just get like my base. So just kind of, you know, just get a lot of laps on the cars and, not necessarily even with lap times of just like getting comfortable and getting, you know, the setup to kind of where I'm comfortable so I can get some sort of base to like go off of. Um, and then just learning the direction of the changes that I like, you know, what works for me, what doesn't work for me, you know, like what kind of the general direction that, 
you know, most of the team goes, you know, do I have the same feelings as them or do I have a different feeling? And if I have a different feeling, it's like, okay, well, you know, like why? And just, and just try to like sort, sort that out. And then, uh, the next big part would be, um, like the maintenance schedule. Um, you know, I drove the same cars for 10 years, so I knew, you know, I knew how many races my bearings could go. I knew how many races my arms could go. I knew, what my drivetrain looked like when it needed to get replaced, stuff like that. Um, you know, so that, that's a little bit more of a learning curve. Um, you know, just to keep your car driving consistent, you know, what stuff needs maintenance, what stuff lasts a long time, what stuff doesn't last a long time, stuff like that. Cool. So were you able to pick it up pretty quickly when you went over to the techno as far as your maintenance? Um, yeah, yeah, I was, you know, you know, to be totally honest, um, that's something that, you know, I was just a little bit worried about, you know, I drove for Kyosho for a long time and it's like, you know, Kyosho was always known for the quality. And so I just wasn't really sure what that was going to look like. Um, and I was pleasantly surprised, uh, the techno quality, you know, way, over exceeded my expectations um and you know so I, I was able to learn that learn that pretty you know pretty quick you know what stuff what stuff lasts and and uh you know get the maintenance stuff down it's you know it's still you know maintenance of my cars takes a little bit longer than it used to just because you know i, I mean i could build an mp9 with my eyes closed um so it you know it just takes a little bit takes a little bit longer but it, it I would say it takes a year. It takes a year to really learn a car. Um, you know, you you can get some things figured out, but it, it just takes time. Got to be patient and just uh, just learn. But uh, I, you know, I'm. I, I would say, cool. you know, I learned it. I learned it pretty quick. I'm pretty comfortable now. Awesome. Well, I appreciate that uh, answer. That was awesome. No problem. And Keenan, thanks for taking my call, buddy. If he's still there. He's gone. Hey, there. Keenan. No, I'm here. I'm here. I'm here. I'm wake here. up. Wake up. Wake I'm up. Here. I had the mic on mute. I was showing off my awesome. Mugen MST 10-scale uh, tr uh, truck to a guy. <clears throat> um, I'm uh, thank you for so your speaking call. Of those, uh, speaking of those alligators. What up? I just had to throw it out there. Uh, I know you guys are familiar with Mills Pond. So uh, we just had a buggy mania race there and man, staying at a, at a racetrack outdoors for three days is, is kind of tough. You know, there's no showers or anything. So in the middle of the night, I was kind of creeping over to the pond and uh, swimming out to the middle of it just to kind of get cleaned off. So I caught a little bit of you know, flack from people <laughs> and swimming with the gators uh, down in Mills Pond. What? Nice. Yeah, I would not be out there. I wouldn't be out in that. No way. The they got iguanas <laughs> down there at Mills Pond. No way. Them iguanas will bite you or something. Yeah, big ones, big ones. And hey, man, we just had one of our local racers uh, that got injured uh, today in a in a bucket truck accident. So I just wanted to throw a get well uh, out there to Brian Johnson. Okay. Right? He's a racer from Beachline Raceway. Uh, uh, and um, yeah, he got he got hurt pretty bad. So. Really. We're oh, just kind of waiting around terrible. hoping to hear some good news. Yeah, shout out to him yeah, and his family. Yeah, I think he hit some power lines or something. Ooh. For sure. I yeah. appreciate that. Wow. And a happy birthday to um, Robbie Michael, the owner of Beachline. Oh, sweet. He uh, does a lot for us here in, in Melbourne, Orlando. So, happy birthday, Robbie. Nice. Sweet. Happy birthday, Robbie. Happy birthday. It was Jake Hughes' birthday yesterday. Yeah. Come on down, Tebow. Come to Beachline. Hey. It's just JQ. Yeah, happy birthday, JQ. Yeah. He's, he's being miserable. <laughs> All right, Chris. I messaged JQ yesterday, wished him a happy birthday. Did you? He was at the track, <laughs> I think. So he appreciates it. He says he's, Really? He's yeah, he says is, he's, is he in the US or uh, is he in where's he at? In Finland. He's back in Finland, right? Yeah. yeah. Oh, he is? Yeah. He says now he's gonna make nice. uh Euro A mains now. He's not Wait until he goes to the goes forward. Ah, there you go. Yeah, I've heard that so many, I've heard that over and over. <laughs> like, you know, it just doesn't phase me anymore. So All right, Chris. 
thanks for the uh, call, dude, and uh, hey, have fun this thanks. weekend or whatever you do. And um, thanks for the support, man. I appreciate it. Okay, man. We'll talk to you later. Free Sweet. Joe Exotic. Free Take Joe easy, Exotic. Guys. <laughs> <laughs> We got a couple more calls here. Uh, so did anybody else see the? Uh, did anybody else see Colin Branch's comment? Yes, he hit a he hit a, a alligator with a he, beer bottle once. He hit a gator in the head with a beer bottle. <laughs> What's up, Big Ty? Hello. What's up? What's up? How you guys doing? How you doing, man? We good. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you fine. Okay, cool, cool. I right, I just wanted to call in, you know, say what's up, to you guys, and definitely. Hey, I'm not gonna lie, I miss my RC familia, all my family out there, miss hanging out at the track, talking a lot of mess and talking RC and just racing. Me too, yeah, man. I definitely miss that part for sure. Like, I just, just not going to the track has kind of bummed me out. I miss watching racing and talking about and it. After VRC this. is not the same. But them guys are flying. The the kids there that are racing go. are doing good. I mean, oh, definitely. I mean, I, I'm not gonna lie. I enjoy watching um, what um, Steve does on Monday. That's yeah. that, it's kind of entertaining watching them. You know, I hope the races on VRC, but it's just not the same, you know. No, I can't just have being it. at the track, hanging out, and just racing. Have Have any of Did you yeah, ever get no your VRC? VRC for me? Yeah, you never tried it. Uh, it's It's difficult. It's really hard. hard i just i just, I just don't like the food. vrc you have to you can't drive it like it's it's not realistic whatsoever at least not the off-road the off-road mm-hmm. stuff yeah i agree with Gerald. <laughs> no, I I like, it kind of feel it kind of feels like a fun game but it's not <laughs> really like a i guess i would say like more like a simulator kind of practice with it's just more more like a game yeah. i think yeah, you have to drive really like true. really, really, really aggressive. Like you can never drive like that in real life, and like stay yeah. on the track. <laughs> <laughs> hey, so Ty, I definitely just want. Hey, um, Jared, Def, what's up? I wanted to ask you, what is the first thing you want to race when things open up again? Uh, I think one day I'm gonna be. Running nitro, the next day I'm gonna be running electric. There you go. I'm I really got into electric. I see that. And then I'm about to. I was supposed to. I was supposed to race this. I was supposed to race this year. Run so running nitro um on road mm-hmm. age scale, but my car's ready and I, I just haven't been able to get to the track because this whole thing shut it down. Yeah, I know it's it sucks. I didn't even know if they're gonna have the nationals now. That's what they're talking about. So I don't know what's gonna happen. So we shall see. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I still, I'm still, I'm still going back and watching races from DNC again. So <laughs> that's how bad it is for me. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm so, live. RC hasn't posted yeah, no races that. for a while. That's cool. Check out RC Racing TV too. Um, Ty, they got some good races going on from the Euros and all that stuff as well. Yeah, but it's like I'm. I like watching races that I prepared participated in or I was mm-hmm. there just bringing back some good memories I even watched some old ones from Fear Farm so I just DNC Silver State different races like I've been to there you know those have been enjoyable so mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I watch everything hey Jared yes sir <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if I wanted to do that wall that you did for all your cards that came out nice dude that oh really thanks nice. thanks yeah, I'm pretty happy with no, it. Let me I've ask been, you a question. Uh, yeah, what's up? I was going to ask you, were the cars that are all on that wall, are those all cars that like, are significant to you? Like, where you won different races, nationals, or different things like that? Yeah, yeah. So I, I have more cars than that saved. Um, but, you know, I can only fit, like, certain amount of space. So, yeah, those are all winning cars. I have uh, my two Reedy Race winning cars. And then I have my two world championship cars, and then every other car is a uh, Roar National winning car. That's cool. That is real cool. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, Thanks, I mean, man. Uh, definitely. I was like, I've been watching your videos. I mean, definitely I'm happy to see that you're doing a lot better. 
um, with your health and everything. And hopefully everything is good with your family and everything. So, um, but thank you for sharing those videos, you know, being transparent also with your family. Even when you did the interview with your wife, that was kind of cool. So, kudos yes, to that. It's, it's, been, uh, it's been fun, you know, our uh, Tebow shows, we're calling it. It's been... <laughs> It's been really fun, actually, even just for for me and Megan. Um, you know, it's uh, it's cool. We've had a lot of support. You know, the view counts on them are it's it's pretty awesome. I don't know if you've been watching them, and um, you know, I mm-hmm. I like I like sharing my experiences and my stories and knowledge and stuff. And uh, it's it's a lot of fun. You know, it brings back memories, and um, you know, it's yeah, it, it's it's cool. I I enjoy it. Um, it's been a lot of fun. Thanks for, uh, you know, everything about my health. I'm all good. I'm all back to normal. Whole family's healthy. Uh, no one else seemed like they, they got it. You know, we, we think maybe my youngest son Nash possibly had it before me, before me, but Mm -hmm. you know, we're not sure. And, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm all better pretty much back to hundred percent now. So, um, thank you. Good to hear. Good to hear. Hey, I got to throw a question at Nick. Nick, one yeah. thing I'm going to say, your wiring, when all those pictures, man, looks like you said before. Ridiculous. Yeah. <laughs> with, the, with the cover off, those, you do incredible work. I must say Thanks, that. man. I appreciate that. Ask, for sure. Yeah. Are you coming out with any kind of line of products to, for Wally Bill? I have, have a couple of things right now. At? I have a couple of things, but right now the builds and the wiring has kind of kept me busy, so I haven't been able to really push forward with them. But yeah, there will be stuff coming in the future for sure. Would it be more so for Tim scale, or is it going to be like all across the board? I'm going to try and go across the board. Uh, um, it'll probably start with Tim scale, and then I'll we'll start bleeding in more into the eight scale side once I kind of start building it up. But uh, yeah, we definitely have. A lot on the plate. I just got to get to it and make it happen. Oh, cool. Well, Nick, can't wait to see you guys out there at the track locally soon with we start making some 10 scale and nitro again. Sounds good. Can't wait to get back too. Sweet. Yeah. Thanks for thank- Hey, Lefty, I, I'm happy that you don't have the baby face anymore. I know. It's growing back. Not fast enough. I'm, I'm so, it's so more gray now. <laughs> I don't like it, man. I, I need to get some dress for men. It's too gray. Oh. Hey Ty, thank you, thank you for the <laughs> support, man. That, I, wasn't going, I wasn't going to go there. Yeah, you can blame Joseph for that. Always. Thank you for the support, man. I appreciate it, and I look forward to seeing you. Uh, hey, you guys next well, of course. later on this year or next year, hopefully, because it ain't gonna be no silver state. Yeah, wow, yeah, crazy. <sighs> it sucks. All right, my brother. Yeah, you take so it don't easy. Don't remind me. I'm, I'm already depressed about that. <laughs> well, thank you for later. calling in, and have a good evening, dude. Tell the boys I said what's up. You too. I will. Hey, bud. Bye-bye. I must admit, Jared, I, I told you off camera, you have been killing it online. And um, uh, keep it up, man. Even when you go back to racing, if you keep it up, it's good. Um, I know you can't do it as frequently, but it would be great. No, oh, we got two more calls here. Yeah, heard. yeah. I think we're going to try to keep the Tebow show going. You know, I've been... You know, once we kind of start going, it's going to be less, but, you know, at least like once a month yeah. or, you know, um, every couple of weeks. I think even with the races, it'd be cool because then I'll have, you know, I'll have more stuff to talk about. So, Sweet. yeah, it should be good. Let's see. I know who this is. Come on. What's going on, Brentus? Finally. I know. Jesus. Hey, man. Tebow's popular. Everyone wants to talk to Tebow and Nick. Nobody wants to talk to me. That's good. What's going on? How you doing? You guys like to talk, that's for sure. It's a good, good thing it's a show. It's good. How you doing, man? Hello? I'm good. Okay. How are you guys? Doing? doing good. Doing good. Yeah, doing yeah, pretty good over here, too. For, what you guys have for dinner tonight? Fried chicken. <laughs> I uh, I cooked my dinner Facebook Live. I made a uh, curry rice, rice and some chicken and some onions and celery with some uh, diced up cucumbers on top. That sounds amazing. I must have missed that part. I I, I tuned in as you were doing the uh, 
uh, the cribs walkthrough. Mm. Oh yeah, that was the very end. Yeah, you just missed it. <laughs> I was too busy making TikTok videos with the family. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> nice. <laughs> I got a question for all you guys, even you, Lefty. All this craziness ends. What is the first thing of regular life you are going to do that you just not do right now? Like, what are you going to zip out or do instantly? Go ahead. I'll be go last. First. Go ahead. Go for it, Jed. I I don't I don't really know. Um. You know, I, I'd probably, I want to go to like, there's this coffee shop that I really like. It's called Blip Coffees. It's like a coffee shop, motorcycle shop. They've closed down. That's probably something I'm looking forward to. Um, actually, you know what? I know my answer. This, uh, it will be like a date night. Me and my wife haven't been able to have a date night at all because no one can watch our kids or anything. And, you know, we can't really go anywhere out to dinner. So I think taking the kids to the grandparents' house, going on a date, going to dinner, grabbing some coffee. That'd be the first thing that I'm looking forward to doing. Nice. What about you, Nick? Um I mean I might I might go to dirt I had go out at dirt bike tomorrow the track for the first time in a long time. They said that uh, they're opening back up. You just basically come sh- come up and run your laps and then leave. <laughs> can't have any groups but as soon as it's all over i think i just want to honestly just go to dinner with like all my friends like just sit down have a good dinner and that's kind of one of the biggest things i want to go do right now yeah it sounds nice <laughs> it's crazy the little things we take for granted you know yeah, yeah exactly yeah for well, sure i know what i'm gonna do what about i'm gonna load up my cooler with beer and rum and everything else that goes with it and um, take my wife, my son, my daughter, maybe my neighbor's daughter, maybe his cousins or his little cousins and stuff, and load them all up in my car, probably her parents. And we'll get into the beach, and we're going to, they'll probably bring food already. They'll cook food and bring it. We'll set everything up. And that beach is going to be rammed. There's going to be music blasting. People's going to be enjoying themselves. And I'm going to fly my drone out and see if I can find sharks. I'm but down. I'm nice. going to say, you got it all I really, out. I have a, the beach is literally like, I have a whole coast of beach here right close to me and I just, we just can't go to it and I miss it. I miss the salt water and I miss just sitting off and having the, the smell of the salt water come, you know, all that type of stuff. Cause I'm an island, I'm an island and I'm going to drink a lot and eat and just be merry. And maybe my <laughs> wife is going to have to drive home after that. So that's, that's my plan. And, um, Probably a good idea. Yeah, but I miss that. I really do. That's awesome. And it's something that I took for you know, being as I grew up next to around salt water all my life, I haven't been able to go for a dip in over a month, and it really I miss it. I miss it a lot. It's surprising. So that, yeah, I think so. And then hopefully, I really would like to get out to a race. Like I said, it's. it's- I mean, we take the small things for granted, you know, like when I live here in Myrtle Beach, so, you know, yeah, I can just go to the water anytime we want, you know, but you just miss those things and you think about like, man, what, what was, what would life be like if we didn't have that stuff, you know, just the simple pleasures that, uh, not even, most of them don't even cost us anything. You know, we are all involved in a pretty expensive hobby. We travel, we, we get to see a lot of cool things, but if you think about it, we're, we're really lucky to do what we do. So I, uh, I'm with you guys. I think that's those are those are really good answers because it's they're just normal people things. You know, not one of you said, "Man, I can't wait to get back to the racetrack," and that that makes me feel really good because we're humans. <laughs> we gotta do we gotta do human things too. So it's good. Hey Brent, how's I racing going? I was talking to you the other day. You're, you're going all deep. You you know you're going all deep in I racing. How's that going for you? Oh, um, let's just say I'm really tired. I don't sleep a lot anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Sound like Joe the problem is, Well, the problem is, you know, family, work, um, you know, eye racing, sleep, it, everything 
you, you try to maximize your time with, with everybody and everything you're doing to, you know, to get work, you know, to the next level or take care of what you got to do. And, you know, so when it's all said and done, um, you know, you're like, I got to cut out some time to enjoy myself or let loose from the, the, the day to day. And, um, the next thing you know, like you're, you're in like it's rabbit hole and, you know, you start at 1030 and it's 230 in the morning and you're like, Oh sh- crap, I gotta go to bed <laughs> yeah. and wake up in four or five hours. So <laughs> I, it's really fun, man. I, I really enjoy it. Um, I've always liked it. I, I had it before the mayhem. I just didn't play it as much cause I didn't have as much time. And, um, so this afforded me a little bit more time to, uh, and energy to play it, but it's, it's, in, it's enjoyable for sure. Cool. I have two questions for you, Brent. <clears throat> and these are, did you ever get any more information on that guy who stole that? What did he steal? Uh, um, out of your shop. And do you think this is the guy that stole your race cars as well? Okay. So to answer your, the first, the second question, no, I don't think this is the same guy. Okay. Um, Unfortunately, the day, um, the one camera that could have definitely probably caught the person, um, in getting fixed and it has been, it has been in uh, off for a couple months. And so it, it, I got burned on that and we'll never know because whoever did it got, did a good job of hiding it before they got out the door. So mm-hmm. those are gone and it sucks. I'm glad it was my stuff and not a customer stuff for sure. Mm-hmm. But um, the guy that stole, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you guys, Beach Nation and our Facebook following was in full effect. Within one hour of posting that on Facebook, we had the guy's name. And within 24 hours, we knew exactly where the dude was living and staying. So That's awesome. the problem is, wow. like, it, it is, it's amazing. Like we have, you know, like I said, I love our people. We have got such a really loyal and good following and, um, and everyone cares in this community. Everyone wants to help each other. And that, that is so important to be in a community that everyone is, you know, that interested in helping people. But, um, so the police that came, here's, here's the bad part of this story. And and I don't want to shed negative light on, on anybody or anything, but the police that came to do the, to do the report on Sunday. It happened on a Sunday. Um, this guy yahooed out of the shop with a Traxxas max, not an X max, but a max Mm -hmm. and a battery combo. And, uh, about, I guess what about $700 worth of stuff or whatever. And they came and did the report, but the the specific police officer that took the report was going to be off for them two days well he didn't go and put the report into the system no warrants were issued and um so we flipped the we found the guy sent the police he was in another town they went to his hotel they searched him searched his car searched everything couldn't find it and probably sold it for you know hotel money or maybe you know for other stuff whatever and um they had to let him go because there was no no warrants issued for his arrest because the, the police officer didn't put the report in or go to the judge or anything for a warrant. So, um, as of today, there is now a warrant out for his arrest and uh, people are on the lookout for him. So we know who it is. All the hobby shops in, in South Carolina, especially know who he is. And, um, he'll get caught. It's just a shame because we did great investigative work. We had so much help from Beach Nation and uh, we had him dead in the rights, man. We had him sitting there, we could have put him in, put him in jail and um, they didn't do their job properly. So he had to get away. Yeah, We're going to get him. That sucks. That sucks. But he'll get his. Yeah, that's a, that's a bummer. But um, I want to thank yeah, you, Brent. He's a white, he's a life criminal, man. Like, yeah. He, ro- he robbed another hobby shop, didn't he? Or something as well. Yeah, the first guy that messaged me on Facebook that positively ID'd him had said that uh, this same guy stole an X-Max out of the back of the truck like five weeks beforehand. So um, he's, it's not a first-time thing. Yeah, we have to be careful. We take that for granted when we go to big races, leaving our stuff alone. And I think, like, I've been to a yeah. few big races and people's yeah. cars have gone missing, you know? I remember at AMS, it happened at DNC once. It's it's it it aggravates me, man, because you know a lot of people people put time, money, and effort into these cars, and you know it just sucks. But um, hey, I want to thank you, and I'm gonna shameless plug her. 
for everything. Beach RC is a sponsor of this podcast, so I appreciate your support. Brick and Mortar Hobby Shop. Uh, you can get your No Name RC podcast gear. You can get your ultimate uh, racing engines and oils from them as well. So I appreciate all your support, Brent, man. And um, Beach Nation, man, you know, I'm all about that. Well, it's my pleasure, man. All, all of you guys are a big part of, you know, what we've got going on. And, um, you know, I appreciate all of you. I appreciate all the effort you guys put in. I mean, like, like Keenan said, Jared, you're, you're doing your online stuff, man. Your, your Facebook lives and, and stuff is awesome. Um, doing a great job. Keep it up. And I think you're right. You'll, you'll find some great content as your travels start happening. And, um, while in, in dude, your stuff's immaculate. Um, uh, it's amazing. I, I, uh, it's, if I raced more and, and, and could uh, justify putting all that kind of, I mean, dude, the blacked out, the black ops version or whatever you called that black <laughs> B6 yeah, the that other thing day, was was, like, it, it was sick, dude. Like, you, I don't oh, yeah. care what anyone says. Tell, tell whoever ordered that from you to say, look, man, I, it turned out too good. I'm, I'm making this a package. There's no way I can uh, not sell this to people. Right. But, um, <laughs> yeah. You, all you guys are doing a kick butt job. And, uh, I, uh, I, I couldn't do what I do without uh, the help of everybody. So thank you guys all as well. Cool, yeah. And thank you for everything you do as well too. Yeah, I, for sure. Happy to uh, be part of that beach nation this year. Brent. Oh yeah, man. Many years to come. Hey, before, Absolutely. I, before I get off here, because I, I got, uh, I got tick talking and eye racing <laughs> and, uh, good night kisses and all the stuff I got to do. But, uh, what's the, um, what's the over under, that Nats happens. I was just about to ask um, you that. Or, you know, or not. What's the over on it? I'm going to say no. Yeah. It's it's in Pennsylvania, yeah, no. up there northeast. That's that's an area that's really hit hard. I don't, I don't think it's going to happen, to be honest. I hope it does, but I don't think so. I don't know. 50-50? Yeah. That's yeah. being generous. Yeah. I, I don't you know. know. I know... Uh, I know Roar has emailed um, no. at least Techno, and I'm sure they've emailed all the manufacturers to kind of get their input on it, um, what their thoughts are and stuff. It's hard to really say. I think the next two weeks is going to be, you know, I know around me, uh, Kansas is opening up on Monday, and Missouri opens up on, like, May 15th. Um we're doing, you know, we're going to have certain guidelines and things, but I think, I think May is going to be really interesting as places start opening up and how people respond, um, you know, people behave themselves and wear masks and uh, be smart, you know, I, I think, I think the race yeah. could happen. Just depends. Well, you know, Maybe if Roar proposes to have the event with uh, without allowing any spectators or fans, we'll get it in. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there you go. I, I don't know, but it can happen. Bye, it's guys. outdoors, though. Well, have a good night. It might happen. It's outdoors. It's true. So, we, I, I, my question is, Jared, as a pro racer, and say this is your first race back, how do you feel going into this race if it happens? Um, yeah, I mean, I haven't been able to do like any driving at all. Um, there's not really any tracks open by me, uh, fast lane, my local track, they're getting ready to kind of start prepping it and stuff. So, uh, I'm going to start working on trying to get some practice. Um, you know, I mean, you know, if it starts looking like we're going to, race i mean i'll I'll do whatever i'll drive wherever to you know I'll, I'll be ready to go um so yeah just just depends you know how much how much you know time we have beforehand you know i i haven't been able to practice but i've kind of taken this time to you know attack some home projects that have been on the back burner for a couple of years and uh you know so i'm I, I don't like the wrenching side and I haven't really worked on anything for a while. So I'm actually like really excited to finish my, my, uh, RC area and like get to working on my cars and, and, uh, I'm, I'm going to go drive soon. So 
hopefully start driving soon. And, you know, I, I told techno they're, uh, they're totally, you know, not pushing us to go to any races. If any races open up, it's totally our call if we want to go or not. Um, and you know, I said for Nats, I'm going for sure. Uh, I probably won't fly. I'll drive. And, you know, if some races start opening up, that'll probably be my, my plan for a while to see kind of how the airport situation, it, it, you know, is, um, but I'm, I'm all for opening up. Sweet. Yeah. As far as like racing goes, I'm kind of like everyone kind of jumping back into it. I think Cooper Webb said it on one of his posts lately. It's like, because I guess there was a big thing where everyone's like, oh, we're not going to be like, it's, they decided to do Supercross this year, like finish Supercross here. Just a lot of people were complaining, like, well, I'm not ready. I haven't been doing anything. And Cooper's like, this is your job, guys. Like, this is what you have to, this is what you have to be doing. You have to be ready for when they call that. Because who knows when they're going to do They could do it today. They could do it tomorrow. They could do it next week. And they're saying they, yeah. They're yeah. Like, I'm ready to go. Like, this exactly. is what it is. If you guys aren't ready to go, that's not my problem. Pretty yeah. much. And the cream rises to, to the ready, top. Man. Yep. Look at NASCAR. Yeah. Exactly. Yep. All right, Brentus. Well, thank you for the call, right. I'm dude. I'm going to bed. Not really. I'll talk to you soon. All right, bro. Take it easy. Sounds good. You guys have a good night. You too. You too. Yep. Good night, man. Thank you. We got two more calls, and then that's it. So we're not taking any more calls after this. We got Eric. We got to talk to Eric. He's been waiting. What's going on, Super Pro? Hey, what's up, man? How you doing? How you doing? Pretty good. How are you? I'm good. Good. Can I talk to um, Tebow? Yes, Tebow. Yeah, right. what's up, yep. buddy? Hey, Tebow, what's up, my man? How you doing? I'm doing really good, buddy. How you doing? Oh, I'm good. Um, do you have a... Um, I got a question to you, man. Um, do you have a techno truck? Yeah, you have no or short you, Um, no, I, I, I don't really have one that I have built that I drive. I, I raced it one time, um, but I don't really drive that truck. Oh, do you have it or no? No, he doesn't have. I one. have, I have a kit. Oh. So yeah, no, I don't really have one. Oh, oh, I have one. Nice. You like it? I'm a top pro, so his yeah top short course pro from Pacific Northwest. Yep. Nice. Yep. Sweet. And I'm on um, YouTube too. You are. So, What's your YouTube channel? Yeah. Um, 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 Eric Lando. Okay, send it to my Facebook tomorrow uh, later yeah. on tonight so I can check it out. I will. You got any more questions for Nick um, or, or Tiba before we go? Say, um, no, um, I just wanted to um, um, I just wanted to um, um, say hi to Tiba, um, and I wanted to say hi to Nick. And, so, and not yeah, to me. Um, you don't want to say hi to me. Nope. <laughs> Jesus. Oh, hi. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, how, you, how you good? How you good? <laughs> yeah, we're good, man. Yeah, we're doing good. We appreciate you calling in, man. Good. Um, oh no, baby, I like to call in. I know. I love it. It's cool. I know. <laughs> that is yeah. cool. Thank you. Right, thank I appreciate you, it, man. Have a good evening, Eric. Top pro. I'm See you later, Eric. I See you, Eric. Bye, Bye. Bye. Eric. Eric is a faithful caller. All right. One more phone call, nice. guys. And then um, we're going to wrap this up. What's up, Corey Jordan? Sounds How you doing? Good. What's up, y'all? Y'all doing all right? Yeah, man. Yeah, doing pretty good here. This what's up, y'all. Hey, my question is... um. I don't think I, I really want to know, man, as long as I've been doing RC. I've never known this. Um, 
why on the 10 scale to a dry bucket, why do do you um, guys run the real real front tires and not really a, a tread pattern? You know what I'm saying? Why is that usually the, the choice for the um, front tires on the two-wheel drive 10 scale buggy? There you go, yeah. Tebow. That's your specialty because you instead of not instead of not a, a rib. I'm sorry, I, I didn't understand what tire. Like we use a treaded tire. No, he wants to know why you use. Rib I was tires. saying, well, yeah, most of the the most of, yeah most of the time I know is that on a two-wheel drive buggy, most of the guys run you know the rib tire, the the rib tires like the, the ones mm-hmm. with the, just the little. The little ribs in the, in the front of them, and not really a tread tire on the front of the two-wheel drive buggy. You must I be living, more You on must be track, living yeah. back in 2005 or something. Yeah, back then. <laughs> I don't know what track, I'm not sure what track you're at. But you used yeah, to run so this like for outdoor. Yeah, for outdoor and stuff. You know, ribs is kind of uh, yeah. is kind of better. Um, they just they just have a better steering than you know. You can run like. Um, I don't like AKA. They don't make an outdoor tread for the front, you know, like a impact uh-huh. or a gridiron or something. But even you know, so like if we go way back to when we did run like hole shots and stuff a lot, you know, I mean, you could kind of like yeah, that's a rib front. You could yeah. run a you could run yeah. like a cut hole shot front, but it just wouldn't really work as good. Um, with that like loamy kind uh-huh. of dirt and stuff that you would run on the outdoor, uh, the rib was just a lot more consistent. It seemed oh, okay. like when you ran okay. like a whole just... shot, it was too much steering. Yeah. Um, mm. Oh, okay. Yeah, it just it uh, upset the balance of the car. Yes. Yeah, the rib still okay. had good I mean, steering, that... but it wasn't too much. Yeah. It wasn't too much. Okay. That's what's up. Like I said, I never knew. You know, I just always. The guys would run the two-wheel drive you know, buggies that they used to just run mostly, you know, the rear tires. And I was like, so why don't y'all put yeah. you know, some, some tread on the front just see, you know. But I just know in a uh, four-wheel drive 10-scale buggies, yeah, I see more a tread pattern, you know. Yeah, yeah, it's a little different with that. that because you yeah. have the driving, you know, you have like the driving yeah, power on the front too. Um, yeah. So that's a little bit different. But yeah, like like indoor tracks – um higher traction tracks uh you normally run mm-hmm. like uh a tread in the front and it's just you know they they just get more traction so when you put the two wheel drive more buggy track. yeah when you put the two wheel drive buggy kind of on a looser track um you know the rib is just a little bit better balance for the for the grip conditions yeah one thing yeah. i can guarantee you Corey. Well, this was up this all yeah i was you're never going to see rib tires again yeah. because they ain't going to race two wheel drive buggers outside and learn me tracks anymore. Probably up in like look like up in Pacific Northwest. <laughs> no. But for NCT, but you ain't going to see that no right. more. And it's a shame. We were just talking about how much we'd like to see. Well, I would like to see an outdoor two wheel drive uh, nationals or big race come back at some point. We tried, we tried that a while back with the Reedy Outdoor Race Champions. <laughs> really? That did. Okay. That didn't quite go very well because when the track was when the track was holding moisture, so like later in the evening to where it was night, it was awesome. Like yeah. Tuesday nights at Hot Rod, probably the best you'll best time you'll ever have driving a ten scale car because the track's wet. It's there's actually loam, but you it's like loose dirt, but it has a lot of grip. But since that race was a, a bit larger event, it ran throughout the day, and it kind of got into this weird loose but grooved track so no one really knew what to do and it just and they kept watering it so it never fully grooved up so it never really had grip and it was just hard packed with dust and with the two-wheel drive car usually the worst worst case scenario so that race kind of failed yeah the cars have just changed so mm-hmm. much now it's Thanks, just yeah. uh it's really tough you know you'd have yeah just the way that the cars are now like they're just so um made for the for the high traction that is it's really challenging yeah they've and, gone about, you know the touring buggy <laughs> yeah so, yeah that's tough for sure I, I, yeah I, 
I appreciate that, y'all. I, like I said, I, that's just one thing I always wanted, you know. Um, yeah, man. Thanks but, um, for asking. Yeah. Third yeah, wheel man. salute, Corey. No Third problem. wheel salute. No, hey, T-Bar, appreciate it. What did, what's your sl- slogan, Corey? Third wheel salute? It, it's the... Um, it's the it's the left tire salute. Left tire left salute. salute. Right. That's I right. did a little thing on my <laughs> yeah. I did a little thing on my um my little, my YouTube page, man. Yeah, and let's I plug was, it. Um, plug your YouTube page. What yeah, is it? my um my yeah. <laughs> it's um EKJ twenty four thousand mm-hmm. on uh, on YouTube EKJ twenty four thousand. Yeah. Yeah, because I had um a Rockwater named E. He passed away, mm-hmm. and so I just you know kept that for him and um. Uh, and then um, KJ is Corey Jordan. That's my name. And 24,000. 24 comes from my, my old football number back oh, yeah. in um, high school and stuff. So cool. I just made it nice. EKJ24,000. I'm going to yeah. start hashtagging that. Yeah. Left tire salute. So. You don't mind, do you? <laughs> no, nah, it's all good, man. Yeah, it's like all that. good. We're just all in this thing together, having a good time. That's it, bro. Yeah. But yeah, I appreciate y'all taking my call. And y'all just stay blessed, man. And y'all just stay safe out there. You too, and, um, dude. I'm ready. Just let's ready to get back on the track. Yeah. yeah well, All right, y'all. Thank Sounds you. Have a good, good evening, dude. Thank you. Thank you. Too. you. Uh, you too, now. All right. Like, see it. All right. So we had a good bit of calls today. I just had I had a viewer. He said he couldn't call, so he messaged me some questions to ask you real quick, Jared. So I'm just gonna. He just had three questions. So I'm gonna ask you real quick. He wants to know who's the messiest, most unorganized pit space at the track and who has the cleanest, most dialed. I guess he's talking about other the pro guys. Or I guess, uh, I don't know, other the techno guys or whatever. Uh, that would be, that would be, that would be me as the messiest pit, um, <laughs> which is strange because uh, I'm actually like a total neat freak. And you can tell by my organizing and kind of my house projects and stuff. And if you watch the video, like, today like our house is always very organized i like to keep my like i can't organize enough but when i'm working i just bomb it out for some reason like i can't get that under control um it drives me absolutely nuts but i just it just it is what it is so i'm i'm the messiest i would say the cleanest pit is probably cavalry um, I'd agree with that. It's always super clean. It annoys me to like no other. <laughs> but how about you, Nick? You keep your pit space pretty clean. I'm kind of like Jared. I mean, it starts out pretty like when I'm building the trailer, it starts out super clean, and I'm like, all right, I'm gonna make it this time. I'm not gonna make a mess. I'm gonna keep everything all nice and organized. <laughs> And then you get into it, and then you like you take a break, and you look walk away for a second. You come back, and it's like World War Three happened. And you're just like, "What did I do? What happened?" Yeah. But yeah, I I I catch myself taking breaks and kind of organizing everything every couple hours, so I don't lose it too completely. All right. Uh, he also asked. But this... yeah, as far as cleanness. Oh yeah, who you think? Cavalier for sure. Like every, yeah. Every time is. I'm gonna Cavalier. look at his pit next. Yeah, because I race. I've seen I've seen him at OCRC, and you walk by, and it looks like no one's even really working in there. Like nothing ever happens. You know what? Charges, charges. The car is clean when it comes off the track. But he look, his pit looks like that all the time. Like even when he's actually like working on stuff too. It's weird. I don't know. You know what? Mine is just. And I'm crazy too. Like if I could have six pit tables or one pit table, and like I'm gonna have stuff on everything. It doesn't even matter how much room I have. I use up all the room. I hate yep. people who stay clean when they wrench and go to RC races. I can't for the life of me do that. Stay clean. I cannot. Like even if I'm not even I, I can stay pretty clean. Like I'll I'll bust out like a white shirt. I have no problem wearing white oh, no, shirt. No. I stay pretty clean. I could never wear a white shirt to an I can do race. a white shirt indoors. <laughs> no. Uh Jeffrey Salinas also wants to know Tebow, fame away from track. From the track, have you ever been recognized or asked for a picture or autograph when not racing? Um, yeah, yeah, a couple times. Um, well, like if I go to like a Supercross or like a motocross event, something like that, you know, it's pretty much every time someone will like, you know, oh man, you know, it's really? Jared Tivo or something like that. Um, I've been caught out like once at like a random hobby store, not really like a car hobby store, mm-hmm. but, uh, 
someone recognized me. And then it was, it was the funniest one was uh, this past year. I was, we were on our family vacation in Florida and we were waiting for our restaurant, uh, like reservation. We're at this restaurant, like on the beach. And um, this kid came up to me and was like, Oh, it's Jared Tebow. And like, wanted to get a picture with me and stuff. So that was pretty cool. That's cool. How about um, you? They're on vacation too. Uh, I've had a couple of times at hobby shops and stuff like that. I've, I was actually, there was actually a time when I went to the formula drift uh, event in long beach and someone like ran up to me and just said, it's wallet world from Instagram and just ran off. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice. And then act- it actually happened today. <clears throat> I was at uh, the path bike shop uh just getting a tire switched out for my buddy and um the guy that was like working in the back kind of came up and he was like wait a minute are you are you wally like do you go to ocrc and i'm like yeah that's, that's me he's like oh dude i go there all the time i see you all the time there and i'm like oh what's going on sweet so yeah it, it happens it happens a little bit here and there yeah. even for us low low-key guys <laughs> the only people that want to talk to me about rc is uh tsa and immigration when i travel so, yeah, that's unfortunate. There you go. Uh, he, a oh, second question, and actually, we've, had... we've talked about this a few times, Nick. Um, with you, most of if you, I think ba- Battle Battier has this, and David Ronnefog has the same issue. He says, "What's up with Tiba's Instagram? Nearly a million subscribers." Oh yeah, <laughs> so I I wish we had a million people in RC. I don't think we do personally, but. Uh, I don't know. I don't use my Instagram yeah. anymore. It got hacked. I don't know what's up with it. Yeah. I just, I'm too lazy to like look into it. I changed all my password and stuff. It happened. Uh, it happened when I was at the ENAPS last year. Really? Um, it's crazy. It, it gets like, yeah, it just gets, it gets likes constantly. So yeah, I haven't used my Instagram since right before I went to the China world, or not the China world, the Slovakia worlds last year. Um, Cause I was just getting sick and tired of it. Like, <laughs> because even these like fake accounts, they would be commenting and stuff too. Yeah. I've seen that too. And so I was just fed up with it. I haven't even checked it. How many does it have? I don't know. I, was, I just looked I at it. It has 986,000. <laughs> <laughs> Nice. Yeah. I'm her tag. I'm her hashtag. I'm her. I was I was tagging you in the Instagram post and and then I didn't even have a bother to look. But yeah, I think Rana Falk has the same issue. Badier was talking about it. Nick, I think you have it. So. Yeah, Rana Falk said something that he was we were kinda we he said he had something happen, but his isn't nothing like mine. Yeah. Crazy. All right. But uh yeah, I don't know. Well, yeah, I was waiting for Inst- I, Instagram to do their sweep and clean out clean all those fake accounts out, and it goes back to normal. Yeah, I'm still oh, running did you, that thing. Did that happen to yours too? Yeah, I'm like sitting at two hundred and five thousand right now, or something. Like oh, that. really? <laughs> oh man, yeah. All right. Well, yeah, I'm just on Facebook now. So yeah, that's what I use mostly to. Well, I appreciate both of you guys coming on. Uh, thank you, Jared, for coming on. I appreciate it. You've been busy this week. Uh, I saw yours on another podcast as well this week. So good, good stuff. Keep up the good work. Um, you've, I think, out of most of the pro guys, you've been the the busiest one. So that's good to see. Good to see, and I hope it keeps because people want to talk to you and they want to get to know you, and and it, it's good to see. Yeah, yeah, man, it's, it's a good opportunity yeah. right now to grow my fan base. So I'm trying to take advantage of it. You know. Yeah, yep. I agree with you right there. I, I really, I hope we see more of it, but I think it's going to wind on once once guys get back racing. But it's good. Keep it up once a month. That's all you need. And your Tebow shows are really popular. Keep up the good work. Thank you for coming on. Thank you, Nick, for all for coming on and uh, being with us as well. I appreciate it, dude. Remember, everybody, if you want to get a new techno built, send it to Wally. He wants to build a new techno, so send it off to him and get it all tricked out. Maybe he can black it out for you too. Thank you to Techno yeah, RC. Yeah, do it black yeah. and gold. Yeah. Dude, I might I might send you one. <laughs> there you go. I'd be down for that. Let's do it. There you go. <laughs> Thank you to Techno yeah, RC. Those look sweet, man. You're doing a good job. Yeah. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks to Techno RC for sponsoring this segment. I appreciate it. I still want to, I want to get Danny on the podcast so bad. 
Yeah, heck I, yeah. I've asked. Yeah, asked you Matt. should. That'd be I know. fun. He has an interesting story. I want to hear it. I keep asking Matt. I'm gonna just message. I'm gonna. I'm gonna shoot. Uh, shoot him an email. I asked him at DNC. He was like, oh, maybe. But I really want it. I said, get me some techno tracks. And he said, I'll Talk get you some. On f- yeah, message him on Facebook or something. Yeah. He, he, hopefully he do it. He, he's got a really cool story. You I know. know, Danny, he's a, uh, and he, he's an interesting, you know, guy and the story and everything. He, he's really awesome. His, yeah. uh, his uh, enthusiasm and stuff into RC is, uh, is it's, it's pretty awesome he, he's built a really cool brand and company and just they're so unique in the rc world it's it's pretty wild yeah that's good. um you know they do things their own way and and uh you know they they're they're doing great they're just a little company um but uh you know making awesome stuff and yeah it, it'd be cool to hear his story you know he came from the gaming from the gaming background mm-hmm which is pretty interesting. And um, yeah, both the designers kind of like self self taught and uh, yeah, pretty yeah. cool. Really. I'm going to message him. You should get, you should get him on. Yeah. Well, you should. Oh, cool. Well, thank you for your time, dude. Go enjoy your family. Thank you, Nick, for your time. Thank you to everybody out there that tuned in. I appreciate it. Um, we appreciate the support here at the no name RC podcast. Uh, check out beach RC, check out J- Jared's, um, Ultimate products as well, his ultimate oils and stuff. Don't forget Wally Builds as well. If you don't follow him on IG or Facebook, give him a follow, a like, a share, send some work off to some product out to Wally. And uh, hey, talk to you guys next week and have fun this weekend. And remember, wash those hands. Yeah, thanks for having me on. Cool. See you guys later. Good time. See ya. NNRC listeners, are you currently having trouble trying to get the power down to the ground? Well, don't you worry. Papa Willie's Traction Tonic has you covered for all your RC tire traction needs. Whether you race on carpet, concrete, dirt, loose, dry, slick, or high grip surfaces, Papa Willie's Traction Tonic cures for traction. Benefits of using Papa Willie's Tonic Traction is going to be more traction, long-lasting, light tire wear, sweet scent, clean application, fast-acting, fresh fill. Papa's Willie Traction Tonic is also safe on foam inserts and does not deteriorate tire glue. Find and follow Papa Willie's Traction Tonic on Facebook and Instagram. You can also visit them at www.papawillies.net. Use the promo code NNRC at checkout for 10% off. Prepare for victory with the one and only Papa Willie's Traction Tonic. So in the last podcast, I talked about starting a product spotlight for small companies in RC that are starting out or are just small companies who probably can't afford to sponsor you know, have uh, pretty cool widgets and and bits and bobs or anything like that that they want to push. You know, RC is all about uh, tinkering. So there's lots of people out there making things as well. So I got contacted by Donathan RC Products. I'm probably saying that wrong, but um, he's been on my buddy Joe Zaire's podcast. He's been on EMBM podcast, and he does charging leads. So when he contacted me, I thought this would be a great start to do this. So we're looking at probably doing this maybe once, maybe twice a month to highlight uh, a small product or a small business in RC. And also there will always be, there will probably be a giveaway attached to this for you guys, the the listeners. So joining me this weekend or on this first product spotlight is Zach Donathan. What's up, Zach? How are you? I'm doing well. How about you? I'm all right. Every time I I say your name, I want to say Donovan. So... I'm fighting no, that right there. I'm fighting that. But um how are you, man? No, I'm doing I'm doing exceptionally well. It's uh it's a really nice day here. Um there was no no rain, about 70 and sunshine all day. It's pretty nice. Yeah, it's 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 pretty warm here in the DR. Um but yeah, it's all good. So t- tell us a little bit about yourself, Zach. Uh your RC background, where you race, what you're doing, and then we'll get into your products. Sure. So I've been uh, racing for about 19 years now. 
Um, I've raced every class um, with the exception of a handful. Like I, I have a very short night show career, but uh, everything else electric I've, I've raced. Uh, I used to, so I started out when I was eight, uh, racing with my dad and I raced, uh, the old triple X, um, five link, I believe that's what it's called stadium truck. And we revived some old NICAD batteries and some brush motors and we went and, uh, beat around the track. Uh, and, uh, now I race, uh, primarily on road. So I, uh, I really enjoy touring car um specifically stock touring car however this next season i suspect i'll be getting into a uh, modified touring car um so yeah uh that's a little bit about um kind of how i got into all this and um a little bit about me whereabouts do you race to um so my nearest home track doesn't really race on road anymore uh so uh, it's about two and a half hours drive to uh, my new uh, closest track. All right, so you're uh, mostly uh, you mostly prefer on road racing. Then is it uh, it's carpet racing or is it um, asphalt or, or? Yeah, it's mostly carpet. Um, okay. There's a new track that opened up that's about uh, thirty minutes north of me. That is um, off road dirt slash clay. Uh, that I've been considering uh, getting a forward ride buggy and going racing, but uh, right now I can't really do that. No, so you can't. Got you. So, what may, you? Let's talk about your products. Let's talk about Donathan. Donathan RC. When did this start? When did you get the idea? It's all about charge leads. I'm looking at your products now. Uh, you got sensor wires, screw kits. Uh, custom charge leads, phone charge leads that you'll touch on. Uh, where did you come up with this idea and what, yeah, how did that start? So it just started out with uh, balanced charge leads to start with. Um, so obviously if you've raced for any amount of time, you've broken a charge lead, whether it be a transmitter charge lead, um, a balanced charge lead for your, your 2S pack, 4S pack, a receiver pack, um, all type of RC use charge leads for a variety of, of batteries. Um, so I got tired of breaking charge leads um, and fixing them only to have them break again. Uh, so I started diving into making a uh, charge lead in 2015. Um, actually about April 2015. So it's been about three years since I've been making uh, charge leads. Three no, that's five years. Uh, it's been a little bit. Time goes fast. Um, so that's kind of how it started. And then uh, I started traveling about the same time to bigger races around the, the U.S. Um, uh, any of the on-road uh, on guys know me. I just walk in the room and everyone's really friendly. Um, and that's helped me kind of build the product uh it started out i think my first retail order was from um uh, genesis rc um or brandon skews if you guys know him he's uh he's an odd group guy um he does race rewards and uh mm -hmm. super cool guy so he kind of helped me get the foot in the door and it's been growing ever since okay so what makes your charge leads okay i okay better better question take me through building a charge lead like what do you go through what's what makes your charge leads better do you use better wire how do you prevent them from breaking etc okay so um there's uh this is a little bit longer answer but we can uh let's do it so our charge leads are known for the customization and durability um there are a few key options um for ours that make them amazing um primarily the products that we put into it so as a fellow racer i want the i want to receive a product that i know will perform at least to my expectations if not better so i put that um work ethic into all the products that we have um so if it's not a product that i would like to use it doesn't go out the door um so with that in mind we started searching out for the best products on the market 
Uh, we started out with connectors and then wire and slowly worked our way into um, heat shrink and sheathing, um, balance extensions, connect um, connector pins in the balance extensions, the wire in the balance extensions. Um, so now we have a very different product than um, most other charge leads on the market. Um, and most importantly, I think about all that is we're able to combine these better uh, quality products um, with a better quality assembly uh, because they're manufactured right here in the USA. Um, and we are always looking to improve upon our previous design. <clears throat> so every two or three months, we end up coming with uh, coming up with a better um, better way to do this or that or a better product for this or that. So um, which leads us to a better product every year. Just like a car manufacturer releases a new car every year because they're able to do the same thing. Um, we've kind of are able to to do that as well. So this year we recently launched our 2020 balance charge leads um, and those feature a variety of new options. Um, and so what makes our products so durable? Um, well, we offer what we call the wolf style. Um, and so how that kind of started is um, our now team manager, Richard DeVroge, um, he um, bought some charge leads and then he broke them right away, uh, which was super unusual at the time. This was maybe two or three years ago. And I wasn't quite sure how he broke them. So I sent him another lead, uh, another set of leads that I beefed up. Um, and these were kind of the first uh, versions of the wolf cable. And I, I told Rich he could charge fearlessly now. And um, after working with Rich a little bit and talking with him, we kind of came up with um, the wolf cables, which the original slogan was, uh, you can charge fiercely with the wolf cables because wolves are pretty fierce and they don't, they don't really care. Um, so I thought that was uh, interesting. And so we went from there and now we, um, we offer the, the wolf style for um, a variety of our charging products. And it just kind of means they're really durable. Um, we also use different connectors for them. And um, they're more reinforced around the connectors. Um, and to this date, we haven't had um, one break, even the, the first set I sent to Rich. Good um, stuff. Uh, is this your most popular product then? Um, yeah, so our most popular product is the Leveled Up Wolf Cable, which is um, a Leveled Up. It's just a, uh, a phrase for fully sheathed. So um, it's our most customized and most durable product. Yeah, because you can you can get cost customized leads as well. Do you? I'm just looking through your website. I know you have different uh, sheath colors and stuff. Do you offer printing on the sheaths as well, or? somebody wanted like their logo or their name put on them can you do that yeah um so we offer custom printed heat shrink um mm -hmm. so we can do a logo or a name nickname uh sponsor logo stuff like that uh we have a ton of logos on file and permission to use those logos um and we have the the software to do specific like nicknames or fonts or things like that mm -hmm. as well and we have a, over uh, a quadrillion options in stock. So we have like 20 plus sheathing styles, uh, a, um, a variety of, of connectors, four to five mil, all the way to Dean's, the IC3, um, EC5, and XT60, so on. Um, and then we have uh, the custom print um, heat shrink options, and we offer 1S, 2S, 3S, 4S all types of 4S, uh, 6S, um, transmitter pack, receiver pack, ICAD, and a variety of other charge leads as well. Sweet. Uh, I, I also see phone charging cables. Now, this is my biggest pet peeve. I spend this all this money, 20 bucks on a cable or something like that, and it doesn't work. It, it, well, it lasts a long time, but it doesn't work. Or it stops charging fast. 
and whatnot. So I, I actually want to get one of these charging cables for my phone or two. They're eleven ninety nine. I'm looking at the prices here on your website now. What makes these better? I'm, how, how long can I expect to? How how much is the life expect, expectancy on one of these? So the what I found is the life expectancy kind of depends on the user. Um, mm-hmm. Our average um, average length is over a year for the the usage. Mm-hmm. Um, and we have our very first ones that we ever sent out. They're still working. Um, who a good buddy of mine still using them. Uh, most of them last a very long time. Um, so, and the the main and I I don't try to be shy about this. The the iPhone ones are the issue, and it's primarily the connector with the iPhone mm. one. So okay. if we take out the iPhone ones, the average use goes up to two years. Um, and we've only had two defective Android ones. So I'll far. take a I'll take a year, dude. I'm getting a couple months out of mine. So I use my phone a lot. I'm going to order a pink one for my wife. And I don't know what color. Are you? I, I'm going to get a no name RC podcast one. We could put your logo on it. I know. So I see where can people pick up these, uh, these leads, not only from you, but do you have any distributors? Uh, do you have any hobby shops selling them? Yeah. Um, so they're available at JonathanRC.com. And um the <clears throat> excuse me um we have distributors all around uh the country um in the usa so we have okay. some in um south carolina michigan california illinois ohio um arizona and a few other states i believe as well uh-huh. Um, and then we're always welcoming new uh, new distributors as well. Oh, Indiana. How did I forget that one? And do you ship internationally? Because this podcast does go pretty international. So if somebody wanted to to purchase overseas, you can do that as well, correct? Yes, sir. We offer uh, international shipping all over the place. Um, well, of course, all over the place. Uh, but yeah, we offer uh, international shipping as well. Okay, sweet. Cool. Well, we're also going to do a giveaway with this. I think we should do some uh, No Name RC podcast leads and give them away. So we're going to give away two leads. Is that correct? That is correct. And we can make them No Name RC podcast leads. All right. So how are we going to do this? Let's tell our listeners how you're going to do this. You can take it. You, this is your expertise right here. All right. So uh, what we're going to do is a uh, like, comment, and share giveaway. So uh, we'll create a post on Facebook, and all you have to do is uh, like the post, uh, comment a friend's name that you think would enjoy the products, and share it to your page. Sweet. And then, so this is going to be on the Donathan RC page and the No Name RC podcast page, or just yours? Uh, yeah, we can do both of them and just uh, simply look at who qualifies for, for both, and then um, we'll announce um which page is going to be um officially uh producing the giveaway Uh um yeah uh also we have a uh our 4300 page like giveaway um Uh tuesday uh may 19th at 9 p.m eastern standard time um so all you have to do is come in and say hi um, and then you're qualified to enter to win a free Dothan RC product. Okay, sweet. So that's going down. That's for your 4,300. How many likes are you at now on your page? Uh, we just uh, just announced it today. So I think we're at like 4,310. Okay, sweet, sweet. I'm trying to get there. I'm almost at 3,000. Well, I'm actually 500 away from 3,000. You know, <laughs> it's not easy, but uh, yeah, not. sweet. So. I appreciate you coming on. I appreciate you reaching out to me. Remember, guys, we're going to announce this uh, competition once this, well, this pop. It will be done by this podcast is when this podcast is released. And uh, I appreciate you coming on, Zach. Keep up the good work, man. Uh, remember, guys, if you want to check out some of his cool products, go to Donathan RC. Uh, actually, let me bring up the website right now, DonathanRC.com. He's also on Instagram. You can follow him there and give him a, a share as well as Facebook Donathan RC products, correct? Uh, yeah, I believe so. All right. 
Well, cool, man. Keep up the good work and uh, good luck with the 4,300 uh, winner giveaway. And yeah, let's do give, give away some no name RC podcast leads. Awesome, for sure. Thank you very much for having uh, having us on. All right, thank you. So that concludes our podcast for this week, everybody. I hope you guys enjoyed it. I know we ran a little bit long. Uh, great interview with Jamie Booth. Great call-in session with Tebow and Wally Builds. Thank you to Jamie Booth. Thank you to Tebow. Thank you to Wally for coming on board. Remember, check out Wally if you want to get a new techno build or any car built. Check him out. Let's send some business to Wally. Help him out. Um, thank you to all the guys that tune in Facebook Live. I appreciate it. That's, I, I really enjoy that part of the podcast, connecting with you guys, talking with you. Uh, calls are going up, so it's, it's getting longer, but I appreciate it. And uh, thank you guys for the support and love, man. Thank you to everybody that sends us a message and support. It really, it re it really means a lot to me um, to know that we're on the right track here. Please support the other podcasts that are out there as well. They need, they, they, they're doing a good job, and they, 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 they get love as well. And hey. Keep hope alive. We're going to be racing soon. I know everybody's itching to get back to the track. Trust me, I'm itching for you guys to get back to the track and, and, and all the drama that comes with it and all the racing. I miss it. So I hope everything gets back to normal as well pretty soon. But in the meantime, people, stay safe. Wash those hands. Please like and share this podcast. Shout out once again to our, our loyal sponsors who keep supporting this podcast, who are RCMX Online, Techno RC. Beach RC, JQ Racing, BK Service, Papa Willie's Traction Tonic, and RC Raceworks. Thank you for your support. Thank you to our patrons on Patreon. You know, hopefully we pick up some more patrons as well. If you feel, you know, every little bit helps. Definitely keeping these bills are paid. Hopefully, I'm hoping after this COVID stuff's done, I can move into an office and get some better internet and therefore bring some some better uh, product and better content if you have some video. Uh, Keep it, man. Hey, I appreciate everything you guys do. And hey, remember, Nitro is the glory. E-Buggy pays the bills. If you ain't grinding, you're sliding. And uh, wash those hands. And let's get ready to smell some nitro. Or at least some dust. Or some, you know, I'm ready for some brat. And I'm ready for some zzz. That's E-Buggy. That's my best impersonation of an E-Buggy. Thank you for tuning in, everybody. Have a good weekend. And uh, Lefty out. Thank you for listening to the No Name RC Podcast. We greatly appreciate all the support and love from you, the listeners. Without all of you, none of this is possible. Special thanks to our patrons on Patreon. If you wish to support the podcast further, you can at patreon.com forward slash NNRC Podcast. As a patron, you will receive early releases, special content, and patron-only giveaways. Also, please follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and our website, www.nnrcpodcast.com. Remember, Nitro is the glory, but e-buggy pays the bills. If you aren't having fun, it doesn't make sense. And if you ain't grinding, you're sliding lefty out. Nitro is the glory, Nitro is the glory, Nitro is the glory.